Fleming Gao com coming from Sanderson University. In this video, we introduce our research about video searching. In recent years, most of researches until that deep learning to map videos and queries into semantic space and rank videos by semantic similarity. But there is a gap between video retrieval in academia and the video search industry. Taking the examples in the picture in academia, queries in data sets are captions, automatic speech recognition, or more scripts of videos. However, in the real World video search engines queries based on keywords or concepts are summaries of entire video rather than descriptions of video. And then, as for videos industry, taking different queries and an example, the relevant videos are too similar to be distinguished in semantic space, and the queries are too short to capture semantic information. Thus, in addition to semantic matching methods, concept based and click based methods are also widely used in industry to retrieve videos. However, personalization, sparsity of click behaviors, and locking a dataset with click or target information hinder the development of those methods. Thus, we conduct the following challenge in the industry video search. Locking a dataset from real world video search engine with user's queries, clicked videos, and target information. How to combine semantic click based and tag based methods to overcome their disadvantages and attain an approach with better performance. To address those challenges, we collect a public high quality dataset QVT from real world video search engine with user's queries, clicked based, and the video tags. And we propose a novel model to combine semantic tag based and click based methods to overcome their disadvantages. To address the diversity of click behaviors, we fuse concept based models and click graph based models in the fields of building graphs to enrich the ads in video query graph as for ANSI queries in click based models, we fuse the related tax node embedding as query representations. For similar video in semantic models, we introduce tax for video to distinguish similar video in semantic part. Finally, we fuse the semantic filters and graph filters to improve the generalization of concept based models by a novel gated based fusion machine zone. For this set QVT, we collect queries and videos from the real world video search engine compared with other video retrieval data sets, we select corresponding clicked videos of queries as semantic matching pairs. We filter tags from user uploaded tags and key keywords and uh, automatically or manually click clean uh, meaningless tags. And then we introduce our model. <coughs> our model consists of graph modeling layer, semantic modeling layer, and the combination layer. First, we enter the board to gain the semantic information on queries and extract from frames semantic information by clip model to distinguish similar videos in semantic. We introduce video tags and fuse tags and frames with transformer to get video embedding. And uh, as, as we have indicated the spanners of click through data has always been a bonic for click-based smoothing models. To gather more information from the graph, we fuse concept-based models and click-based models in the process of building graph. In the core idea of concept-based models, they believe that queries with similar tags are more likely to share similar search intent, and videos with similar tags are more likely to share similar content based on the above assumptions. In addition to the click relationship, we regard tags as a bridge between queries and uh, videos. Therefore, we introduce MetaPass QTQ and the DTD. We utilize heterogeneous graph attention network to learn node embeddings. We employ a graph attention with same parents of MetaPass QTQ in heterogeneous graph attention network to combine the first order tags embedding of queries as query embeddings. And then we Implement a gate fusion layer to integrating semantic and the graph representation vectors. We claim that directly combining them is inflexible. Graph and the semantic information play different roles, and we need to automatically filter out the important parts for integration. 
We design an update kit to lend the active weight to merge structure and the semantic information for queries and the videos. Experimental results of all models are shown in this table. It is known that we use the same filter structure clip model for all baselines. The proposed model surpasses the best semantic matching baselines in metric rank at K and MRR respectively. For ambulation results, um, for ambulation results, this, exper this experiment starts with the basic semantic modeling layers, named the transformer base, and constantly its new modules. The so one is to fuse conceptual based uh, and click based models, named the head graph point, and, and the other one is click tag based graph using click tag based graph using sparse simple method named head graph point plus simple. Sparse simply improves the metric rank at value of the graph model. We believe that sparse simpling has the following advantages. Sparse simpling can effectively elevate the two dense edges of some tags. Sparse simpling randomly abundance some wrong query tag edges introduced by semantic similarity. Heterograph point plus semantic directly contacts semantic filters and graph filters, which donates that directly combining them is inflexible since structure and semantic information play different rules. In this part, we list the top one video retrieved by our model and the transformer based model. For instance, our model shows relevant videos about detective Conan clash of red and black rather than videos about the uh, platinum of blacker street retrieved by semantic model. Also, taking blood tonic food as an example, our model filters irrelevant videos about food by tax and retrieve similar videos in semantic space. Thanks, thanks for your attention. So this presentation is a joint work with uh, Vito, Alex, uh, Giuseppe, Yannick, and we're going to discuss about uh, position bias and uh, the role that uh, position bias has uh, in, uh, within Amazon Music. And uh, we as a team are part of the machine learning team at Amazon Music. So the, the agenda, we're going to start discussing a bit about the context, so how uh, we do ranking at Amazon Music, and then we will see why position bias is, uh, is an important issue affecting ranking for, for, uh, for Amazon Music. We will uh, discuss a bit uh, how we can estimate position bias and how we can correct the ranking algorithm from position bias. And last, we will have a, a few algorithm, a few, a few experiments where we compare multiple approaches. We will compare a novel approach that we provide in this paper, and we will see why uh, the bias from position bias is a, is a very useful thing to do in production. So let's start with the context. Uh, so when a user opens Amazon Music, Amazon Music is built like uh, a this is the home page, no? And the home page is built as a, a, a list of uh, widgets, where basically each widget like this uh, is a, a recommender that contains songs. And uh, each widget is ranked, uh, ideally horizontally from uh, left to right. And uh, we want this ranking to be personalized, okay? So the task is uh, to rank horizontally the content of each widget in a way that it puts the relevant songs on, uh, on the top, no? In the most visible position. Yeah. I, yes. I hate to interrupt again, yeah. but we are still on the title slide. It sounds like you, oh, you know, we've gone to other slides, <laughs> but we still see the first slide. There this we go. Is, okay, I yeah. will stay like this. Sorry. So, sorry. So, this is basically. Um, uh the the interface of amazon music that i was describing these are the widgets essentially okay and uh, the task is to horizontally rank the the content of uh, of each widget no? now um what what do we do for uh, for this how do we do this ranking so the, the idea is that we are doing uh, online ranking and why because we want to preserve the ability to deploy any widget in uh, in production without the need of uh, pre-training the ranker okay Additionally, uh, this uh, will have an important advantage later, we will see it, because uh, basically these online learning algorithms uh, have to solve uh, the exploration exploitation protocol, uh, the, and, uh, and this uh, will be useful later, we, we will see. 
And uh, how do we train these algorithms? We train them using implicit feedback, which means that uh, if a user clicks on an item, then we say that the item is relevant, while uh, if, that, if the user ignores an item, for example, we say that the item is not relevant, okay? Now, this is very standard, but it is also well known that this is a problem because basically click is not relevance. It is a, a proxy for relevance, but um, not all the items that, have, uh, that are ignored are actually not relevant. Think for example, an item in position one that is not clicked, maybe this item really is not relevant for the user. But if, if the user ignores an item in position 25, then maybe it is not because it is not relevant, but just because uh, the item was, uh, was actually ignored by the user. No? So the issue here is that there are items with different visibility in different positions. And um, there are the items that are right at the bottom that are less visible and that are consequently less likely to receive a click. And this bias introduced in the data is commonly called uh, position bias. And uh, it is a, a well-known issue in, uh, in ranking data. Typically, position bias is addressed by, uh, for, by setting up a probabilistic model, a click model, that is called the position bias model. No? And uh, so this is the way in which we model user behavior in the context where position bias is, uh, is, is present. And the idea is the following, that in the position bias model, uh, a click happens as a combination of two independent events. One event is uh, the user observes the item, and the other event is that the user finds the item to be relevant. If both contemporary happen, so the item is examined and the item is relevant, then we see a click. Otherwise, we see no click. And uh, this is important. It allows us to define this uh, vector that we call position bias curve, that is a vector that contains at the entry i the probability that the user examined the item in position i. And we assume this to depend only on the positions of the item, not on the user. And, uh, and the intuition is that uh, a missing click can also be due to the fact that uh, there is no examination. So the position bias uh, variable didn't realize. And why the position bias uh, model is very useful? Because there is uh, in the literature, a bunch of works that basically um, take the position bias and use the position bias model to correct uh, the training procedure of the traditional ranking algorithms from, uh, from, the, from, from the position bias. This typically happens by giving more weights to the item that are uh, to the clicks that happen in low visible position proportionate to the position bias. And all these methods require to be implemented an input that is uh, an estimate of position bias, an estimate of the examination probabilities for the various items. And uh, they have the promise that they deliver better results. Now, this uh, opens uh, a few questions. Um, so the first question is, um, as Amazon Music, we wanted to try out um, unbiased learning to rank. This meant that uh, first we, want, we needed to estimate position bias. So how can we estimate position bias? And the second is a pragmatical question. So if I implement uh, an unbiased learning to rank method, how much improvement am I going to get uh, in terms of, uh, of ranking quality? And this is what we're trying to answer in, uh, in the next few slides. So the next topic is to estimate position bias. No? So the goal is to have uh, to be able to come up with a curve that represents position bias. And we want uh, the algorithm to be accurate. And we want to be able to estimate this curve just uh, taking a log of, uh, of data. No? So without the need of altering <coughs> the behavior of, uh, of the current trend. Now, the, the literature presents uh, two families of approaches. No? The first family is, um, is a family that is based on manual intervention on the ranking, which means that they propose to modify the behavior of the ranking with uh, some modification, with uh, some uh, randomization, for example, on the top of it, and uh, to use this uh, randomization to come out with a consistent estimators of position bias. So this randomization is done in a smart way so that basically on the top of it, you are able to calculate some estimators of position bias. So this is, this is cool because these methods are easy to implement and uh, they develop estimators that are uh, reliable. But uh, unfortunately, as we will see later, the manual intervention on the ranking, this uh, alteration of ranking behavior, deliver a harm on user experience. And uh, this is not what we want to have. The second family of approaches says, uh, look, position based model is a probabilistic model. So I can just uh, uh, formulate a maximum likelihood problem and estimate using expectation maximization. 
So again, this is better on the hand than the other approaches because basically you do not need to manually alter the ranking behavior, but at the same time, the, the learning accuracy here is, is, is a bit poorer and we will see this in the experiments. So the question is, can we have the best of the two worlds? No? And the answer is yes. So we developed in this paper a novel estimate of proposition bias that tries to avoid the need of interventions while keeping the high accuracy guarantees of the intervention-based methods. And the, inter the, the intuition is the following. The intervention-based method typically executes additional randomization on the top of the ranker. But as I said at the beginning, we are using randomized rankers to balance exploration and exploitation. So the idea is, uh, can we use the randomness that comes uh, from the ranker to, um, to basically avoid additional randomizations? And the answer is yes. So we use the randomness that comes from the ranker and we come out with the consistent estimators of position bias. Let's uh, see a bit the detail. So we call our method policy aware intervention harvesting because basically our method is uh, aware of, uh, of the policy that is randomized. In particular, this guy here, we call, uh, this is what is the policy. So we assume that we have a data set, okay, collected from a policy and that we that is randomized and that we know the behavior of the policy. So it means that for every item I, we know the probability for this item to finish in position H for all the various position H's. Then we assume to know this intervention set that is basically the set of items that could finish at both position H and L at any time. And then we know from the logs whether an item was clicked or not. These or all these requirements are pretty standard when you have a randomized rank. And, uh, but they are enough to come up with uh, this theorem that says, look, we can come up with two estimators, C and C bar, that uh, have a very nice property because they have an expected value, which is uh, in a very neat relation with position bias. Okay, so we come up with estimators that can be calculated using any log of ranking data from generated from a randomized ranker. And uh, they have an expected value that has an explicit relation with position bias. Now, what do we do with this theorem? We, we come up with an algorithm because we have these two estimators. How can we come up with an algorithm? Well, the first observation is that uh, these estimators have an expected value that is either proportional to position bias for C or proportional to one minus position bias times something. And uh, we can call uh, this uh, additional, this something, so this variable S that we have here as a dummy variables. And we can formulate uh, a, a problem where uh, we say, look, I have a model, I have a data. I try to minimize the KL divergence between uh, the model that is basically the position bias model. So what I expect to have if the position bias model is true and the, uh, and, the and, and what I get from the data. So the estimators, no? With the idea that uh, we, we come out with uh, this cost function that, uh, that represents the, the difference no, between our, our model and uh, what we have instead of observing the data. Now, this cost function can be minimized and uh, while minimizing this cost function, uh, we have two, two variables no? uh, that we are uh, working on. One is the position bias and one is this variable S that is a dummy variable. The cool thing is that we can calculate this cost function with a single pass across the data in, and it can be optimized using uh, gradient descent and it returns an estimator of position bias. So we keep the same guarantees of the um, intervention-based methods, but uh, at the same time, we do not require interventions because we use the randomness that uh, is already present in our rankers. Uh, okay, this is the, mod, the, the idea of the approach that we are proposing, and, uh, but we want to experiment with it. So we do two series of experiments, one on synthetic data, where we check and compare the various methods, how well they retrieve uh, position bias starting from data. And then we do more or less the same experiment on Amazon Music data, so on a real data set. Then we check uh, the impact of manual intervention on uh, user experience. And last, uh, our final question, uh, how uh, much does an unbiased learning to rank improve over a traditional learning to rank if I have a position bias estimate available? So first step, uh, synthetic data. 
No, uh, we take the Yahoo learning to rank uh, dataset, and uh, we simulate the click log using the position bias model, which means that one query after the other, we simulate a ranking. And then once we have uh, this ranking, we simulate a click using the position bias model. And here we use a ground truth position bias model that we decide. Once we have this data set, we calculate uh, the position bias under this data set using multiple approaches, okay? And we compare using a med the, uh, how different this position bias is, so the position bias that we retrieved with an algorithm against the ground truth position bias. And these are the results. So our method, it is the policy aware intervention harvesting method is the one with the top performance. And uh, while expectation maximization is expected as a, a pretty high bias, even if it has a low variance, comparable to our approach, there is the swap method, which is expected because uh, the swap method is uh, traditionally regarded as the most reliable approach for, uh, for position bias estimations. So this validates some synthetic data that our approach works. We need just to use it on real data. So again, we take uh, um, our uh, widget ranking, uh, our content ranking data, so that the data coming from the ranking inside the widgets. And uh, for each widget, we get a data set and we calculate uh, position bias using uh, multiple methods uh, on the various generated data sets. Now, the first question, unfortunately here, we don't have a ground truth position bias, no, because it is a real world data. And um, so the, what we can do instead is to compare uh, the various position bias estimates, okay? So we come up with uh, a heat map that at the entry IJ contains uh, the difference between the position bias calculated with the method I versus the uh, position bias calculated with the method J. And what we can see is that uh, the swap and the policy aware intervention harvesting method deliver very similar results, while all the other methods uh, are a bit off and deliver uh, different estimates also between each other. So this somehow validates the fact that our method behaves uh, similar to the swaps approach, which is uh, known to be a very solid base, but at the same time, we do not require any user intervention. Now, I've done all the talk saying that uh, user interventions are bad, but uh, I have not validated this yet. So uh, this is what we are doing in this slide. So we did uh, an A-B test. We're basically in the control treatment. We had uh, our regular ranker, while in the, in the other treatment, uh, in a holdout data set, we have, uh, a random, we have um, the randomization prescribed by the, this user intervention method, not in particular by the swap method. And we compare it across the two, the two treatments, uh, the KPIs for Amazon Music. So basically how many seconds a user play and what is the click-through rate. And uh, we observed that these uh, uh, randomized uh, swaps actually had a negative impact on, on ranking quality. So it is important to have a method like ours that does not have uh, this uh, randomization, this need for uh, additional interventions. And last is about uh, ranking improvement. So again, all started with the idea, how can we correct no, from uh, position bias our ranking methods and uh, how are we going to get an improvement if we do it? So again, we run an A-B test where we compare our, con our production ranker versus uh, the same identical ranker, but uh, with a correction at training time from position bias. And uh, again, the results are in a very big improvement in the unbiased learning to rank method, where basically we see a big improvement in play seconds and big improvement in click through rate. Now, uh, what are the next steps? Next step, uh, well, uh, as I said, this, uh, this setting the position bias is uh, totally uncontextual. So it just depends on the position of the item. We want to make it contextual maybe. So maybe it depends on, uh, on the user and on the context, not only on where the item is, is, uh, is located. And another interesting question in the industrial setting is uh, when do you refresh your estimate of position bias? No, because you, you had it uh, frozen. So you calculate once as one off, but when is the right time to recalculate position bias? Is there a concept brief? And last is uh, now the, uh, the training of the ranker and the training of position bias are a bit asynchronous. And what if we try a method that uh, trains them jointly, maybe using a single cost function? So this, is, uh, this is all for my talk. And, uh, Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Matteo, for the live presentation. Um, are there any uh, questions on the Zoom that haven't been placed? Uh, type in the Zoom. I see actually um, some applause, but no hands raised for questions. Um, unless there are, I think I'm going to do this as I'm going to 
uh, relay a question um, from one of the reviewers of the paper. Um, speak to that. Um, so what is a convergence rate? And I actually don't entirely understand what is meant by convergence rate. So um, hear me, what is a convergence rate of the position bias estimation when compared to other methods? Yeah, no, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, it, uh, I, I did some experiments on, uh, on this, uh, and I, I guess that here is uh, the dependency on the sample size, no? on uh, how much uh, data, because there are two types of convergence here. One is uh, how much data you need to, to get an accurate uh, estimate of position bias. And uh, uh, it is pretty good. It is uh, uh, better than, um, than, um, than expectation maximization, a bit worse than uh, the swap method, because basically um, it is also a more complicated estimator. Uh, but, but in general, with uh, a few thousands of uh, clicks, uh, you still get uh, a, a, reliable, uh, a, reliable, a reliable estimate. And uh, while the second level of convergence is uh, gradient descent, no? how, quick, how quickly does it converge? And uh, this is very, very quick because basically it is a super simple optimization problem with just uh, a, few, a few variables, so. Hi, everyone, my name is Pei Dong Liu. I am a master's student at Tsinghua University. It is my pleasure to present our work here. The paper I will be presenting today is titled Multitask Ranking with User Behaviors for Text Video Search. Here is today's outline. The first part is introduction. As for text video search, it is one of the most important tasks in video understanding. He aims to retrieve the most user um, satisfactory videos given a text query. This task has attracted much attention from researchers around the world for its practical use in the industrial video sharing platforms such as YouTube, TikTok, and Twitter channels. There are several methods in this field. The first category is concept based methods, it represents the video with a set of concepts and then use them to match with a query test. The challenges of these methods lie in how to select relevant and detectable concepts for both video and query. The second category is cross-model fusion methods. It takes text and video as input to a cross-model fusion subnet, subnetwork and directly produces similarity between them. The challenge, the challenge lies in their search efficiency is low in reality, as video and text should be uh, coupled together in the first place. The third category is latency-based -based methods. It encodes video and query and then map them into a common latent space, which is commonly used because of their great ranking performance and high efficiency. Um, actually, in Practice, there are some challenges in the text video search. Text video search can be typically decomposed, decomposed into two stages, namely the matching stage and ranking stage. In the matching stage, we train the model with semantic relevance between the video and query text in the usual way to guarantee that the fact videos are semantically relevant. However, in the ranking stage, we argue that Semantic relevance is no longer the principal issue because the candidate items retrieved from the matching stage naturally guarantee adequate relevance. In some cases, only considering semantic relevance is not sufficient to provide user satisfactory um, videos given a, a query test. Let's take, uh, let's see an example, LeBron James. Traditional relevance-based search engine will uh, rank the videos about LeBron James um, playing a basketball game without distinction. However, what the user expects is actually the top 10 exciting LeBron James dunks of the night. Uh, the second part is our method. So we propose empty wrap-up line. We focus on the ranking stage and exclusively utilize 
user behaviors such as user feedback and interactions instead of the relevant scores to catch our user interest on videos given a query. We use multimodal video information as input. The test data evokes the you know our video title, um, the OCR, ASR, and the uh, visual feature includes the cover image and the uh, keyframes. For the query text and the text information of the video, um, we apply a pre-trained bird encoder from the clip model to obtain both sentence level embeddings and word level embeddings. For the visual information, or visual information of the video, that is video cover and keyframe. We apply a pre-trained VIT from the clip model to acquire image embeddings. To further consider distinct you know, characteristics of text and visual data, we propose heterogeneous um, multimodal fusion module to fuse the query text and video features in the different manners. On the one hand, we match the query with the you know, image data in a coarse grain way by concatenating the image embeddings and query sentence wise vectors directly. On the other hand, this module fuses the query with video text data in a fine grain way by modeling the semantic rela relationship with conf KRNL module for you know worldwide text videos. Uh, what wise text embeddings. So the query can match with different model data using adaptive manners. To alleviate the competing task correlation problems, we design an independent multimodal input scheme, which decouples the multimodal inputs by feeding only one model data instead of all model data to each expert. The gate mechanism in the ranking module can, you know, kind of reflects the importance of this thing's model inputs towards different tasks with learned weights, where large values indicate a high degree of importance. This module, uh, you know, improves multitask model interpretability to a large extent. The next part is experiment. For offline experiments, we collect 800,000 samples from the WeChat search engine, each of which contains a text query, a set of candidates, videos, and the user behavior log about this query. We adopt, as for the metrics, we adopt group-wise, you know, area under the ROC curve, that is GAUC, and normalized version of the discounted uh, cumulative gain. And, and NDCG in short as the performance metrics. Okay, so we um, conduct a great number of application studies on the offline data sets. The first one is to uh, explore the effectiveness of the mixture of experts. To verify this, um, we construct two simple, uh, you know, MEE baseline with and without MOE. For comparison, as shown in the table, MOE enhances the model capability to capture the task differences, thereby boosting the performances on different tasks over the uh, you know, shared button counterparts. After that, we excavate the effectiveness of independent multimodal input scheme. The table shows that the scheme boosts the performance in terms of the main GAUC and a DCG on most tasks. In addition, by analyzing the gateways in the MOE, we discovered that cover image and video title play more important roles in the X click task, while OCR, ASR, and video keyframes contribute more to tasks that are related to the user staying time, such as um, you know, East Wireless Day, um, East Long Day. Effectiveness of the, uh, 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 the uh, next one is to um, explore the effectiveness of the heterogeneous multimodal fusion module. 
we investigate the effectiveness of this module and uh, and the result is shown in the table. Okay, this module consistently improves the GAUC and NDCG by large margin over other baselines with M or, uh, MEE. It provides more adaptive interactions between the query and each of the various video modalities, thus contributing to a better information fusion. The last one is to uh, explore the effectiveness um, of the multitask learning for empty rob We compare uh, the performance of empty rob under the single task and the multitask learning manners. So um, in single task learning, we apply the proposed empty rub with only one single task tower, as illustrated in the figure. Compared to the single task learning, multitask learning enables different tasks to share knowledge together and hence boost the search performance for all tasks, especially those tasks that perform poorly in single task learning. That's to say, it's full play, um, it's replay, and etc. Besides that, we also conduct some you know, online experiment results on the WeChat search engine. We randomly sampled three user groups from WeChat search, each of which contained about 1.4 million users. We evaluated three different ranking strategies that is Ramus model, um, single task learning, user behavior based module, and anti rap We rank the scores by exponential fusion of all user behaviors. Comparing with Ramus ranking, Ranking by click through rates prediction improved its click rate substantially. And comparing with single task, ranking by multitask learning, user behavior based module further improved online consistently. The last part is conclusion. We propose the empty rub pipeline, the first study to exclusively explore user behaviors to learn a ranking model for text video, which directly studies user satisfaction towards videos. To utilize the multimodal data effectively, we put forward heterogeneous multimodal fusion module to match query with different modalities in adaptive ways. We designed the independent multimodal input scheme to evaluate the complex and even competing task correlation problems in multitask learning. Both online and live experiments on WeChat search show that our empty wrap outperforms the comparative baseline substantially. So that's all for today's presentation. Thank you. Mm, hello everyone. Here I will introduce an efficient video and sending system for long video analysis called fast clip. The task of fast clip system for video understanding aims to process long video to semantic short clips. Given an input long video, fast clip system first discovers several short clips with semantic information, such as the seal items, human pose, temporal action and scene classification. However, processing long videos is usually time consuming and expensive. For example, the length of live streaming video for shopping is about 10 hours in common, which results in 1 million frames for only one input video. These too many frames need a lot of computing resources. Furthermore, in many video understanding tasks, different semantic models are usually used for passing the video sequences, such as v, uh, such as object detection, human pose est estimation, activity recognition, and so on. Thus, the whole procedure could take a long running time and massive computing resources. How to speed up? The video understanding process is a critical problem 
for real-world applications. In this paper, we present an efficient video understanding system called FastClip, which aims to speed up the video processing and save computing resources. First, the system takes long video as input, such as live stream, TV show, game video, and so on. Second, a multi-model filter framework is applied to detect and delete useless segments based on audio features and video features. Third, several semantic models are used on the remaining video segments to discover high-value semantic clips in parallel to speed up the models with limited computing resources. We design a, a collaborative model inference framework consisting of a, a lightweight model and a heavyweight model deployed on CPU and GPU respectively. Finally, high value short video clips with the corresponding semantic information are produced. The whole video understanding process is divided into two stages. In the first course stage, we propose a multimodal filtering module to recognize useless video segments and reduce computations for the next fine processing stage. We roughly split the video sequences into segments with about one minute duration, and each segment contains audio stream and video frames. The audio part is processed by ASR to produce text feature, and the visual feature is also extracted from each segment. The visual and the text features are aggregated by a cross-modal attention module to perform segment classification, which is trained to recognize useless segments on specific tasks. In this way, the video segments classified as useless are removed from further processing. The fine processing stage of video understanding system consists of several semantic models, such as object detection, tracking, human pulse estimation, temporal action, and so on. These models all use large and deep models for, for extracting semantic information from video content. However, these models usually need massive computations and limited computing resources. In this paper, we develop a heterogeneous computing framework to speed up the inference by using different devices, such as mobile edge device, CPU, and GPU. For each semantic method, we design a collaborative model called Collab Model, which consists a lightweight module and a heavyweight module. For inference stage, the heavyweight module and the lightweight module are deployed on different devices, such as CPU and GPU and running in an interac interaction mode. The heavyweight module extracts features from keyframes and transfers the features to the lightweight module for feature aggregation and task prediction. The proposed video understanding system Fast Clip has been used in Alibaba productions, including Taobao Live Analysis, 
and uh, and uh, commodity short video generation. Currently, our short video production platform has been launched online for short video clip generation. First, we introduced the system interface and generated clips for live streaming. We can see left is the input video, and the right shows the generated clips. Each clip contains structured information. Now we show more details of the semantic clips, such as QA and action recognition clips. Fast clip can also process game video and a different highlight clip. First, we show the clips of game killing. Then, we show the clips of game death. Fast clip could also recognize actors and generate clips of some other objects. Is the presentation present? The video is still running, but I don't know if there's other things or so if we can uh, go on to the next one. Yeah, I think it's it's finished. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Today I'll be presenting our research work on how we can leverage the product images for cross-lingual alignment, especially in the semantic sourcing application. So this is a joint work uh, carried out by uh, Saurav, Vivek, and myself. So I would like to start the, uh, I would like to start by explaining the motivation behind this work. Query-based search is still a prominent way used by customers for product discovery. Surfacing irrelevant products are not showing uh, enough products for a customer can lead to a bad experience. And in extreme case, we may lose a customer. Further, to delight the customers and to reach a wider market, e-commerce marketplaces like Amazon support regional language search to remove language barrier. Recent advancements in the deep learning based NLP models like pre-trained multilingual transformers can be leveraged for this task. However, this requires large amount of human annotated data for, uh, for fine tuning these models. Typically, these human annotated data are expensive to generate and do not exist for many languages and marketplace. So let's assume over time we have gathered this human annotated data to fine tune uh, the multilingual models. One approach is to build a market specific or language specific models. But building market specific models has many shortcomings. First, due to dot of paucity, these models are suboptimal in nature. For example, uh, in our case, the, for the European language speaking marketplace, we have order of magnitude less data compared to English speaking marketplaces. Second, maintaining <coughs> marketplace specific models incurs 
computational and operational override. So, uh, which I feel is one of the major important uh, restriction is it restricts the uh, multi-local search. For example, me trying to search in Hindi language on my mother tongue or, or, or some other Indian languages in English dominant India marketplace. So another major drawback of market specific models is a transferred learning. That is knowledge cannot be transferred from high resource languages to low resource languages. Therefore, one of the viable option is to build a single multilingual model which can serve across marketplaces. But the current multilingual models either requires large amount of parallel data corpora, that is bilingual data corpora, or common products listed across marketplace for multilingual alignment. This is a bottleneck because for emerging or new marketplace, this data is either minimal or unavailable. Another and final motivation for our work is zero-shot learning. As I said, in many marketplaces, human annotated data are unavailable. However, we have considerable amount of catalog data, that is product title and product images. Here, our motivation is to think of a way to leverage this humongous catalog data to learn multilingual alignment in order to transfer the semantic knowledge from data-rich marketplaces to data-deficient marketplace. So we propose a M2-S2 model, which is nothing but a multilingual, multimodal semantic sourcing model, which uses product images for cross-lingual alignment. So our approach should solve two main challenges. The first challenge is the to learn is that of learning multilingual alignment. And second challenge is of capturing the query product relevance knowledge. With respect to the first knowledge, multilingual alignment, as we all know that uh, product images are language agnostic in nature. For example, image of an antlet will be similar irrespective of the language or the script we write in. Our main idea is to leverage this implicit signal for multilingual alignment. By doing so, we overcome the necessity of requiring vast amounts of parallel data corpora. Next, with respect to the second challenge, query product relevance, we use the human annotated relevance data set, comprising of monolingual query product human label tables from different marketplaces. Here, we are using just a monolingual data. That's a nuance. So, Further, we also leverage the catalog taxonomy data to improve the quality of the semantic space, wherein we make sure queries and products which are similar but belong to different categories to be far away in the embedding space. Example, Puma shoes and Puma backpack should be apart in the semantic space, even though the brand Puma is same. Now let's have a look at our multilingual alignment framework which is inspired from the clock program model. Here we have two main components, an image encoder and the text encoder. Image encoder is a ResNet 50 or the vision transformer with an embedding head on top of it. Text encoder is a embed or XLM robot model with an embedding layer on top of the CLS token embedding. The embedding size used for all our experiments is 512. As I mentioned previously, we leverage catalog data set for learning multilingual alignment. So our catalog data consists of just a product image and a product title from multiple marketplaces. So in order to learn the alignment, what we do is we leverage cross-modal similarity, uh, cross-modal um, uh, similarity that is alpha x over here, which is nothing but a similarity score between a product image and a product title. And also we leverage vision model similarity, that is alpha V over here, which is nothing but a similarity score between image one and the image two. We use this three alphas to get the soft labels, that is beta I check. As we don't have the bilingual parallel corpora, we learn the test to test alignment contrastively. Please refer to our paper for the definition of beta I check. So let us go through an example to intuitively understand how we leverage catalog data to learn this multilingual alignment. At the top, we see an positive example and the bottom, we see a negative example. Let's go through the top example first. Let's define the left pair as I and the right pair as J. As you can see, the left title 
is in Italy, in Italian language, and the right product title is in the German language. But these two refer to the same visual concept, that is flat backpack. So as we can observe that the cross-model similarity uh, between the test J and the image J is uh, uh, close to one or uh, uh, is close to one. Uh, and similarly for the this pair, and also the visual model similarity between the image I and the image J is also I. Our model has learned to leverage this cross-model alignment and the visual model alignment and assigned a very high similarity score for this Italian and German title pair. Similarly, even though there is a very high cross-modality score for these pairs, because of the low cross-modality score, uh, cross-modality similarity, our model has correctly learned to give low similarity score for this English title and Spanish title. In fact, this, the products are entirely different. It is working as a better. So here we can also observe that the image model, that is vision model similarity is crucial for us to provide the soft signals for the multilingual alignment. In the previous work, the clock proto model, in the absence of the explicit supervision for images, they learn this visual alignment contrastively. However, in our case, we leverage the product taxonomy data to train this image model in the supervised setting and freeze it during the learning the multilingual alignment step. So here are some of the odd negatives uh, that are generated using the uh, product taxonomy information. Now, with respect to the second challenge of solving query product relevance classification, we leverage human annotated data from various marketplaces to train. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, so uh, we, uh, yeah, uh, to train the model, we what we do is we optimize the ranking loss where we increase the cosine scores for the positive base and decrease the negative uh, uh, decrease the cosine scores for the negative base. Here. We get the query and the product embedding using the test encoder that we use for learning the cross-lingual alignment. And we fine-tune this test encoder using the human annotated data set. To further improve the semantic space, we have leveraged query taxonomy data set to build query query or negatives. Please refer to our, our paper to, know, uh, more, uh, to understand more on this query taxonomy data set. So, Again, uh, our model is trained in an alternative training procedure in order to reduce the forgetting problem of the multilingual alignment step. So first, you know, what we do here is in the first step, we train the model for the, on the multilingual alignment task, leveraging the pre-trained image encoder. And in the second step, we train on the relevance classification task, leveraging the test encoder from the multilingual alignment task in a Siamese fashion. So now let's look at the experimental results. Here, we observed that the glob proto model, which wasn't explicitly fine-tuned or trained on the relevance classification task performs the worst. As you can see, the AUC is almost close to 0.5. The catalog data set, one of the reasons is the catalog data set used to train this model does not have query data since it leverages only the product catalog data set. Hence, it misses many nuances of queries like capturing intent in shorter lengths, vernacular queries are more, and also the various levels of linguistic sophistication are missed. This answers our first research question. We do require the human annotated relevance data in addition to the catalog data to build a good sourcing model. Further from this table, we can also infer that the M2H2 model variants, all our M2H2 model variants outperform all the our um, baselines that we have created with a great margin. So especially on the uh, when we compare with the monolingual test-only model, we achieve close to somewhere like 5.39 to 9.18 percent AUC gains on non-English speaking marketplaces. And on English speaking marketplace, we uh, observe somewhere close to around point, uh, sorry, uh, close to around 1.3 percent AUC gains. Similarly, on top of the multilingual test-only model, we observe 
2.4 to 3.65% TUC gains. And further, we also conducted one more experiment. So what we did was we replaced the image, uh, ResNet image uh, encoder with a vision transformer model and the test encoder with the XLM robot model. And we saw uh, some uh, improvement in the AUC metric as well. So XLM robot and vision transformers perform better than the ResNet and Ember combination. So this is another experiment that we perform. That is how, how does our model perform in the zero shot setting? In this zero shot setting, the human annotated relevance data for the targeted marketplace wasn't present during training. The catch is we use only the catalog data of the target market, marketplace for multilingual alignment step. We can observe that the F, uh, M2H2 model and the fine tuned clock data model are having the zero shot AUC score greater than 0.8 across all marketplaces. This demonstrates we can eff efficiently transfer the learnings of relevance knowledge or the semantic knowledge from data rich marketplace to data deficient marketplace in a language agnostic manner. So when compared to the multilingual test only model, MQH2 model has gains of somewhere like 3.74 to 6.25%. And M2 and uh, M2 globe models have a score above 0.8%. So this is very crucial for e-commerce companies. As it continues to expand across marketplace and also assist them to launch the new language search experience in the existing marketplace without any human annotation data set. So in our paper, we also try to answer the following research problems. Do we need catalog data to improve the cross-lingual alignment? Can the image model trained using the supervised data set performs better than the image model trained in the context of learning? And finally, what is the value addition of this R negatives? So please go through our paper to know more about this question. I would like to end this presentation by showing the top five nearest neighbors retrieved from the semantic space using the embedding generated from the English data related to night shoes. You can see all the top five nearest neighbors are related to shoes and the top three is exactly the same product, which has been, uh, but the titles are in different languages. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ankit. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I actually don't have access to all of your reviews because your paper was drawn from the research track. We took a few papers from research track that were um, of very high quality um, and, uh, and had a uh, you know, in industry uh, relevance. So that's where your paper came from. Um, I'm just curious. Um, what led you to uh, the, the approach that you've just described? Uh, was, was there kind of, um, did you have any inspiration in other work on, um, you know, a similar uh, multimodal uh, approach to alignment uh, that, that led to your hero? Yes, so basically, uh... Our approach is more uh, like uh, there is a some paper called Globe Proto paper. So uh, our approach is very much similar to that. We are applied on the information retrieval task, sorry, uh, on the machine translation task, and we uh, borrowed the work and applied on our know, semantic sourcing application. And uh, there are certain nuances that has been uh, differ from that. That is, uh, we try to instead of the contrast to learn, we try to learn this image model in the supervised setting. Makes sense. Um, all right. Well, if there are no um, questions from the audience, it's a very small audience, of course, um, then we are going to end this session. Uh, again, thank you, Ankit and uh, Saurabh. Um, and we'll resume uh, the industry track if you'd like to attend the next session. Um, it's one that's of personal interest to me uh, from graphs and infrastructure. It starts at uh, 9.45 Central European time. Uh, by the way, at the beginning, I forgot to acknowledge uh, uh, my co-chair, our presenter, to track Petra Selmer. At some point, she'll be uh, taking over from me. Uh, it's uh, getting late here and we'll be coming later.
Uh, but I'll be uh, sharing the next track with you uh, for every time. So I have to sneeze when you move over there. Uh, and congratulations to the accepted um, papers. Um, and uh, thanks for. Uh, Hello, let me walk you through this paper, Ohm's Spot VM Eviction Prediction. That was accepted at the Industry Shack at the Web Conference this year. This work is led by Microsoft Research Asia. Seems this is pre record. Don't hesitate to write your questions during the talk in the chat, and I can answer live in the chat and in QA session. Let's first talk about Spot VMs. In Microsoft Cloud, there's unused capacity due to surface heating, recovery, and planned capacity growth. Spot VMs are affected mainly because of new deployments from on demand or high priority VMs. Spot VMs are there to have the least unused capacity. They are offered at a significantly lower price compared to on demand VMs. In exchange for very low surface level objectives, they can be fitted with 30 seconds notice when the capacity is needed back. So it is suitable for different types of applications, in particular for workloads that can sustain or recover from interruptions. For a considered time frame, say one hour, the efficient rate is a probability that a VM in a given cluster will be fitted in the next hour. Accurately predicting the efficient rate is crucial for both users and for the cloud service provider, in particular to choose suitable clusters to match with the surface SLO during the allocation of a new VM. And when the eviction of a spot VM occur, choosing which new cluster for restoration of a spot VM. The contribution of this paper are twofold. Compared to the current efficient rate model in production, it considers more granular features at a node level. It proposes the use of a spatial temporal transformer model so as to capture the relationship between the nodes on the one hand and the historical variations on the other hand. Let's review these two contributions. Here is an example that shows while differences between nodes matters, we consider two clusters A and B with the same overall number of spot and on-demand VMs. This means that they would contribute in the same way to a cluster level model. However, if we look at a node level, so here in plot, we have three nodes shown here for each cluster. We say that the utilized capacity is split differently. Different skills here uh, we have different colors represents for different SKUs. And the different distributions of spot and on-demand VMs across the nodes. Uh, in the plots, we have light shaded area for spot and solid color for on-demand VMs. Say so there's a rule that prevents yellow VMs to share a node with other colors. All of this together will lead to an infection of a spot VMs in one cluster but not in the other. For a cluster level model, we collect features like capacity, utilization, deployments of VMs, efficiency of spot VMs, etc. at a cluster level. For each cluster CI, we get time series over the last T hours with one value every hour. The model then predicts the efficient rate Y tall for the cluster CI. That is the probability that a given spot VM on this cluster will be fitted in the next 12 hours. The objective is to minimize the mean square error loss between this predicted efficient rate YCI tall and the true efficient rate over this period. What changes for a node based model? Uh, this time we gather similar features, but at a node level, we separate the nodes with spot VMs and nodes without spot VMs. Uh, the model predicts the efficient rate over the next 12 hours for each node, and the efficient rate for all nodes with spot VMs are then aggregated to obtain the node level efficient rate. As before, we separate the nodes on a cluster between nodes with spot VMs 
in blue and uh, the nodes with source spot VMs in red. We extract the features from each node with spot VMs and we aggregate the information from the multiple nodes with source spot VMs to reduce the amount of calculation and limit the impact from redundant information. Uh, this information is fed into a spatial encoder, which contains a multi-head attention layer and a feed-forward layer, and allows each node to attend to the other node's information through an attention mechanism. Um, the output is then fed into a feed-forward layer to have the inter-node representation. We repeat this for all time steps. And we add a temporal encoding here, um, similar to positional encoding. Uh, this is fed into a temporal encoder, which captures the temporal dependencies between time steps from historical features. Um, the output is um, acts as a global spatial temporal information. We are interested in one particular node. The other represents its context. Uh, the global information is added to that particular node um, time stereo features and then fed into a predictor to output a predicted efficient rate. Um, this way, uh, the spatial temporal transformer network captures both the inter nodes and the temporal relations. And here we show our experimental results. Um, we use a training dataset of two weeks data from 20 clusters. Um, it's around uh, 12,000 nodes. And we use a testing dataset for in one week from the same clusters. Um, the results shows that um, the cluster level prediction baselines generally performs better than their no level implementations. And a longer time prediction has a lower prediction accuracy in cluster level uh, baselines and our one model. Uh, which is not observed at the node level. And the clusters with median core utilization is the bottleneck case of our prediction model, which is not uh, presented in this slide, but in our paper. Uh, finally, we discuss current uh, limitations and the proposed ways forward. Uh, the weakness of the spatial time approach and formal model is that it lacks of interpretability compared to simpler models. There are many more parameters to tune, which results in longer training and inference time. Uh, the self-attention layer in a temporal encoder with quadratic time and space compressed limits the input uh, sequence length. Uh, more details is that uh, the training time takes, up most, uh, takes almost a day for around the 20 cluster dataset. Uh, and the inference time depends on the number of nodes as we do no level prediction before aggregation. It takes a few minutes for one cluster prediction, uh, still lower than the prediction interval, which is one, two, and three hour. But if we want to combine the prediction with mixture, uh, the inference time should be higher, should be highly reduced. Uh, for the future plans, mm, for the transformer model, we plan to modify the self-attention layer as in reformer and long former to allow training on longer sequence and periods. And we also plan to predict an efficient rate distribution uh, in order to provide uncertainty estimation. Uh, so this is the end of this presentation, and I'm here to answer your questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Chen, an um, uh, applied scientist and tech lead. Uh, from uh, the query understanding team of uh, Amazon Search. And uh, today I'm very happy to introduce our work about uh, uh, robust caches for Amazon uh, product search goals. Okay, so uh, first of all, let's see what is uh, Amazon product search engine. Here's a snapshot of the Amazon product search engine and the customer type in the uh, keywords like Nike shoes. And then product search engine, we're uh, trying to use some models to understand the, this query, like what is intern and what is attribute inside these keywords, and then use all this uh, attribute to push it into our matching model. 
And the matching model will try to uh, get all the a large number, a large set of candidates that match these keywords, and then pass through the ranking model. And the ranking model will rank uh, the products based on the relevance between the keywords and the every uh, product. So, so that is uh, stuff that is shown to the customers. Uh, so let's look into this product search engine. Uh, we know that the product search engine, uh, as I just showed, that the product search engine contains so many different components like query understanding, matching, ranking, and some other models. And in all these components, we have so many different uh, models like query attribute extraction model, query intent uh, classification model, and the query write model, or semantic product search model. And all those models are very large scale uh, models. For example, the query write model, semantic uh, product model, or the query intent classification model, uh, we are using very heavy um, transformer or bird based models to encode uh, the query to be able to uh, have a very accurate uh, output of this or uh, accurate understanding of this model. Uh, so we are facing a problem of uh, the latency is too high for the product search engine. And the traditional way or the common way or the widely used way of scaling up the product search engine or all these models is to use cache uh, so that we uh, we cache a large number of keywords and their corresponding output uh, so that when the next time the customer type into some keywords and we direct you this cache to retrieve the result if it's not missed we find something in the cache we just re uh, return the stuff in the cache instead of going through all these uh, heavy models. Um, uh, but there's a, there are several big issues for the traditional cache that with the increase of the size of the keywords, the cache size also increases exponentially. So our search engine cannot handle very large uh, scale of the cache. And also, there are a lot of typos and errors in the keywords. And all those typos and errors in the keywords uh, create very high redundancy uh, for this cache. For example, there are like Nike or Nike shoes or some error, some uh, grammar errors in this word. And all these are uh, very popular keywords, and we cache it. Uh, and uh, actually, these keywords are on belongs to the same keywords. And so it's a uh, uh, waste of the resources of the cache. And uh, there are also some challenges, James, about the, the semantic meaning of the keywords. Uh, so so there are like maybe very different keywords. They have exactly the same semantic meaning. They should return exact, exactly the same uh, products. And so all those types of keywords should also be appear uh, only once inside cache. Uh, so we know that, OK, traditional cache, uh, cache has all those uh, problems. We have to fix this. Uh, so in Amazon Search, uh, we proposed a new um, cache. It's called Rose. Uh, the, the, the long name of this uh, cache is called Robust Caches uh, for Product Search. Uh, so this proposed uh, Rose is a robust cache. It can do constant constant time retrieval and constant time memory usage for arbitrary large indexing size. And it's robust to typos and grammar errors. And it's also robust to uh, semantic information. So whatever uh, semantic meaning uh, we have, we can handle it by using this roles system. OK, so, so this is a storyline. Uh, the storyline is very simple. So in the next step, I will introduce uh, the roles framework. Uh, so basically, uh, I will introduce the high level uh, structure of roles. And then I will introduce uh, some offline and online experiments that we did and uh, 
uh, how do, uh, how do we deploy this system in the real world Amazon search uh, production search engine? Uh, okay, so the road system contains two phases, also two process. Uh, there's an offline building process. So, so the offline building process is actually the process of constructing this hash uh, based on based on a, 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 a data set that we want to cache. Uh, so, so, so the process is like this: we have a, a a data set of keywords or query like neck issues or coach facts, and we first uh, do tokenization and the vectorization to transfer all of these keywords from string format to sparse vector format. And then after we have this vectorized uh, information, we go to a black box stuff called locality sensitive hashing to construct uh, hash tables. And those hash tables can be regarded as a cache structure that I just introduced before. Uh, so after go this process, we actually constructed the uh, row structure, the cache structure. And then the next step is the online retrieval phase, so on online retrieval process. So basically, when a new um, keyword comes in, we use exactly the same process of tokenization and vectorization to transfer the string to the sparse uh, vector format. And uh, then once I have the uh, sparse format, uh, I will go to the exactly the same hashing process uh, to retrieve inside the hash table to get the candidate. Uh, so this is a framework and there's a uh, a fancy uh, black box structure called hashing, called location hashing. So let's get a small detour uh, to see what is localism hashing. So, so hashing, we all know that it's a function that maps a vector to an integer. Uh, and the, the locality sensitive hashing means that this mapped integer or hash value, uh, if uh, is has some relation with the similarity between these two data points. Uh, so, so that the for these two data points, their hash value, the probability that these two hash value is uh, is the same is proportional to the similarity between these two uh, data points in the original space. And the similarity here uh, it can be any similarity matrix. Uh, it can be like lexical similarity. It can also be like semantic similarity between two keywords. And we can uh, uh, we we can uh, understand or we can find that in this equation that the similar items are more likely to have the same hash value under the localism hashing function. Okay, so uh, here's an example. We have uh, six data points. We want to construct the hash table. Uh, and the uh, hash table on the left is likely to be constructed by the uh, location of hashing uh, because all these similar keywords that go through the same buckets, they are having the same hash value. But the table on the right is unlikely to be constructed by the, uh, by the uh, location of hashing because there are some unlikely event happened uh, for this uh, 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 hashing process. Okay, let's go back to the roles framework and let's use this. We Right now we know what is localism hashing. Let's use a small example to show what's going on here. So let's say I have uh, two, uh, four keywords and uh, one set of keywords in Nike shoes and the other is Amazon. So I map it, I push it into uh, three hash tables under the location of hashing, and we construct these three hash tables, and we can see that uh, uh, in some hash tables, the similar uh, keywords are mapped into the same location of the hash table. And then in the online retrieval process, we have a uh, 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 new uh, keyword that is called Nike shoes, Nike shoe. So we use the uh, location hashing to push to get the corresponding location in different hash tables. 
and then we get the entire set of the all the candidates in each location of all these hash tables, and then we count the number number of appearance of each uh, items in all these um, uh, uh, candidate sets, and we found in this case that the Nike shoes appear three times in these three hash tables. So the Nike shoes it is returned for Nike shoe. Uh, uh, that is uh, the key, uh, the uh, the query keywords. Okay, so this is uh, the high level framework. So uh, I will hide all the mass of the implementation details in the paper. So if you're interested in the details, uh, you can uh, uh, go to the table or directly uh, contact with me about this framework. So let's uh, looking at some experiment and success deployment. Deployment. So we did uh, offline experiment for this work. So basically, we compared it with uh, some traditional cache, and uh, we also made up some cache using some Kenyan's neighbor search methods. And we can see from this uh, ta uh, table that, uh, uh, in terms of F1 and uh, precision record, in most of the cases that our proposed method is better than the other uh, methods. And uh, when we're looking at the retrieval time and the in indexing generation time, uh, our proposed rows also uh, uh, faster than all this existing method. Uh, we deployed this, uh, this row system into our product search engine, and we use two uh, examples to show that. The first example is for rows, to use rows for the, our query rights model. And the, the other uh, um, use of the rows is for the prototype annotation model. So the query right model, uh, we compared it with the existing query right system, and we find that in terms of coverage, precision, and measurement, our roles based system is uh, better than the existing system. And we also did uh, an online A-B testing, and we find that uh, in terms of uh, revenue and purchase units and the click-through rate, we also gained a lot compared with existing method. And uh, for the prototype annotation, we compared with, with our online BERT model that we find that the precision and also the response time is also a lot better than the existing model. And we also run A-B testing, and we find that it's reduced the defect rate a lot uh, for, the, uh, for the product search. Uh, OK, cool. So this is uh, overall uh, framework of roles. And uh, this is uh, all the contents of uh, my talk today. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm very happy to answer. And uh, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sumit. Uh, I'm from Accenture Labs. And uh, this is the work uh, that we did. Uh, so these are the people who are involved in the work. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone could be here. So, uh, so today, I'll be uh, talking about uh, how we use knowledge graph embedding models uh, to perform unsupervised customer segmentation for an industry use case. So, uh, uh, yeah, so to start with, uh, let me just tell you how the presentation is divided. Uh, so first, uh, I'll talk about the problem statement. Uh, then we'll look at uh, the data set that we used and their associate and its associated challenges. Uh, then we'll see uh, the different approaches that we tried uh for getting customer representations and then we'll see how we did custom uh, uh, clustering uh, and how we analyze these clusters finally we'll look at the results uh, and compare all the three uh, methods that we tried and uh, we'll summarize the results at the end and if you have any questions you can pop it in the chat and we'll uh, take it at the end so uh so customer segmentation is quite important uh, for the uh, consumer goods industry uh, because you can capture uh, behaviors of the customers. And once you have the behaviors, what you can do is uh, you can look at the characteristics of uh, these cohorts and you can present to them uh, ads which target their behaviors. And in this work, we focus mainly on the beverage industry customers and we focus this, uh, like we use the consum consumption data 
uh, and we try to segment the customers uh, of beverage industry. So uh, let's look at how customer segmentation is done today in the beverage industry. Uh, so first of all, you have a lot of data out there, like uh, because of internet and mobile phones, people uh, tend to you know buy stuff uh, online. And uh, once you have bought the stuff, you also tend to write reviews about these projects, uh, pro products, like whether it's a good product or a bad product and so on. So there's a lot of data uh, out there, but uh, the data set is not annotated as in, um, uh, you you do not know what kind of user uh, is buying the data, like what's the behavior of the user. So you, we need to capture this behavior. And uh, in order to annotate these data sets, it's quite expensive. Uh, so currently, uh, this industry mainly relies on questionnaires and expert feedback. Uh, so the experts decide how to cluster uh, the customers based on the reply to their questionnaires. And these methods are quite expensive and it's very time consuming. So that's why uh, we propose this unsupervised learning approach uh, uh, where we try to uh, cluster the uh, customers uh, in an unsupervised way without labels. And then we look at the behavior of customers in these clusters. And then uh, we see uh, uh, like uh, uh, we see the behaviors and then we assign labels and then based on this, the marketing people can uh, target uh, the customers. So now let's look at the data set uh, so that we can understand the challenges that are associated with the data set. So this data set is called as the SNAP rate peer data set. So SNAP stands for Stanford Network Analysis Project. And uh, they got this data set from Red Beer platform, which is an online platform to uh, review beers. So uh, this uh, data set has uh, reviews of over 100,000 beer brands. Uh, and uh, uh, these beers are of 89 different styles. And uh, the reviews are got from uh, uh, 20,000, 49 customers. Uh, and uh, there's a sequential aspect to the reviews as in, uh, um, so the reviews are captured over a period of 12 years. And we believe that uh, consumption of one particular beer affects your choice of the next uh, beer. And this is captured in the reviews. So this is our assumption that we start with. Uh, and then in this data set, you have about 2.9 million reviews where each review captures, uh, you know, like details about which beer is being reviewed, the style of the beer, and then uh, the user's preference for the beer, like uh, uh, based on certain scores. So there are different types of scores associated with the review. Uh, and you also have the time on which the review, uh, time at which the review was written. So this is the data set. Uh, so uh, before we move ahead, uh, let's look at the state of the art in marketing segmentation. So uh, the first paper here, uh, so they, uh, they use uh, this snap rate beer data set uh, for recommender systems, uh, whereas we are focusing mainly on uh, unsupervised uh, segmentation. And then uh, there are other works as well, which require annotations and uh, some perform classification tasks, which again require annotations and thus they are quite expensive. Uh, and then you have uh, other works which uh, use handcrafted features and to handcraft the features, you need domain expertise. So uh, that's why this is also a problem. So now keeping all these problems in mind, uh, let's look at uh, the approaches that we tried. So first of all, we task, uh, we, we cast this problem of uh, segmenting customers uh, based on their consumption events into a clustering task. So, uh, so the way we do it is, uh, so we have a tabular data set of features which represents consumption events. So you have like a review along with its score and so on. Uh, and we, we pre-process this and we feed it to three different approaches. So the first approach is the handcrafted features where you need domain expertise so to hand engineer these features. Uh, then we look at uh, the LSTMs. So uh, LSTMs uh, try to capture the temporal aspect of the consumption events. So our hypothesis was your choice of current beer drives your uh, next beer, like uh, your choice of the next beer. So that's why we use temporal models like LSTMs. And finally, we use knowledge graphs. So we construct a knowledge graph out of the data set, and then we use knowledge graph embedding models to capture the customer representations. So using all these three approaches, we get the customer representations, and then we cluster it. 
and then we analyze these individual clusters and then we try to uh, label the clusters based on the behavior of customers in the clusters so these labels that you see are, are actual labels that we assigned uh, based on uh, the clustering of knowledge graph embedding models uh, so th these are actually embedding space from this approach uh, so now uh, moving ahead let's look at uh, the first approach the handcrafted features so uh, so in this approach you need domain experts to craft these uh, features from raw data so i talked about raw data earlier like it had uh, review features and from these review features we extract these hand engineered features the first one is the average review score so we average out the review scores uh, assigned by the customers and we get a single feature out of it then we get the sequence length so which is nothing but the total number of reviews written by a customer uh, we also have a, another feature called as an engagement score. So this is a metric which tries to capture how engaged a customer is. Uh, as in, so let's say you have three customers, uh, sorry, two customers who have written, uh, say, about 50 reviews uh, each. So first customer has written uh, about 30 reviews in the first year, uh, say in 2019. Uh, so say uh, in 2020, he has written about 20 reviews and in uh, uh, 2021, he has written 10 reviews. So totally about 60 reviews, uh, 30, 20, and 10. And the second customer has written uh, 60 reviews, but 10 in uh, 2019, 20 in 2020, and uh, uh, 30 in 2021. So if you see here, the engagement of the first user is decreasing over time, whereas the second user, uh, the engagement is increasing because he's writing more reviews uh, uh, more recently. So this is this metric uh, captures this uh, uh, engagement, and then finally you have the average weekly consumption frequency, uh, which is nothing but the average number of beers that are consumed uh, in a week. So uh, so these are the handcrafted features that we use along with the raw features. Uh, but the problem with handcrafted features is that uh, the clustering algorithm that we use, k-means, so that suffers from curse of dimensionality, as in. Uh, if the feature vector is quite large, uh, k-means doesn't uh, work well. So that's why we, co we couldn't include high cardinality features such as beer brands, because beer brand, like I said earlier, it, there are like more than 100,000 beer brands. So we cannot include that. And it's also difficult to capture temporal information because k-means by itself cannot handle temporal information. That's why we had to aggregate uh, the temporal uh, aspect of the data and thus we lose a lot of other information. And then uh, finally, you need domain expertise. So if you are an expert in the domain, you can come up with a handful of features which are quite useful. But let's say you're not an expert, you come up with thousands of features which are uh, not you know, good at capturing all the information, then those thousands of features may not be useful compared to this handful of features. So the expertise is quite important here. Now, uh, let's look at the LSTM uh, model. So LSTMs are nothing but a type of uh, recurrent neural networks which can capture long-term long de uh, dependencies uh, without going into vanishing gradient problems. Now, uh, in this approach, uh, I mean, uh, the main thing is uh, uh, we wanted to use raw features and also capture the temporal uh, assumptions that I mentioned earlier. Like, uh, so that's why we needed uh, temporal models and that's why we went for LSTMs. But uh, yeah, and and the thing is, in this uh, project, we mainly focused on LSTMs in an autoencoder fashion. So, as in, uh, what we do is we use the consumption events as inputs to the encoder LSTM. So, the encoder LSTM encodes the uh, the sequential events uh, in the hidden states, and then we get the uh, representation like the, the final hidden state which captures the customer representation as in it captures these temporal aspects uh, and then it is fed to a decoder LSTM which tries to reconstruct the original input sequence. So the LSTM is trained in this way so it tries to uh, reconstruct the original sequence and in the uh, meantime it uh, learns this uh, behavior and finally what we do is we extract this hidden representation after training and these are used as customer representations. So these are used for clustering, right? But the problem with LSTM is that, again, like the high cardinality categorical features, like the brand and the style. 
So they, be, they make the input vectors to be extremely large. And that's why the LSTM becomes slow. And also you have customers who have written, you know, approximately 16,000 reviews. So these are very long sequences and LSTMs cannot be unrolled for such long sequences. So it doesn't train on very large sequences. So that's why we had to truncate the data set in order to compare the models. So it couldn't be run on the entire data set. So uh, now keeping all these problems in mind, we, we, uh, we use this knowledge graphs and embedding models to overcome all these challenges. And let's see like how we did that. So first thing is like we use knowledge graphs to model the consumption data of all the customers. So what you're seeing here is basically the schema of the knowledge graph. Uh, so you have a review which has an author who's a customer. So a customer reviews a particular beer. So he reviews a particular beer and the beer has a particular style. And each review has different types of scores that are uh, uh, given by the customer. So uh, a customer might assign an aroma score, uh, a palate score, a taste score, appearance score, and an overall score for a particular beer. And then a review has a particular timestamp associated with it, which is captured here. And then uh, you have reviews uh, which succeed or precede another review. So, so a customer might write review one, and then this review one precedes review two, and so on. You know, so you, we add these links to capture the temporal aspect of the data, right? So all these features are encoded as a knowledge graph, and then when we instantiate this uh, schema uh, in the full data set, we had uh, around thirty-two million edges of approximately 3 million unique entities. And uh, then we also had a 75th percentile data set, which we used to compare all the three models because LSTMs couldn't uh, scale to the full data set because you know, uh, the customer sequences were quite long. So these are the two data sets that we used uh, during training. So now uh, what we did was once we had the knowledge graphs, we fed to the knowledge graph embedding models. Uh, so these are neural architectures which can uh, predict missing links between entities. And what these do is they convert each entity and relation in the graph to a low dimensional vector. So uh, this low dimensional vector was 50 in our case. And once uh, we use this library called AmpliGraph, which was developed in uh, Accenture Labs, and we have open sourced it, which you can find on GitHub. So we trained it using this library and we got customer representations from the uh, after training. So we extracted these uh, embeddings associated with customers. So now that we have the uh, customer embeddings or customer representations from all three approaches, uh, we performed cluster analysis, clustering and analysis on top of that. Uh, and this was mainly done to assign labels to the clusters and capture the behavior. So uh, let's look at how we did cluster analysis. So like I said earlier, we used k-means algorithm for uh, performing clustering on top uh, on the customer representations we got from all these models. So k-means does hard assignment, as in uh, you need to specify a value of k, and it tries to assign each points one of these clusters, like one of these k clusters. Now, since we do not know what value of k to use, we chose a range of k's, like we chose this range between 2 and 10. And we did so by looking at the literature. So, uh, and in order to determine the optimum value of K, uh, we, we chose the elbow method. So basically we plotted the distortion score uh, against all the values of K and we got the elbow. So based on this, we chose the optimal K. And in our, all our experiments, the K was four, like this, this is the optimal value, value we got. And we measure the quality of clustering using Silozet scores, which tells you how compact and well clustered uh, they are. So now silhouette score is uh, silhouette score is got per point and it can be averaged per cluster or you can get a global uh, silhouette score by averaging the silhouette scores of all the points. So these are the different metrics we used. And when we look at the results of uh, our full data set, since we couldn't run LSTNs, you can see only handcrafted and KG uh, results. So what we saw was uh, the average global silhouette score was quite high for handcrafted models. But then per cluster silhouette score, like for three of the clusters was either negative or close to zero. And only one cluster had a positive silhouette score. So positive silhouette score indicates it's a well clustered uh, data, whereas negative or zero indicates it's not a good cluster. So what we see here is three clusters are not good and only one is good. So 
and we also see that most customers fall in this single cluster so that's why this uh, these clusters are not usable whereas for kgs the average global siloset score is high but not as high as uh, the other approach but we see that all four clusters have positive per cluster siloset scores that's why the clustering is quite good and also the distribution of customers is also quite good we went on to do manual inspection and here you are seeing results of manual inspection on the 75th percentile where we compared all three approaches what we see is for handcrafted features customers in three clusters have similar profile or in other words we could have merged these three clusters making a single cluster and in the other cluster the fourth cluster all the single uh, like all the 90% of the customers fell in this and uh, uh, you know like uh, they exhibited varying behaviors so it wasn't a distinct behavior that was there in this cluster so this cluster was not usable same was the problem with lstm like uh, as you see here like uh, people uh, in these clusters they had like all different behaviors uh, on all these three metrics engagement score average weekly consumption and style diversity but if you look at the kge results customers across three clusters had distinct behaviors whereas the fourth one was similar so we could have merged this but then we still had three unique clusters and we could target uh, these cust uh, customers based on their behavior so now uh, uh, what you see here is uh, the labels that we assign to these clusters and this is for the full data set so in the full data set we could get four different clusters and when we did manual inspection like earlier we saw that we had four different clusters where you had casual customers who were most likely to consume beer, uh, beer during the week you had loyal reviewers who had the longest history and were less likely to give bad reviews you also had eager customers and engaged customers who were open to try new beers and who were gaining interest in the platform and you had new customers who were most likely to leave the platform so if you are from marketing team you could use these characteristics and you could present ads and uh, you know like discounts to customers uh, based on these uh, behaviors so to conclude with uh, what we did was we tried siloset analysis and manual clustering inspection and we saw that clustering combined with representation learning that is knowledge graphs provides marketing team with valuable insights uh, and then uh, knowledge graph embeddings could scale and it could outperform other approaches uh, in capturing the sequential and latent information so thank you for listening to me and if you have any questions please let me know thanks very much smith uh it's really interesting work and uh, a nice presentation um and uh thanks for giving it live um i don't see any questions yet in the zoom um yeah. If there are any questions, uh, you know, please raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, I'm going to do what I, I did before, which is to uh, pretend the reviewers are here in the audience and uh, relay some questions with the disclaimer that uh, you know I, I uh, did this before I'd seen your whole presentation, so there might be a little bit of redundancy. Um, here's one. Um, can you illustrate why chronological order is important for your review data? Yeah, so again, like I said, it's a hypothesis that uh, your choice of current beer drives your choice of next beer. So this is something that we wanted to try because, uh, you know, like uh, usually that's the trend, like you, you try something, you like it, you try similar things. So that's how uh, the behavior is, right? And that's why we we thought this behavior could be uh, captured in the review data. So we also assume that re, uh, user writes a review uh, in a short span of after trying a particular uh, brand. You know, so that's why uh, we use this temporal aspect. We we gave importance to this. Sure, makes sense. Um, and we have a lot of questions here. Maybe as a follow up, did you try a KGE without the temporal? Proceed succeeds edits to see a comparison. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, we have tried this, and uh, the models were. I mean, uh, so uh, KGs have this metric called MRRs, uh, where you compare the models, and we saw that uh, with the precede succeed links, we could uh, capture. I mean, the MRRs were quite good. Again, like we couldn't put everything in the paper because this is a short paper, 
uh, but uh, you know like uh, we have done all these analysis and we found that with these precede succeeds links kgs were better at capturing the temporal data and uh, you know like the clusters were also well formed the silosit scores were also quite good for uh, you know the one with precede succeed links so, so yeah does that answer makes sense yeah, um, and the uh, live question is uh, much appreciated, Thomas. Thank you. Um, I'm going to paste in one more uh, reviewer question, uh, mm -hmm. which I've rephrased a little bit. How can it be assumed that these data sets, online, in other words, on the online reviews, are representative of behavior of customers in general? Well, I mean, uh, so. Well, I mean, this is a platform that uh, Rate Beer is a platform where people write reviews about beers. And the project that we were working on was mainly focused on, uh, you know, like this beverage industry. Uh, so that's why uh, we got this data set uh, where we assume that, you know, reviews represent the choices of customers. Like if you give a good review to a customer, uh, to a product, that means you like the product. And if you give a bad review, you don't like it. Uh, and also, we uh, there was another assumption we started with, like your current choice dictates your next choice. So uh, we uh, since uh, this data set had all these features, like it had scores for reviews and it had this temporal sequences of reviews. We use we thought of using this data set. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Josh and Petra, for for all of the work uh, organizing this track. Uh, it's been great so far. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about some work on the Instacart knowledge graph specifically. Uh, so this came out of an internship this past summer um, and is in joint work with my mentors on the project, uh, Bill and Omar. So just as some preliminary context on the Instacart KG, uh, the Instacart knowledge graph was a domain specific product knowledge graph for the grocery industry. Uh, there's approximately 70 million facts in the graph, largely surrounding the product catalog. Uh, so it gives contextual information into the items for sale at Instacart, including nutritional information, uh, maybe some recipes they could be used in, maybe some cultural associations as well. The goal for the Instacart knowledge graph, uh, there were several. Um, for one, it allowed for better customer experience uh, in the sense of uh, better search as well as better recommendations. Uh, and as well, internally, uh, we were standardizing data for downstream uses, for example, in, in machine learning tasks. Um, so as with most knowledge graphs, our seed data came in a variety of forms. Uh, so most of it came uh, from our tabular catalog data. So we would have, you know, rows of item IDs with, with product details. Maybe we had image assets and, and maybe we had some free form text assets as well. And our goal was to extract and aggregate this information uh, and end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, now I'm going to be a little bit loose with the ontology here. You'll see I haven't really labeled any edges, uh, but hopefully it's clear from context. Uh, so I've tried to color these. I'm sorry if it's not coming through very well, but uh, in green in the middle here, I have two kind of item nodes. Uh, so uh, both of them are uh, chickpeas. So these items have these blue kind of literal strings. Uh, those would be like the product titles. They also have various other literals associated to them. So for example, down into the left here, I have 125, and this is representing a product weight. So we've standardized this weight using the external QUDT ontology, quantities, units, dimensions, and types. Uh, again, just to give us a very standard form for product sizes that we can then use for comparisons later on. Uh, on top of this kind of, uh, literal product attributes, we also have uh, a rich set of classes. So for example, we have uh, in red, a few classes here, we have product taxonomies. So both of these chickpeas would maybe be classified as beans. And of course, you know, above beans in the taxonomy maybe is canned goods and above that would be pantry items and above that would be food generally. Um, and then finally, we have some food specific classes in our ontology. 
again, giving us richer search and recommendations. So things like organic or vegan, or maybe cultural associations like French or Spanish, if that applied. Now, uh, this leads me to the motivating question. So as I said on the, on the first slide, uh, there's about 70 million triples in this knowledge graph. So obviously we can't curate that by hand. Uh, so what happens is the KG is automatically built from seed data using extract, transform, and load techniques. And not only that, the seed data is kind of constantly evolving. We're constantly getting new sources of information and maybe we don't know the quality of that seed data. Because these are automated ETLs, if there's noise in the seed data, that's going to be ingested into the knowledge graph. So the first question is, how much noise is incorporated into the knowledge graph as a result of these automated ETLs? And as a you know, sub-question, how can we detect that noise? And the second question is, Assuming we have detected noise in our knowledge graph, how can we ensure that we're kind of suppressing that noise and only publishing the highest quality data for downstream uses? So the solution that I'm gonna to outline today uh, runs through a series of unit tests to detect and flag this noise and give us a measure of reliability for facts in our knowledge graph. We employed a series of unit tests which examine different slices of the KG at a time. And this will be made more clear when I get to some examples, but you might imagine we have unit tests for the nutritional information specifically, or unit tests for the taxonomies. Some features of this approach is that the narrow scope of tests allows for easier examination of results. Uh, so these results are a bit more explainable than maybe a full scale KG embedding. Um, additionally, these tests are simpler to implement uh, and maintain. Uh, so the upfront costs are a little bit lower, which was helpful for us at the time as we were kind of just getting started with implementing this. Um, on the other hand, these can require domain knowledge to, imp to implement. Um, and, you know, I want to end with, regardless of what I share today, the right tests kind of depend on the KG. So these were kind of the right tests for us at the time. This is not to say that they're the only or the best tests. So without any further ado, uh, what kind of things did we examine? The most basic test you can think of is you know, a, a numeric test like outlier detection or a threshold test to see if a value is above or below a certain threshold. These are very quick to write and they apply to any numeric data uh, going into your graph. So they're widely applicable. They catch a lot of uh, errors that you might expect, like maybe accident someone accidentally entered in an additional zero when they were typing in the weight of a product, and so that became too heavy. They also have some surprising context because uh, in the knowledge graph, every piece of data has kind of been contextualized. So for example, maybe you have a food in the knowledge graph, which is cheddar flavored crackers, which was incorrectly labeled as a cheese product in the taxonomy from that cheddar in the title. What you can then examine is the carbohydrates in that product. So if you know anything about the keto diet, cheeses are very protein and fat rich, but they have almost no carbohydrates, whereas a cracker is all flour, it's almost all carbohydrates. So even if that nutritional information was correct, the taxonomy was incorrect and that would cause this piece of data to kind of be flagged. Uh, moving on, uh, we can use off the shelf word embeddings to try and allow us to get a semantic understanding from strings and let us pick up noise in this way. So for example, let's say item 317 has the title Raspberry European Biscuits. Um, we can use an off the shelf uh, word embedding like glove and promote that to a basic product embedding by averaging the word embeddings uh, of the product title. Once we've done this, uh, we can compare taxonomies of a product to its nearest neighbors uh, under this embedding, with the idea being that uh, products with semantically similar titles should be similar grocery items. 
So maybe our raspberry biscuits were similar to blueberry biscuits because raspberries and blueberries are similar. And maybe they're similar to raspberry scones because biscuits and scones are similar. If we now compare taxonomies on the left and the right, we see everything on the right is a bakery item. So if item 317 was not classified as bakery in our taxonomy, maybe that's a sign of unreliable data. Again, under the assumption that noise should be relatively sparse um, in the graph. Uh, another class of tests that we can apply uh, kind of goes by the name of, of hard or soft rules. Uh, the fancy term you might call this is intentional logic. And this describes kind of expected behavior that your data should follow. So this usually requires quite a bit of domain knowledge, but uh, if you understand your data, it can be very useful. An example that I, I like to give, uh, so I've included this image from the USDA, which describes how many calories are in one gram of fat, carb, or protein. So if I burn one gram of fat, that expends uh, nine calories, whereas carbohydrates and protein, uh, they release four calories when you digest them. And what that means is if I look at a product's nutritional label, that gives me a linear restriction on the calories in your candy bar and the fat, protein, and carbohydrates in your candy bar. And if that uh, linear relationship is not satisfied, something must be wrong there, just scientifically. So that would be an example of hard rules. It's kind of an extension of your graph's ontology. You can also include soft rules, which are more akin to an anomaly detection test. So for example, if you're walking down the street with your friend and they say, hey, do you want a Sprite? And they come back to you with a coffee flavored drink, you'd probably be suspicious of your friend um, because you know, I've, I've never heard of a Sprite uh, coffee drink. You know, Most of the time, a Sprite drink is lemon lime flavored soda. Maybe they would have an orange or a melon or a citrus flavored soda more generally, but but very unlikely that they would have coffee. And so if you saw a Sprite coffee product, that's probably a misbranding or a mislabeling. Finally, the last class of tests that I wanna describe are metadata tests. Uh, and this has to do kind of with data provenance. Um, it's less concerned with the data itself and more concerned with the context surrounding that data. So for example, something you see in e-commerce all the time is that uh, maybe many different retailers will want to be selling the same product. And so all of those retailers might give you uh, attributes of that product, like the weight. So what we see here is we have four sources of, you know, the size of this can of soda. Three of us are saying 12 ounces. One of us is saying 120. We can kind of aggregate these sources and examine the distribution of the data that they give us. And in an ideal scenario, that distribution is tightly centered across you know, a single weight that we can rely on. If that's very spread out, if that's horizontally distributed across multiple weights, uh, that's a sign that there's probably some disagreement there and that we should look a little bit closer. So there's many classes of metadata, metadata tests that you can use. Again, it depends on the, uh, the specific application and, and where you're getting your information from but these can be very reliable um, ways of detecting inconsistencies. So <clears throat> that's just a general overview of the type of tests that we were implementing. Um, now let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. So once we found this noise, what do we do? So the scoring pipeline at Instacart um, worked as follows. So again, we have our source data. Uh, that source data is extracted via the, the extract transform load process into what we call a staging KG, which has all of the triples that are unranked. We then query the staging KG and run it through a series of tests, these unit tests, which we code in as uh, Python classes. And depending on the tests that pass or fail for a given triple, that either gets uploaded into a quality named graph, a questionable named graph, or an unreliable named graph. So just a, a very basic uh, system using named graphs here. 
In addition to this, we maintain very granular logs, which allow us to look for more systemic issues. So if we see one class of test that is failing over and over, maybe we can correct that. Um, you know, maybe that was an issue with the ETL or something like this. And finally, we maintain a feedback loop, which gives information back to our data suppliers so that they can see the tests that are being flagged and maybe correct that information at the source so that our data becomes cleaner over time. Um, once this data is scored and it's in these named graphs, you can then query uh, for data at or above any level of reliability that you want. So for example, for some, some business use cases, uh, let's say you're promoting a holiday sale, maybe for Halloween. Why not promote the products with the most complete and accurate information in your catalog? So query from your, uh, your quality data first and kind of um, populate your advertisements with those reliable products. Let's say internally you're training a classifier for something like a label propagation task. Why not train that classifier on the cleanest data in your catalog to ensure that it's not picking up noise during the training process? Uh, finally, you know, why would you query the unreliable data? Well, maybe you're outsourcing a data cleaning effort. So maybe you're trying to clean your catalog at scale. Uh, this costs a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. So why not focus that on the areas of the graph that need it most instead of wasting that efforts on parts of the graph that you are kind of relying on already? Um, so there's a variety of use cases here that you can use. Uh, additionally, the, the nice thing with our implementation, uh, we were using Amazon Neptune. Uh, if you don't want to use the reliability scores at all, all of your queries run in the same way that they did before the scoring process. Um, so you can also query the graph in the default mode um, as well. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, happy to take a few questions on the system now at this point. Sure, thanks a lot, Tom. Um, somebody has raised their hand. Victor, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, great talk. I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you uh, you started your first slides talking in the past sense. Uh, is there something, is this knowledge graph somehow in the past? That's my first question. And the second one is, um, what, this example that you gave with the soda, um, the coffee flavored Sprite, something like this. Um, how do you detect such anomalies also using embeds? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I may have been talking in the past tense just because uh, I was interning over the summer. Um, and so for me, it was kind of in the past tense. Um, as far as I know, the uh, the graph is, is still alive and kicking. Um, the soft rules, um, yeah, that's a good question. They can come from a variety of different places. So uh, if you want to go high tech, there are things, uh, for example, RUDIC, R-U-D-I-K. It stands for Rule Discovery and Knowledge Bases. Um, and that actually allows you to, to kind of search for these uh, in your internal data. Um, another thing you can do is look externally to a source like, for example, Wikidata. So Wikidata has a lot of open source information on brands as well as associations with those brands. So for example, it will say Coca-Cola is a beverage company that makes Coke flavored products. Um, so you can rely on those as well. Um, as well as, you know, if you have your domain specific knowledge, you can kind of do some crude searches by, for example, looking at the distribution of a product um, with a given brand or distribution of the products with a given brand to see if there are some patterns there to look for. Thanks a lot. Um, you got a lot of good uh, comments from the reviewers. I'm just going to echo one that uh, was something I was also wondering about. Um, some more detail on the knowledge graphs ontology would be interesting. Uh, this is this is kind of uh, you know in my wheelhouse. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. Um, coming up with an ontology 
that um, brings together um, a lot of the, you know, the, the company's data in a, in a single knowledge graph is challenging. Maintaining that anthology uh, is challenging. Aligning uh, you know, the, the various uh, data sources with that anthology is challenging. It seems to me you're adding on to the, um, the, the expertise of that is required of the uh, individuals who are um, building this knowledge graph in that now they will need to be able to uh, you know phrase these constraints I, i'm curious about that process and um of you know how you uh is it a small uh set of highly uh, you know skilled developers or ontologists who are creating these um uh these tests um how, what is the process for, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, for creating and maintaining the tests essentially is what I'm really curious about. Yeah, sure. Um, good question. Um, so the, the Instacart KG uh, team at the time was uh, very small. Uh, I believe I was the fourth person to join the team as an intern. I could be off by a few people there. Um, and uh, for the most part, the unit tests were coming out of my work uh, together with Bill and Omar. Um, and so it was kind of a small enough team where we kind of knew what was going on at the time. And so we had a good global picture of, of the unit tests and the ontology. Um, the infrastructure was kind of being built at the same time. So we were kind of constructing the ontology uh, and constructing the infrastructure at the, of the graph all at the same time um, in some sense. So it was a little bit uh, ad hoc in the sense that I was there for three months and so I didn't have quite as much time to, to clean it up as much as I would have liked. Um, but I do think in terms of you know maintaining a consistent picture, um, it's not a very nice answer, but you know documenting these unit tests as best as possible, as well as for instance, the dependencies amongst the unit tests, because you can imagine if a piece of data fails test A, if we think its taxonomy is wrong, that might kind of poison downstream tests and cause it to flag other tests as well. Um, so maintaining kind of a high level overview of which tests are running and when um, is, in my opinion, very important. For us, it was kind of a small enough scale that with our team, we could kind of do that internally with, with good documentation. Sure, uh, makes sense. Back to the original uh, uh, reviewer's comment as well. Uh, so this knowledge graph already existed when you began your internship, right? Uh, was it already using ontologies like QUDT? What was the ontology like at the time when you started? Yeah, um, so it was using QUDT. Um, so the ontology, for the most part, what consisted of QUDT for kind of our, our numeric data. Um, and we also had an ontology for recipes for, you know, products that would go into a given recipe. Um, and the, the biggest kind of other sort of ontology or ontology type thing were the product classes. Um, and so that was largely, again, coming from catalog, kind of the types of things that they wanted to have associated from us. Um, and so, so we just implemented those. Uh, but for example, the taxonomy, um, that was actually already implemented by catalog. So, so we weren't in charge of taxonomy at all. Um, so a lot of it was, there for us, and we just kind of had to put it in the in the triple sore in some sense, if that makes sense. Sure. Okay. Um, well, really interesting work. Thank you again uh, for your uh, for being part of the track. Hello, everyone. I'm Chen Chen Song from Tsinghua University. I'm glad to share with you my work during the internship at Alibaba Group. The title of our paper is DCGNN, 
decouple the graph neural networks for improving and accelerating large-scale e-commerce retrieval. First, let me briefly introduce the business background. Nowadays, online e-commerce platforms such as Taobao, eBay, Amazon has become increasingly popular in people's daily life. These platforms involve search, recommendation, and advertising systems, which are essential parts to help users better find what they need from billions of products. Taking Taobao's sponsored search system as an example, the system can be roughly divided into two stages, retrieval stage and ranking stage. In this paper, we focus on the retrieval stage, where the CTR model is normally designed as a two-tower architecture to save computational resources. Most recently, graph neural networks has become one of the state-of-the-art for large-scale e-commerce retrieval. Various graph models have shown great potential on topological feature extraction and relational reasoning. However, the conventional GNN-based large-scale e-commerce retrieval faces with two major challenges. First, this retrieval scenario normally has billions of entities and tens of billions of relations. As shown in the table below, we collected seven days data from Taobao app. Such huge amount of graph data leads to a rapid expansion of training samples, which can severely reduce the graph model's training efficiency. Second, under the limitation on efficiency, only shallow graph algorithms can be adopted. The shallow graph operations only capture the information of a very limited neighborhood for each target node, which hinders the GNN's representation capability. To address the aforementioned issues, we propose the decoupled graph neural networks, namely DCGN. The contributions can be summarized as follows. First, DCGN decouples the traditional GNN-based two-tower CTR prediction framework for retrieval into three stages to simultaneously improve training efficiency and representation capability. Second, each stage of DCGN can work compatibly with the existing SOTA methods to further promote the performance. Extensive experiments on large-scale industrial datasets demonstrate the significant improvements of DCGN in both training efficiency and representation capability. Current researches on tackling the aforementioned challenges can be divided into two categories, graph pre-training and the lightweight graph models. Now let us review the related works. As we have listed, graph pre-training consists of skip gram-based models and pre-training GNNs. Our DCGN framework differs from graph pre-training in two aspects. First, DCGN can separately and simultaneously learn graph attributive and deep structural properties. Second, on the premise of ensuring training efficiency, DCGN can adopt complex graph operations. As for the lightweight genes, there have been well-known sampling-based methods and efficient propagation-based models. Our DCGN differs from these works in two aspects. First, lightweight genes can promote negligible acceleration when deployed in industrial settings. Second, their simple simplification of graph operators can deteriorate the graph representation capability, especially in attribute graphs. Next, we first provide an overview of the proposed DCGN framework. Then we elaborate on each stage, starting with the multitask based pre-train stage, followed by the deep aggregation stage. Finally, we briefly introduce the two-table CTR prediction stage. As shown in the figure, the pre-train stage aims to learn rich node attributes with carefully designed multitasks. The deep aggregation stage is responsible for mining higher order graph structures to further enhance the node embedding. The last CTR prediction stage aims to acquire prediction score for retrieval. First, we come to the pre-train stage. Let me introduce the motivation of the designed multitask learning. The large scale industrial graph basically includes query, user, and add nodes and each node carried rich attributes. To effectively learn rich node attributive information, 
we first design a supervised link prediction task. Meanwhile, in the industrial settings, the node embedding update is usually carried out in the form of subgraphs due to the limitation on efficiency. The generation of subgraphs inherently introduce randomness. Thus, to enhance the robustness of GNs and capture nodes generalization characteristics, we supplement a self-supervised multi-view graph contrastive learning task. The framework of pre-train is shown in this figure. We perform random walks on the regional large-scale graph to generate three subgraphs. The first subgraph is used for link prediction task, and the remaining two subgraphs are for multi-view graph contrastive learning task. Link prediction is to predict whether two nodes in graph are likely to have one edge. We pre-train the graph encoder with a task that predicts whether there is an edge between query and add in the first subgraph. Note that we use the click relation as the edge in graph, and thus this objective is aligned with the goal of CTR prediction stage, which means that we use the CTR prediction to guide the node embedding update in the first pre-train stage. Hard negative mining can promote the embedding learning by making the model better at differentiating between similar results. In the link prediction task, to impose GNs on node attributes learning, we explore two kinds of hard negatives. The key hop negatives can adjust the hardness by changing the parameters key. This kind of negatives ignore the graph structure and impose the genes on node attributive information learning. The structure negatives are obtained by retaining the neighborhood structure of the positive ID and replace it with a negative one coming from the global negative sampling strategy. Such structure negatives generate a fake subgraph with the same topology as the original true one and then return the randomness of the global negatives. Thus, in the case of similar graph structures of positives and negatives, the GNs will pay more attention on the node attributes learning. In addition, since GNs inherently relies heavily on the graph structure, such negatives can also help to alleviate the oversmoothing problems. As we mentioned before, in the industrial settings, the node embedding update is usually carried out in the form of subgraphs due to the limitation on efficiency. The generation of subgraphs inherently introduces randomness. Hence, to enhance the robustness of genes and capture node generalization characteristics, we supplement a self-supervised multi-view graph contrastive learning task. As shown in figure, the subgraphs are two augmented views of the same target node, which are treated as positive pairs. The augmented views of any different target nodes are treated as negative pairs. The contrastive loss is adopted to maximize the agreement of positive pairs and minimize that of the negative pairs. Finally, we utilize a multi-task training strategy to jointly optimize the link prediction task and the multi-view graph contrastive learning task. After the first stage, each node embedding in graph has learned rich attributive information. Following the pre-train stage, deep aggregation aims to mine higher order graph structures to further enhance the node embedding. Meanwhile, we hope to preserve different key order proximities in graph and alleviate the exponential computational complexity of graph operators. The framework of deep aggregation is shown in this figure. A set of linear diffusion graph operators are employed to mine and preserve different orders of graph structures. In addition, the parallel forward propagation strategy can effectively reduce the exponentially increasing computational complexity to be linear with the graph layers. After this stage, each node in the graph, on the basis of the learned rich attributes, is enhanced by the distilled additional important information from deep graph structure. Next, the enhanced node embedding provides dense feature inputs for the two table CTR prediction stage. 
due to the huge amount of candidate products. The CTR model in retrieval stage is typically designed as a two-tower architecture. Therefore, in this stage, we establish a two-tower CTR prediction model where one tower is query user and the other is add. As shown in this figure, the node embedding generated by the first two stages provides dense feature input for the CTR model to acquire the prediction score for retrieval. Now we present the experimental results to verify the model performance and the training efficiency of the proposed DCGN framework. First, we compare the DCGN with SOTA competitors, including lightweight graph models and graph pre-training methods. Next, we respectively evaluate the multitasks and the designed negatives in pre-train and analyze the aggregation layers and the neighbors in the deep aggregation stage. Table one is our data set collected from Taobao. The Taobao graph is constructed by collecting seven days user click behavior logs on Taobao's sponsored search platform, which consists of three types of nodes and three types of edges. As we can see, such large scale industrial graph is suitable for analyzing the performance of our method and the competitors. Table two shows the performance comparison between DCGN and the competitors in terms of AOC and hit rate. For fairness, all methods are optimized by the same learning strategy. Experimental results show that DCGN consistently yields the best performance in AOC among all SOTA methods. As for the hit rate, our method can not only consistently maintain the recall accuracy over top candidates, but significantly improve the prediction results over mid and long tail candidates. Regarding the training efficiency, we compare DCGN with the lightweight GNs based methods. It can be seen that DCGN achieves the higher training efficiency compared with the competitors. Thus, DCGN effectively improves the GNs representation capability and the training efficiency in large scale retrieval scenarios. We also evaluate the effect of each proposed stage of DCGN, mainly focusing on the pre-train and deep aggregation stages. From the experimental results, we can see that the link prediction and the contrastive learning tasks are both indispensable for pre-train stage. Hard negatives can promote the embedding learning by making the model better at differentiating between similar results. We conduct parameter studies on the number of key hop negative samples and the structure negative samples. The model performance improves continuously with the increasing of the number of key hop negatives and the structure negatives. In the deep aggregation stage, we find that our method combines higher order proximity to enhance the node embedding. The computational complexity is linear with the graph layers. Okay, we finally come to the conclusion. In this work, we propose DCGN, which decouples the conventional GNs based CTR prediction framework for retrieval into three stages pre train, deep aggregation, and two tower CTR prediction to deal with the trade off between model performance and the training efficiency. The pre-train stage aims to learn rich node attributive information with carefully designed multitasks. Then, deep aggregation stage captures higher order proximities in graphs to further enhance the node embedding. Each stage in DCGN can work compatibly with the existing SOTA methods to further boost the model performance. Based on our experiments and analysis, the improvement in training efficiency is mainly attributed to the decomposition of graph operations and the two-tower CTR prediction. Both multitasks-based pre-train and deep aggregation stages contribute to the significant improvement of model performance. DCGN essentially provides a feasible alternative or complementary framework for large-scale e-commerce retrieval. Hello everyone, my name is Yi Li. I'm from Tsinghua University. In the following, I'm going to introduce our work, PAL, 
personalize the re-ranking with contextualized transformer for recommendation. In natural recommender systems, typically follow a matching, pre-ranking, ranking, and the re-ranking pipeline to gradually reduce the number of cadence items from millions to thousands to hundreds and finally to tens. As shown in the figure, the final goal of recommender systems is to provide an ordered item list to users. The ranking as the last phase in the workflow, it determines the final displayed items and their order. Therefore, Re-ranking has received increasing attention in recent years. Re-ranking and to mod the scoring function by jointly encoding a list of items into contextualized representations. Several pioneer research efforts have been made to achieve this goal. Concretely, DLCM implies GRU to encode the initial ranking list sequentially. In contrast, PRM introduces the self-attention mechanism to model inter-item dependency in initial ranking list for re-ranking. Although these models have focused on re-ranking modeling, all of them only consider the context of the initial ranking list. Largely, neglecting the potential influence by the historical clicks item list. To address the above issues, we propose the following improvements. The first is multi-level interaction. We model both feature-level and item-level interaction to combine the advantages of both ranking and re-ranking models. The second is historical list and uh, initial list. We imply the popular encoder-decoder structure that has been widely applied in NLP to capture the item-level interaction, not only with the initial ranking list and within the historic item list, but also across the two lists. The last is multi-task training. We chain pair through an item level ranking score prediction task, as well as a list level class verification that assess users' satisfaction on the whole ranking list. In the following, I will introduce our model pair in detail. As illustrated on the right, our model consists of three main paths. They are feature-level interaction, item-level interaction, and multi-tax training. Next, we introduce each path one by one. The first is feature-level interaction. Learning interaction of real features is important as indicated in existing studies for ranking. To field features of each user item pair, such as gender, city, category, we propose the feature interaction module. In recent years, many effective feature interaction networks have been proposed, such as YouTube DNN, DeepFM, DCN. It is generally applicable to imply any of these networks as our feature interaction module. To be efficient, we use a two-layer MLP in our work. Next is the item-level interaction. Although recent models introduce different network structures to model the mutual influence between item pairs, all of them only consider the context of the initial ranking list, largely neglecting the potential influence by the historical clicked item list. However, historical user behaviors can turn rich and fine grade user interests that are equally important for contextualized item modeling in re-ranking. In order to expand the context scope for improved personalization, 
we design a novel contextualized transformer architecture. It is the popular encoder decoder structure. The encoder patch is a self attention layer that model fan grade user interest in the historical be behaviors as well as provide more informative context for learning item interaction across lists. Specifically, we use the self attention as follows. Then, a merged clause attention layer is applied to model the item interaction within the initial ranking list and across the two lists simultaneously. Unlike the decoder in the vanilla transformer, we merge the self attention sublayer and the clause attention sublayer for better computation efficiency in GPUs. More specifically, the merged clause attention is formulated as follows. The last is multi-task training. The output of contextualized transformer goes through a one-layer MLP followed by sigmoid activations for click prediction and user satisfaction prediction. It is worth noting that Softmax laws does not work well, since multiple positives may exist in the initial ranking list, making the sum of grand choose probabilities larger than one. Instead, we model the click prediction task as a multi-label learning program using binary cross entropy laws, which is defined as follows. Considering that the above laws only considers each single item in isolation. We introduce an auxiliary task, which is a list level task to predict the number of clicks in each initial list. We do this by using the path of the output that represents the spatial classification token, which aggregates the list level representation of the entire initial ranking list. For simplicity, in this work, we also formulate it as a binary classification problem with the following laws. At last, we combine the two laws functions as multi-task learning. To evaluate the effectiveness of PEL, we have conducted comprehensive experiments on a public benchmark datasets for micro video recommendations and a large-scale production dataset for news recommendation at Huawei. It also news, news dataset. The statistics of the two datasets are showing the table on the right. And they both have tens of millions of data. We use the two common metrics for evaluating the ranking performance, including GLC and NDCZ, to generate an initial ranking list for a re-ranking model with SEC-DCN, a learning to rank method that achieves great success in induction, and we compare our proposed pair against several baseline re-ranking models including DLCM, SetRank, and PIM. The overall performance of our baselines and pair are shown in table. For each data set, we report the results of one ranking model DCM and three SOTA baselines and pair. The best performance are highlighted in bold. Results show that PEL consistently outperforms all baselines across the public dataset and the industrial dataset in all cases. To prove the efficiency of the auxiliary task, we compare the performance of our model without and with auxiliary task on micro video dataset. Results are shown in table. According to the results, the GLC S30 drops from 0 0.5741 to 0 0.5672 when removing the auxiliary task. 
This verifies the effects of the global supervision signal of the list. The figure shows the performance comparison of PEL with different history lengths on the micro video dataset. Obviously, as the length of historical sequence increases, the performance of our model is gradually improving. When the length of the historical sequence changes from 64 to 128, the performance improvement is most significant. This justifies the effectiveness of the sequence signal of the historical behaviors in the re-ranking stage. Therefore, the above ablations show that each component in PEL is effective in refining the order of the initial ranking list. For future work, we will pursue two directions, time complexity and list-wise task. When the historical sequence is very long, it faces some problems in efficiency. Therefore, model designs for modeling intra-sequence and inter-sequence attention are worth exploring. In addition, the design of list-wise tasks can be further explored, such as diversity of items in the list. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eli, for the recorded presentation. Um, I think you are also on Zoom. Um, so if there are any questions, uh, please post them in the chat or just raise your hand and ask, uh, ask them. Um, uh, since the audience is uh, very small, as it has been in the last two sessions, um, what I've been doing is uh, if we don't get live questions, I post um, questions and comments from your viewers of the paper. Um, so that's what I'll start with here. Uh, there was one um, question in which re ranking category, point wise, pair wise. Um, sorry, I meant to paste this into the, uh, the general chat. In which re ranking category, point wise, pair wise, list wise, does the proposed method fall into? My hunch would be list wise. It's a question for you, Edie, if you're um, there. Uh, I think you are. Um, so. uh, okay, my name is uh, Edie. Uh, uh, in the ranking stage, all almost uh, is list wise, uh, uh, point wise, uh, pair wise, or list wise. Uh, list category is beyond to ranking stage. In the ranking stage, we need to uh, take into account uh, the item and item interaction. So, I I think all the ranking mostly is. Uh, about list wise, but we, but we, when we do, when we uh, compute the loss, is uh, we adapt the uh, binary cross entropy. So, in uh, from the aspect of loss, it may be belong to uh, point wise. Uh, that's 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 all. Sure. Thank you. Hi, yeah, my name is Patrick, and today I'll be presenting our work done on uh, behavioral testing um, of recommender systems done in collaboration uh, across industry and academia, uh, in particular, my co-authors, Jacopo, Federico, Chloe, and Brian. Um, yeah, I represent Coveo, a SaaS company, work, uh, providing solutions in areas such as commerce, uh, service, and workplace. And um, yeah, as we all know, point-wise metrics uh, like hit rate, uh, MRR are common and no doubt useful ways of measuring the performance uh, of recommender systems. However, they are unable to provide a full and rounded picture of model performance, um, especially in production settings uh, where the performance of these models uh, ultimately count for the most. And here we see some you know, real life uh, recommender system mistakes um, and uh, some of the mistakes are more subtle than others. Um, 
And on the left, uh, we see an executive assistant role being recommended uh, for a CTO, which I hope we can agree is uh, in general a terrible recommendation. Um, on the right, uh, we see a commerce recommendation, uh, but here the, the error introduced is, is more subtle. Um, on first glance, uh, it looks like you know uh, all the products are you know boots, and therefore it makes sense. Uh, but when you inspect uh, on a closer closer inspection, we see that. Uh, you know, the gender is varying and some of it's for kids and, and it's very unlikely that someone would uh, be shopping for all these things at once. So, yeah, and so the question is, uh, what can, what, like, what can point-wise uh, or aggregate metrics tell us? Um, and here we see an example where Federico, uh, who loves rom-coms, rom uh, is watching The Big Sick uh, in January. And in February, he watches uh, When Harry Met Sally. And so we can envision uh, using this data point uh, to ev evaluate models um, with say like hit rate. And what we observe here uh, is that uh, model A and B are numerically indistinguishable, um, despite the fact that model B is uh, much better than model A, given that uh, the genre of its uh, other predictions is, is, is still in the rom-com kind of genre. And, uh, so we can see here how point-wise metrics can obscure certain aspects uh, of the model performance, uh, which are important. So the good news is that recommender systems uh, don't fail randomly. Um, if, if it were random, then there, was, there would be little we could do about it. Um, and so there exist some sort of like patterns or what we call behavioral principles of recommender systems, uh, which were introduced later that can be enforced um, or tested and tested. So one example could be similar item recommendations um, where we expect uh, some sort of like symmetry property to be, to be held, uh, not just for the product uh, types, but also for prices. And these things can be tested. So the question to ask is whether the way in which we test our recommended systems today uh, capture these sort of like nuances and errors. And perhaps we do have tests, uh, but maybe they're very like ad hoc and there's no like standardized framework uh, for us to think about these things. And this is where Reckless comes in um, as a way to perform behavioral testing on recommended systems uh, at scale. Mm, when building Reckless, uh, we drew on the principles of checklist, which is the seminal work on behavioral testing in NLP. In particular, we borrowed the idea of using um, input-output pairs to describe and test the expected behavior uh, of a system. So in the case of checklist, uh, the, the system would be a language model, uh, whereas in our case, in reckless, the system is a recommender system. And in doing so, um, we are able to treat recommender systems as black boxes uh, while checking for their compliance to certain behaviors. And the way in which checklist achieves this, um, and in a similar vein, reckless, is to have an abstraction which allows users to programmatically define tests which capture certain behavioral principles which we believe that a system should adhere to. And you know, an example in the case of checklist is a robustness test of a sentiment analysis model, uh, which could be assessed by checking if the target labels remain the same. Uh, after you know something like synonym swapping is performed. And analogously in Reckless, uh, one could imagine uh, swapping products uh, with other similar products in a session-based recommender and you know observing you know the, how, how the uh, the prediction changes. And so the analogy between checklists and reckless, reckless uh, kind of break, breaks down at some point given how the nature of language models and recommended systems are different. And therefore the, the kind of tests we expect uh, in a recommended system would differ from a language model. And so we, we introduce um, three behavioral principles as a starting point for coming up with the behavioral tests for breakfast. And the first one uh, is that there exists some sort of like inherent properties to different recommendation use cases. Um, as alluded to earlier, um, you know, similar item uh, recommendations uh, is about substitute uh, substitutable products, and therefore we care about uh, a symmetry property. Um, another example could be card recommendations, where 
um, we care about complementary items. And over here, there is a asymmetric property. Um, for example, you, you wouldn't expect uh, to be recommended a television if you bought like a HDMI cable, uh, but the converse may be true. And Reglist allows for this uh, by allowing access to metadata that you provide, uh, such as like price or product taxonomies, uh, to allow these things, to, uh, these properties to, to be tested. The second uh, behavioral principle is the idea of being less wrong, um, or that not all mistakes are the same. And specifically, metrics like accuracy, hit rate, uh, tend to penalize uh, all mistakes equally. And here we see that both model A and B are wrong, um, but model B is intuitively uh, a better model than A, given that it at least got the genre of the, of the movie correct. And so this uh, principle guides us um, into getting a fuller uh, picture on the model performance um, by looking not only at when the model is correct, but also when the model is mis making mistakes. The third principle is that not all inputs are created equal. And therefore, we should look at different slices or different perspectives uh, of our data. And so, like one example could be the fact that you know the con consumption of uh, items in e-commerce or just online in general form a power law. And therefore, a um, few items account for a huge majority of the interactions. So a recommender system could improve its aggregate metrics by you know, improving performance on these uh, very frequent items. But the result of this is that uh, the long tail performance may suffer. And so, yeah, we believe it's important to look at, you know, different uh, ways of like stratifying your data, such as um, by frequency, product fre interaction frequency, uh, brand or genre, uh, just to name a few. And the idea of this principle um, is not that every subgroup that we, we look at should be treated equally but there is a, some sort of like decision-making and a trade-off um, that should be made uh, as to like, you know, um, which brand is more important. And uh, yeah, the, the, the point of Reckless is that uh, we give it to people uh, so that they have the tools and a common lexicon to frame this discussion uh, depending on, on their business context. So we, we brought all this together into Reckless as a open source Python package. And our hope is that by open sourcing uh, Reckless, uh, that we can encourage recommended system uh, practitioners to think more deeply about the standards for evaluation and to go beyond just like leaderboard chasing. And also to empower them uh, with better tools uh, for analysis, debugging, and decision making. So, looking at the implementation details of Reckless, uh, there are three main abstractions. Uh, the first is a data set uh, abstraction, which we call a frank data set. And basically it wraps around any sort of data set. Uh, it could be a public data set like movie lens or the Coveo data set or your own private data set. The point is just to provide uh, a uniform interface uh, so that Reglis can access the data accordingly. Mm. The second uh, abstraction is a rec model abstraction, uh, which wraps around any sort of recommendation model. And uh, all, all, all it really needs is to have a prediction function uh, being implemented. And this allows Reckless to treat uh, these models as black boxes. And lastly, we have the Reckless class itself, which is a declarative star class, um, much like Metaflow, if you've heard of it. Um, which is, yeah, and so Reckless is basically made up of a bunch of rec tests, which are basically methods uh, in the class that we just decorate to specify like, okay, this is the test that we want to run. And now I'll give a quick overview uh, of how to run a Reckless and to show how easy it is to get started uh, with using it. So first, uh, you will need to load a data set, either one of the pre-included ones in the package or your own wrapped data set. Then you, you, you'd have to pick a model. Uh, in this case, you could also pick like a pre-included model or your own model that you wrap. Um, and optionally, you could train it if the model isn't trained. Then what you do is that you take these two objects and you pass it into a reckless uh, class. Um, and just invoke it to, to run the tests. Um, over here, we're also using a, 
a pre-provided uh, reg list, um, but as we'll see later, it's quite easy to uh, extend uh, your own. And so I think the point here is that, um, you know, you can see how easy it is to change uh, the model while running on the same reg list and data set. Uh, or conversely, you could keep the model the same and test across different data sets. And so this allows us uh, to have a consistent way for running tests and comparing models. Yeah, and over here you see uh, how easy it is to add like a custom test to an, to an existing list. Uh, basically, you just uh, create a new class and you inherit uh, from a list, uh, a rec list um, whose tests you also want to run. And then you just add on uh, additional methods um, for new tests. And for completeness, uh, here is one way in which you can visualize the results. Uh, in, in this case, we're just like printing onto console some like uh, number, like some details about the test and the test results. Uh, but we're looking uh, into like further ways in which uh, we can help people visualize the results. And so what we did uh, is we built reg list and um, we tested it on a card recommendation uh, task just to demonstrate you know, what kind of insights uh, Reglist can help us get. What we did was we ran Reglist on a Project recommender, a Google API recommender, and a popular SaaS model. Um, and so if we look at the table, we can see that just looking at these aggregate metrics uh, that you know, Project and Google are very similar uh, in performance. And so we'll see you know, what Reglist reveals to us. So firstly, one of the first things we did was to uh, stratify by product frequency. And here we can see that you know, Google performs exceptionally well um, for high frequency products, um, but at the same time, uh, not, not so well uh, for the low frequency ones. And here, I think Reglist has allowed us to identify um, you know, differences uh, in long tail behavior, which have been obscured uh, just by looking at like, just head rate and MR. Um, we also sliced uh, the data by brand, and we found that uh, Protrovec is exceptionally performant uh, for ASICs as a brand. And so you can imagine here uh, what a practitioner might do. You might see that, oh, okay, this Protrovec is more performant for um, ASICs, and therefore, um, you know, it, it will add to his decision making, uh, say, if he knows that a specific shop, uh, you know, cares about uh, ASICs products more. And yeah, in this last test, uh, we see the principle of being less wrong demonstrated, um, where here we use the cosine distance of uh, Protovec embedding space as sort of a soft or coarse proxy for product similarity. And the blue distribution shows the distances between the input product and the ground truth. And the orange distribution shows, shows the distances between the input product and the prediction uh, for mispredictions. And although Google and Protovec were very similar in performance, the distribution uh, over their mistakes uh, looks significantly different. And here we see that Google's uh, sort of like prediction distribution over its mistakes more closely matches the label distribution, which tells us that its distributions, uh, sorry, its predictions are more aligned uh, to the compl complementary uh, nature of the card recommendation task. And yeah, this highlights uh, yet another key difference uh, between Google and Protovec, which we couldn't see uh, from the first initial table. And uh, this almost brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, Regless is on GitHub, so do take a look and give us a star uh, if you like it. Um, we've been collecting feedback over the past 12 months uh, over our offer, and we're planning on integrating um, all this feedback into our next iteration of breakfast. So if you're interested, interested in contributing to this open source project, uh, do reach out to us. And uh, thank you for your attention. All right, thanks very much, Patrick. Um, I posted the GitHub link in there for others. Oh, awesome. uh, I, if that's not correct, feel free to correct it. Uh, but yeah, th th that was a great, uh, uh, a very nice presentation. Um, uh, I don't see any live questions. Again, it's a tiny audience, so I'm not expecting. Um, mm -hmm. We did get a few in the last session. 
but again, what I do if there aren't live questions is I, uh, I try to uh, turn some of the re reviewer comments into questions. Uh, so let's start with this. What formula and, and disclaimer, these were, uh, I put these together before I'd seen your whole slideshow. So there could be some uh, uh, duplication. What formulae are used to uh, calculate the being less wrong metrics? Right, right. Yeah, I would say like it's not a specific metric per se, but just like a general principle. Um, and so I think it is the idea is that, you know, like Regulus isn't providing, you know, specific metrics uh, for what it means to be less wrong, but it's really like a, like a very contextual thing based on your, you know, what kind of vertical you're at, like you're, you're in. And so I think like, like one of my last slides was like one example in which you could test for being less wrong. Um, looking at say like the distributions of the mistakes, uh, just to see, just to get a gauge of like what it means to be wrong. But I think the point is that uh, for us, like it opens up the discussion and this is where like, I think people can like be creative with uh, how they want to test their models. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we're pretty on time, so I might uh, post one more in here. Uh, there was a question about, you know, um, putting reckless in the context of the current state of the art. Um, how can you show that reckless will behave better than existing products um, and things described in literature? Right. Uh, do you think the author is like referring to like other testing platforms or? Uh, I think they're referring to, you know, what is kind of, what is the proof of concept uh, that, that shows this is better than the state of the art? Does that make sense? Uh, <clears throat> well, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, yeah, I guess like what I'm wondering is like state of the art in terms of like testing, uh, like recommended citizen testing uh, platforms or. Um, however uh, yeah. you want to respond to that. Yeah, it's, I'm just reading okay, it right. Questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess like I find it a bit <laughs> odd as a question, uh, but in general, I think yeah, that's um, for us, like we're not saying like, you know, Regulus is the best thing out there already uh, for us. It's an open source thing, which we, you know, ex expect to continually develop. And uh, so like over the past couple of, couple of months, uh, we've been like sharing it with like different industry partners and getting their feedback on it. And like, you know, I think for sure we know like, from the feedback that there are a lot of things we can improve on. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a gradual thing uh, over time that, you know, long-term gradual thing that we're looking at, so. Sounds good. Uh, thanks again, Patrick, and uh, good luck on your project. And this topic is about personalized to complementary product recommendation. And uh, this is a uh, joint work of folks from UC San Diego and uh, Amazon. So I'm Charles Chung Dong and uh, the first author I am is uh, my intern uh, from last year, and I'm going to present, uh, you know, represent, represent him to present uh, his work. So basically, there are five parts for uh, this uh, paper and talk. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce uh, the background for complementary recommendation. And uh, second, I will talk about how do we construct the data set. And next, I will introduce the personalized, uh, personalized complementary recommendation uh, framework. And then I will show some uh, ex uh, experiment results and also uh, do some case studies for uh, this uh, recommendation, uh, complementary recommendation. And finally, I will <clears throat> provide uh, the conclusions and also uh, the future work we plan to do. Uh, first, uh, for complementary uh, recommendation, uh, the purpose of it is to recommend uh, compatible products that uh, go well with uh, the uh, query uh, product. Uh, for example, if you uh, see this uh, uh, this uh, picture over here, and for example, in the first line, the customer is searched for a camera, and the complementary products can be things like a bag, a lens, a cord, Etc. Or if the customer is searching for a laptop, then a complementary uh, products can be a bag or, or a supporter, those kind of things. And
And uh, now the question is, why do we need to uh, incorporate a personalized uh, module into this uh, recommendation scheme? And one uh, big motivation for us is to, uh, we find that actually for different users, they have different preferences and, you, and, uh, and purchase history. For example, there I, in the bottom, I show two users. And suppose they, uh, they are both searching for the laptop, right? And also if we uh, see the green guy, like he has already purchased a, a bag before. And the blue guy already, uh, already purchased a cord. <clears throat> before so uh, naturally in the complementary recommendation we should avoid recommending uh, these kind of things right so this is one simple example that uh, the different customers have different uh, you know purchase histories or preferences right and when doing the complementary recommendation we should try to avoid you know uh, recommending duplication uh, duplicated products this is one very simple example for personalization and uh, <clears throat> to incorporate the personalization module into this complementary production model. And I, there are at least three uh, challenges for us. So the first one is data sparsity. And uh, we find that actually um, different items, uh, they typically has a few interactions with each other. And also customers typically don't have uh, too many purchases. In, uh, for example, like if you go to amazon.com, right? And maybe in a half a year, like you go there to purchase maybe 10 times, that's still not too, much, too many, right? And the second one is uh, different user, uh, they have different uh, purchase history and this make it very diverse, right? And to make us very difficult to explicit to mod uh, modeling the user preferences. The last one is, for the data set that we train these kind of models, we find that, um, for example, the items bought in the same session can be very noisy. For example, it can be, those products can be substitutable, right? Instead of just a complementary. And to use this data set, we typically need to do a significant amount of cleaning to uh, denoise this data set. And uh, in this uh, slide, I'm going to talk about uh, briefly talk about how we uh, build uh, this data set. Um, first, the labels we're going to use are derived using uh, the session level data, co purchase data. And uh, two items in the same session are treated as uh, query complementary pairs. And here we, uh, we don't consider uh, the click data add to car data yet. So we only focusing on co-purchase data, co data so far. And one example is, for example, for user one, right? And, and we find that in the same session, he purchased pens, his razor, or scissors. Then each one will be uh, treated as uh, query complementary pairs. And uh, <clears throat> next, uh, we're gonna use the um, user's historical purchase data, like the maybe the, half, uh, the past half year's purchase data and to, um, to uh, as our personalized uh, data for the users. And this can also include product map data and demographic data. So uh, we will use this information to um, incorporate that into our uh, module to capture the you know, individual user's preferences. Next, I'm gonna talk about the modeling framework. And first, uh, before jumping to the personalization part, uh, let me talk about the baselines we use. So this is based on the paper from uh, CIKM paper in 2020. And uh, <clears throat> this paper was published by uh, Amazon. And uh, basically uh, the framework is, it, in, it use uh, MLP plus gen to um, modeling the complementary rec recommendation uh, relationships. And here the users, they use um, a hinge loss to uh, force the distance between the uh, items embedding before the GN and after GN to be uh, less than a margin. 
uh, if they are uh, if they are complementary, and otherwise they try to push the distance uh, away, and to be greater than another margin. So this is the baseline we're going to use and, and compare against in our paper. And next, I'm going to talk about the personalization module where we incorporate the user behavior modeling by uh, transformer. And you can see the top part is roughly the same, like the baseline. And the differences we, uh, if you check, uh, if you see this uh, figure and the differences, we use the transformer and to uh, mod, uh, to mod the user uh, behavior. And specifically, we take the user's purchasing history, P1, P2 to PM, right? In the, uh, let's say in the past half years <clears throat> and uh, use transformer to encode that and uh, generate embedding. And uh, we will use this embedding to uh, construct the personalized loss. So where we multiply the user embedding to the differences of the uh, item embedding. So the first part of this loss is same as the baseline. And the difference is we incorporate the personal loss in the second part, if you uh, see this uh, formula. And here is the, I'm gonna talk about the experiment results. So basically there are four baseline methods. And the first one uh, is the GAT, uh, the <clears throat> GAT uh, method. And uh, it used the direct concatenation of user and uh, the second one is the project projection. So it used the direct concatenation of user and the product embeddings. So basically <clears throat> projection GAT plus average GAT plus transformers, they all uh, consider the user information and the GAT only use the product information. And we can cheat you know, the uh, projection GAT plus average and GAT plus uh, transformers, uh, all as the personalized, uh, you know, complementary uh, recommendation framework. But they are using uh, a different way to uh, combine the user and the product information like ours. So the last line is our method and you can see <clears throat> it out outperforms the other four baselines is, uh, for all these uh, different level uh, metrics so for example in product level we report a three metrics the uh hitting rate in top one top three and top ten and we can see for example for the top one hitting rate ours is uh is much better than the uh non-personalized and also the other personalized uh, based methods and next i'm gonna show two uh, case studies and on the top, I show the purchase a history of one customer. And on the bottom, I show the query of that uh, customer and also the top five recommendations, the complementary recommendations using our method. And you can see in this, um, in this recommendation, we already know that papers has been hidden by the customer before. And this demonstrates that our method can uh, recommend uh, complementary products. And uh, we actually um, put, uh, we rank the paper in the top one position, right? So this is a successful example. And next uh, I'm gonna show a failure example. So you can see uh, the query product is printer. And we know that the co purchase item is a lab desk, but this lab desk is not a, uh, listed in our top five uh, recommendations. But somehow we can see that uh, although uh, it's not uh, all these items we recommended not to uh, uh, purchased with a printer, but somehow they are correlated with printer, right? Strongly correlated, for example, the cartridge envelope, uh, photo, ta photo tap tape, they're all correlated to printer. So this uh, demonstrate that although um, our complementary recommendations might not be co-purchased, but they are still, uh, we can still generate reasonable recommendations using our method. So uh, to conclude, uh, we construct a data set for uh, this uh, personalized, uh, personalized complementary recommendation. And we use uh, the user purchase history and the co-purchase data to um, 
uh, to modeling the uh, the to model the users' uh, preferences. And the uh, second, we propose a framework, and uh, which combines the user and I and the product embedding, and we combine them using uh, re-ranking laws. And in this paper, I only uh, focusing on using co-purchase data to um, model the user behavior. In future, we would also explore more features such as uh, click and add to cart history. Yeah, that's all from uh, this presentation. Any questions? Thank you, Joshua. Um, we do have a live question, a uh, couple actually. That's great. Uh, first from Ely. Um, I would like to ask how to define the scope of complementary. Oh, sorry. So the question is how to define the scope. Yeah, of how to define the scope of complementary. Yeah. So a uh, good question. And now we use, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, so we use the co-purchase information in the same session, purchased in the same session. So each pair is in that um, session will be treated as uh, complementary products. But I know like this uh, way of defining the complementary might not be perfect. So we can also in future we also we can also use other uh, definitions and to uh, you know denoise this uh, so-called complementary uh, setting. Yeah, that's good. Okay, you mean uh, okay. okay. Um, another question in contrastive learning, augmenting sequences also affect the performance. Do you have any mm. problems while doing it or can you give us uh, any tips for it? Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, because this is a short talk, I didn't include the contrastive learning part. So basically in this module, we also have a, a contrast learning, a contrast learning module. So the purpose of this uh, contrastive learning module is to you know, uh, tackle the data sparsity issue because we know that uh, you know we're trying to model uh, model the user behavior and uh, uh, using the sequential uh, purchase uh, data. And actually, find it is the model trend using this data directly is very unrobust. What we did is we just uh, uh, apply the contrast learning uh, idea and we just do some reordering or cropping of this user behavior, uh, user purchase history, and, and incorporate a constructive, constructive loss, right, by creating maybe two views of this uh, purchase history. And we also have that loss. So, and um, yeah, that definitely improved our model performance. Uh, you can see in this table, for our method, I, our final method is GAT plus transformer actually with uh, contrastive learning and it auto performs uh, purely using GAT plus transformer. Definitely it will improve the performance. In this work, we present DecafBert, a distilled cacheable adaptable factorized model for improved ad CTR prediction. This is joint work with my collaborators at Amazon Search Science and AI. So what is click-through rate prediction? When a customer lands on a product page on the Amazon e-commerce website, advertisers compete in an auction to display their product on that page. The product on the page is called the page product and each relevant product displayed by advertisers at the bottom of the page is called an ad product. So in the example on the right, you find that uh, iPhone charger is the current page product and uh, similar products displayed at the bottom of the page are called the advertised products. The click to rate prediction task is to predict the conditional click probability of a given ad page, uh, ad product, given uh, features of both page and ad products. Now this task is challenging because one needs to learn from both language as well as tabular data features. So for example, um, the product title, as well as certain numeric features uh, like sale value. Um, we need to maintain extreme low latency at inference time because this model is served in production. And uh, the model needs to be able to adapt to a constantly changing advertising. Distribution.
single large BIRTAR can significantly boost CTR prediction performance. So uh, if you look at the table at the bottom, you find that as you increase the model size from 65 million parameters all the way to 1.5 billion parameters, the raw KUC um, improves by as much as 2.59%. Now, this large BERTAR model is a cross-attention model, and we train it using the standard methodology of MLM pre-training, followed by fine-tuning for CTR prediction. Uh, and, and the fine-tuning task is essentially a binary classification task. All the features, whether it's text features, numeric features, or categoric features, are converted to strings and concatenated, and the model learns to identify numeric and categoric features from these strings. Now, this mo uh, model cannot be deployed because uh, it's, it's 1.5 billion parameters and doesn't meet the inference latency requirements we have imposed. Uh, it's also very difficult to adapt this model to distribution shift uh, because the model needs to be refreshed at a regular cadence. And retaining a 1.5 billion parameter model over a one month window costs about 100,000 US dollars. So we introduced decaf BERT, which is a factorized cache-friendly distal model uh, and, and can actually can meet some of these challenges. Uh, the, the factorized model consists of BERT, uh, twin structured BERT-like encoders. So each BERT encoder um, encodes a particular type of product. For example, this encoder encodes the page product and this encoder encodes the ad product. And then you have certain, um, the numeric and categoric features are encoded um, with this star, uh, and the outputs from all these stars are fused together with the MLP layer. Um, for We use the CLS token embedding for each BERTAR uh, to represent the product, and these CLS token embeddings can be pre-computed and cached for each product so that at inference time, they can just be retrieved from the cache, and the cost of inference is due to the MLP layers only. Um, so to train this model, um, which is 70 million parameters, uh, we use cross-architecture knowledge distillation, where the gigantic cross-attention teacher model on the previous slide uh, is used to extract soft labels and, and then retain the twin tar model on those soft labels. decaf BERT has an additional advantage, which is that it's easy to adapt to distribution shift. Uh, because the model is only 70 million parameters, the cost of refreshing this model over a one-month window Cost less than a thousand US dollars, um, which is about one hundred the cost of uh, refreshing the teacher model. To further minimize the cost of refresh, we factorize features based on their distribution shift time scales. Uh, so, if you look at the various features uh, that we use in our model, we have text based features such as product title and description that shift over long time scales, uh, which is of the order of a month. And then you have contextual features and other features such as historical and sales features, which exhibit shorter timescales of, of the order of a week or, or, uh, or sometimes even an hour. So, um, so th this gives us an idea that we could uh, factorize these, uh, the model such that uh, each feature is handled by a separate R. And so it enables this form of compartmentalized retraining. Uh, BERT, so the BERT backbone, which processes the text-based features that shift over long time scales, uh, do not have to be refreshed as often, and we refresh them at, the, at every month or so. And uh, the Fusion MLP layer, as well as the numeric uh, and tabular data feature encoder, um, uh, encodes features that shift at shorter time scales and therefore needs to be refreshed more frequently. Uh, and in our example, in our use case, uh, we, re we refresh it um, at uh, at a daily cadence. Uh, and you can verify this by examining the gradient uh, of predictions with respect to the features. And you can find that um, the, the gradients with respect to the text-based features are much smaller than the gradient with respect to the, um, the runtime features or the numeric features. So uh, at a high level, this is the training pipeline. Um, we first train the large cross-attention teacher model on uh, the stale out of distribution data, which we call the past data. So this model is trained once on this data and subsequently frozen. We then uh, train our decaf BERT model, which is the student model uh, that's cache friendly. We train this using cross architecture knowledge distillation from the cross attention teacher model to the factorized twin student model. 
we then adapt the CAF BERT to the incoming uh, distribution. So, um, so you have uh, recent data, which is, um, which is the incoming data as your model is being deployed. And um, in production, we refresh the MLP daily and the bat BERT backbone, which um, monthly, because it processes the text based features that shift over longer time scales. Uh, in the paper, we also address the additional question of how to pre-train, distill, and fine-tune a student model. And we do this using two data sets. So we collect a past data set from 2020 traffic um, and a recent data set from 2021 traffic. Uh, the recent data set is much smaller than the past data set. So um, the way we collect the past data set is um, we uh, sample uniformly so we pick a certain reference point in time, and uh, the train set is sampled uniformly from, um, from points before that reference point in time, and uh, the test set is sampled from points after that reference point in time. And we do the same for the recent data set uh, in 2021. Um, we examine uh, the choice of different initialization, distillation, and fine-tuning strategies in our paper. So among the different initialization strategies, we uh, experiment with random initialization, with mask language modeling, and with pre-training with supervised learning, where the model is uh, initialized randomly and then trained using uh, a supervised cross entropy loss on the uh, past data labels. We, um, among the distillation strategies, we examine, we experiment with no distillation, we experiment with past distillation, where uh, the teacher, the cross attention teacher is used to label the past data and we use the past data uh, to train or, or pre fine tune the student model. Um, we also examine recent distillation where the past data teacher um, or, or the cross attention teacher is used to generate labels on recent data. And we pre fine tune the student model on, um, on the recent data with the past teacher labels. Uh, and we also examine different fine tuning strategies like, um, like vanilla fine tuning or self-training where um, given a certain student model, we use the student model to generate labels for the past data set. Uh, and then um, we use both um, the past, the relabeled past data set and the recent data to retrain the student uh, a second time. Um, so let, let's take a look at our results. Um, and so what you're looking at here is um, the raw KUC for different initialization, distillation and fine tuning strategies. So what we see is that uh, mask language model initialization with past KD distillation and vanilla fine tuning achieves about 76.92% raw KUC, which is much better than all the other strategies. Uh, and if we, um, if we further uh, use self-training uh, for a second round of fine tuning, we get a boost, um, and, um, and, uh, which is a reasonable boost uh, to 77.07% raw KUC. So let's look at some other findings in the paper. Um, we examine the different initialization strategies and uh, we find that MLM pre-training is better than supervised learning, is better than random initialization. Uh, so we find that um, this trend holds across all distillation and fine tuning strategies, uh, which shows that MLM pre-training produces generalizable features of, um, or, or domain invariant features that generalize better um, for CTR prediction. Uh, if we examine which distillation strategy gives us the best results, we find that past KD does better than recent KD. Um, we, uh, we also find that self-training provides an additional boost over our best strategy. So um, self-training after vanilla fine-tuning gives an additional performance boost when, uh, when fine-tuned on downstream recent data. Um, we also find that knowledge distillation improves performance over supervised learning on the past data set. Um, so the best strategy to leverage the past data set for CTR prediction is to first train a large teacher using MLM and vanilla fine tuning, and then distill this knowledge to a small student. Uh, and this performs much better than initializing the student with MLM or, or, like, or using supervised training on the student um, before fine tuning on recent data. We also examined the performance of a model um, using an online experiment. So uh, DCAF BERT was tested within the Amazon e-commerce detail page service. Um, the embeddings of the page product um, 
uh, for the past seven days and the ad product for the past one day were prepared and pre-computed offline and cached. Um, and this was done using the 70 million uh, bird backbone uh, of these cat birds and, and we use an, uh, a distributed database for indexing. Um, these embeddings were recomputed at a regular cadence. So, so we recompute the index about every 3.5 days using the latest bird backbone, um, the latest trained back, bird backbone. The uh, MLP layer, uh, as we spoke about earlier, is retrained daily and the, and the bird backbone is retrained monthly. Uh, we determine the index regeneration period based on a hit rate criteria in the index, and uh, and the model refresh period was determined based on uh, on a CTR lift criteria. So what you're looking at here is um, the hit rate percent and and the uh, CTR lift over a period of about a week. Um, the vertical line denotes uh, a point in time when um, when the BERT model was refreshed and the index was updated. So in general, we find that um, when the BERT model is refreshed, uh, the CTR lift, there, there's a huge CTR lift. So that's the blue line here. Um, we find that um, this CTR lift persists for a long period of time, um, usually for about a month or so without any additional backbone retraining. Um, we also find that uh, when the index is refreshed, the hit rates of both the page product and the ad product improve. Um, and um, in between uh, these index refreshes, um, the page and ad hit rates continue to decrease and then um, and then which every 3.5 days we have to re-update the index um, yeah in, in general we uh, we obtain um, a significant performance boost using decaf but which improves ctr by 3.6 percent on average in offline experiments uh, in, in online ex in the online experiment and um, it, it significantly boosts ctr lift on the tail traffic um, um, yeah, so that's something we observed in practice. We invite you to ask additional questions and reach out to us. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Zhigang uh, Huanghu. Uh, today, I will share my paper that is a, a multitask learning approach for delay feedback model. Uh, except for uh, uh, all courses, and I come from uh, art group. Uh, con con conversion rate prediction is an important task for recommender system, which uh, predicts the probability of whether a user, a user will order a placement after collecting an uh, item such as a, 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 a digital display advertising uh, and e-commerce uh, e e uh, recommender, uh, recommender system. Uh, a good CVR prediction algorithm is uh, important uh, for increasing uh, platform uh, revenue and increasing uh, adver uh, advertiser uh, revenue. Uh, recently, online learning is uh, uh, increasing the uh, uh, user in recommender systems uh, since it can capture the dynamic change of uh, data distribution. Due to the online learning models, update parameters always by the fresh data. They can capture the addition of new items and the changes of user interest. Uh, however, uh, con conversions usually do not happen immediately after user clicks. It is uh, observed ranging from a few minutes to days, uh, which is called the delay feedback problem. The delay feedback problem puts some challenge for uh, online learning for CVR prediction. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there are some wrong labels in fresh data. On the other hand, uh, old data with true labels does not uh, reflect the latest interests of users. Uh, in order to address the delay feedback problem in, in the CVR prediction, uh, the common approach constructs the training pipeline by waiting for the real con conversion in a uh, uh, certain time, uh, time interval tall and uh, the delay the positive samples will be ingested to training pipelines uh, on its uh, conversion time. That means the delayed delay positive samples are first labeled as negative. Uh, due to the use of more negative samples, the, predictor, uh, the predicted CVR is smaller than the actual CVR. The, ex, uh, the exist, uh, existing methods uh, use important sampling uh, methods uh, uh, to devise 
uh, we use Q denote the observed distribution uh, and P uh, uh, denote the actual distribution. Uh, the last function L uh, under uh, uh, the actual distribution P can be approximated by weighting the loss uh, of training samples. Uh, although important uh, sampling based methods uh, achieve the good uh, performance, uh, these methods rely on the uh, 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 unreasonable uh, assumption, assumption uh, which is uh, uh, Px approximated Qx. Uh, uh, intuitively, the deleted uh, samples appears, appears twi uh, twice, but the, uh, the other samples appears once, so that uh, assumption does, does not hold. In order to solve this problem, we firstly, uh, we firstly uh, 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 explore the relationship of actual CVR distribution, uh, P, and uh, the uh, observed CVR distribution. Q under the training pipeline we just uh, mentioned. Uh, then we pr propose a multitask learning model for delay feedback. In gesture of delay positive samples, we know that all the uh, delay uh, feedback po pos uh, positive samples are additional uh, and uh, added uh, to training pipeline and uh, labeled with one. Uh, and the other samples are labeled with uh, zero. Uh, therefore, Q uh, DP is set to zero is equal to, to one, uh, one and uh, P DP uh, is set to one and uh, uh, Q DP uh, is set to one uh, uh, is, um, is equal to one over one and uh, P DP is set to one and uh, Q is set to one is equal to P DP is set to one divided by uh, one and uh, PDP and set one. Uh, since the number of positive samples uh, uh, the training samples uh, and the part of the delay uh, delay the Q, uh, Q Y and set one is equal to P Y and set one divided by one and uh, PDP uh, uh, is set one. Uh, when DP uh, uh, DP is labeled with one, and uh, when we, when the condition one is uh, is one holds, uh, QX is, is equal to PX, and uh, to uh, all of positive samples, uh, the probability of they are uh, deleted samples has the uh, characteristic of Q is equal to T. Then we we then we get a. Uh, 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 QX is equal to uh, one and P DP is set to one over PX and P DP is set to one. So the uh, assumption QX is uh, 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 P PX uh, approximate PX does not always always hold, and uh, the joint observed distribu distribution uh, can be computed as uh, one and uh, one, one and uh, P DP is set to one over uh, P uh, uh, X Y is set to one. Uh, according to the condition probability uh, formula and the replace, we get uh, observed the condition, con conditional probability Q Y is set to one under X is equal to uh, one and uh, P DP is set to one under X over P Y uh, is set to one under X due to PDP is set to one under X do not be estimated directly according to the relationship QDP is set to one under XY with one is equal to PDP uh, is set to one under XY uh, is set to one. Uh, then uh, we have PDP uh, is set to one under X. Uh, uh, is equal to PDP uh, is set one on the X and Y with uh, one, y, y with one uh, multiply to P uh, Y is set one on the X. Uh, finally, we get the observed uh, conver uh, uh, conversion rate Q Y is set one on the X uh, is the product of the actually uh, actual uh, con conversion rate P Y is set one on the X. And the observed uh, non non delayed positive rate P DP uh, is set to zero under X 
According to this, we proposed a multi-task delayed feedback model, MTDFM, uh, which consists of two subnet networks. Left is the uh, 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 actual CVR network, and the right uh, is uh, uh, the NDPR network. The product of their outputs uh, pr predict the observed CVR. Uh, we learn two uh, observ observable oxidy task, uh, which is uh, uh, observed CVR uh, and uh, ob observed CVR rate prediction and uh, uh, observed NDPR uh, uh, prediction. The parameters of actual CVR model will be updated by the, these two tasks. Uh, in addition, we adopt the design of share, uh, share embedding lookup table of two network. Uh, therefore, the loss function of MTDFM is de defined as the sum of the loss of two uh, auxiliary, uh, auxiliary tasks, uh, where theta, uh, theta CVR and theta NDPR uh, are the parameters of CVR and the NDPR network. Uh, and, uh, and L is the uh, cross entropy loss function. Uh, and the term, term in uh, uh, scoring block kits uh, are not taken into account in the grid data calcul uh, calcul uh, calculation of the loss with respect to the input. Uh, Next is the section of experiments. We use one public data set, Creative and uh, uh, industry data set, RLP. Uh, the Creative data set is widely used for the delay feedback problem. It uh, contains more than uh, 50 million samples for uh, uh, 60 days. And uh, we use seven days for our experiments and uh, the uh, RLP data set is uh, collected uh, from the marking activities. Uh, we sub subsample uh, two percent of the users, and the uh, samples data set contains uh, contains uh, about uh, two million samples. Uh, we select four methods as our baselines. Uh, there are three uh, delay feedback. Uh, methods under the online learning setting and uh, the Oracle method. Uh, uh, first baseline is the FNC. It is trained on uh, streaming data without waiting window. Samples are immediately ingested with negative labels and then insert a positive duplication uh, when conversion happens and uh, use the cross entropy loss. Uh, uh, and then insert a uh, positive. Uh, second is uh, FNW. Uh, this method is trained on the same streaming data as FNC and uh, use uh, the important width, uh, important weighted loss. Uh, third is ESDFM. Uh, this method uh, is trained on streaming data with the window window and uh, use the important weighted loss. Finally, is the uh, Oracle method. Uh, this, uh, uh, which using uh, the ground truth label instead of uh, observed label, the Oracle method is used to uh, evaluate the uh, upper bound of delay feedback methods. Uh, table one gives the uh, offline results between MTDFM and baselines of creative creative data set and our methods. MTDFM achieved the state of art results than baseline. Uh, and table two gives the offline results of LAP data set. And our methods, uh, our method MTDFM achieved the state of art results than baseline. Uh, uh, in the online AB test, uh, our method MTDFM improved CVR2. Uh, uh, 4.57 percent. Uh, finally, we sum, uh, summary uh, our work. Firstly, uh, we propose a multitask learning approach for delay feedback model, uh, which does 
uh, not require the observed feature distribution to remain the same as the actual distribution. Uh, moreover, we give the uh, convergence of our method uh, secondly, we give the uh, unified form of, for the relationship of actual uh, and uh, observed CVR di uh, distribution under the uh, uh, elicited time and the real time pipeline. Uh, therefore, our method can be used in both pipelines. Uh, finally, the, we const uh, uh, conduct uh, experiments on public and uh, industry data sets. Our method outperforms uh, out, out uh, the pre previous data, data of the art results. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Hongo. Um, I see there is a live question, uh, which is again much appreciated. Um, why is online experiment not compared with FNW? Why is not compared? Oh, okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, uh, you care about is the setting of uh, AB, uh, AB test experiment. Uh, because uh, uh, FNW and uh, ESDFM uh, have two training pipeline setting. Uh, the cost of uh, uh, constructing two different uh, uh, pipelines is uh, too high. Uh, so uh, in the uh, in in uh, activity, uh, we compile with the uh, SOTA model. This is a presentation of our short paper, um, introducing our work to use a, a cluster-based nearest labor matching algorithm to solve the a, a imbalance issue uh, happening in the online experimentation. So, um, I'm using a snapshot or screenshot of our internal um, experimentation platform dashboard to show the motivation we're doing this, uh, we're, we're developing this uh, algorithm. So from this screenshot, you can see there's a many, the, the dashboard has two columns. So it shows our you know, typical um, um, comparison of a test versus control bucket in the AB test. So you can see the first column shows a list of uh, metrics uh, to monitor. So for example, the first, the first one is the number of users, a number of uh, rolling big cookies. And then we have like some metrics in the visit frequency that includes like a seven days visited, the number of sessions. And then we have other engagement metrics, or revenue metrics, et cetera. Actually the number of metrics we monitor in our dashboard is longer than this. We just, uh, you know, truncated as a, a, a small list. And then the second column shows the, the percentage difference of the metrics between the test and control buckets. So uh, the, and then you can see that, for example, the number of uh, users difference is 0.2%. And uh, this, um, this bucket we're using is actually the AA buckets. What it that means is that the, both test and control buckets are running the same version of our website. So in theory, the metrics should be even. They shouldn't show significant difference. But you can see uh, uh, there are three uh, metrics just uh, noted with a uh, green color. So this three metrics, even in the A buckets, they are still showing significant difference. So which shouldn't happen. So this is a, a imbalance. Um, so um, actually, you know, um, based on our experience, it's pretty common to show up, especially you have multiple metrics to, to, to measure. So this is a typical um, multiple comparison problem in A-B testing, when you monitor more metrics, the uh, possibility to find uh, at least one significant um, you know, um, imbalance is much higher than the um, alpha value you control. Um, so for example, if you look at the um, plot on the right, so the more metrics you you, you monitor, the, more, so the larger the family-wise uh, error rate is, is higher. And that's uh, the plot is, is plotted in the way so we control the alpha value is 0.1. And also, so that's why, you know, a lot of data scientists, they know when they monitor 
or say run an A-B test that only limits the key metrics is only one or two to monitor. That's to avoid this multiple comparison issue. Apart from that, I think also the multiple comparison issue in the A-B testing is also lies on the, on the uh, say platform level. For example, at Yahoo, uh, we run like say hundreds or even thousands of experiments uh, in parallel every day. So um, when you have so many uh, uh, experiments running, then the possibility, um, even though you just use one metric, key metric per, per experiment, the possibility you have like a song experiment uh, that's started with an AE balance, it's almost doomed. So um, that's not a good, 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 good sign. And it's something we want to solve because uh, when you have this imbalance issue, that will uh, lead to incorrect conclusion, right? Because when you find, oh, your, your result is significant, you think this, uh, th this result is it's caused by your test condition, but actually it's not. It's just because of the, you know, the experiment start as, as an imbalanced pair. So um, that makes us, oh, we need to find a solution for this A imbalance issue. So like in the probably several years ago, we started with uh, um, the solution we did. It's just carry out a, a, a period uh, checking. We just validate the back balance before we go to AB. And you know this is recommended by Ron Kohabi, and who is a pioneer in this area. Um, but this, uh, this solution definitely has some um, problem. The most important problem is probably just uh, efficiency. It takes time. Basically, you need to wait like three or even more days to find out what is the A result. And if you're not, not lucky, the, the bucket pair is not balanced, then you need to start again. So it was a lot of time and definitely it's not favorable to, especially if you want to develop your um, product quickly. So that's why we want to find other solutions that we try to improve the bucket balance uh, in the experiment design phase. So there are some already existing uh, research uh, results. So people are doing uh, re-randomization, re but this is how it has a lot of uncertainty. And also that's like a blocking methods. We also pass on this methodology because uh, when you use blocking method, the result really depends on, the performance depends on what kind of blocking uh, covariance you, you, you choose. And uh, the different, you know, we want to select the um, covariance that uh, explain a lot of variance, but the, um, it, you know, the, the performance is really varies with the uh, selection. So that's, because of that, it's very hard to scale. Um, so, uh, and also based on my personal experience, uh, in a lot of uh, scenarios, the blocking method doesn't work very well. And uh, the last one is the optimal match methods uh, proposed by uh, Nathan Colors. And that one, I think it's we did the uh, offline simulation. It has a pretty good performance. Um, the idea for this one, it's more like a half the idea of like a paired design um, included. So in a simple way, what it does is just like for each user uh, you select, then you can find a, um, like a neighbor or closest one and match to it. Then you have a pair of users that are similar to each other. And then you just uh, run your assign them into the test and control buckets. And uh, the performance, even though the performance is good, but the computation is very, compl uh, it's very complicated. Uh, especially when you have like large, large user size, that's pretty common in the IT area. Right? So, um, especially for this methodology, they are doing the considering the global uh, matching, so, um, uh, optimization. So that makes the com you know computation even harder. And I think his com um, his com uh, contribution in this area is he proposed an algorithm to make this uh, matching method uh, feasible. But it still, it takes a you know a long time to do the calculation to even finish one round of the similar the the, the, the matching algorithm. So um, I think his paper published um, shows, for example, if you have like a median size of the users, only one round of the algorithm could take like a half an hour even more. 
So that's too much for if you are, we are applying into our expand platform where we have so many expands open every day. So uh, in order to uh, solve this problem, so we uh, proposed our cluster-based nearest neighbor matching algorithm. So this algorithm still follows the idea of the optimal matching method. Um, so because the performance is good, but we're trying to reduce the computation uh, complexity. What we do actually, the idea is pretty simple because the complexity comes from the large sample size or the user size in the in, uh, on experiment. In order to uh, reduce that, what we do uh, in the first step is to group users into the clusters randomly. So uh, what we have is just when users come in, we just assign user a, a random hash value ranging from zero to nine nine. So with this, uh, with this way, the users can be randomly grouped into 1,000 clusters. No, ma no matter how many you know, users we actually have, it's millions or even billions. So eventually we just have 1,000 clusters. And with this class, number of clusters, it will be much easier to do the matching. So after the first step, then we, we based on the um, metrics of, of interest, then we can calculate the distance metrics of this 1,000 classes. So that's much, much easier if you handle. And uh, based on this distance metrics and the between the two um, clusters, we can construct the bucket um, using the paired design uh, idea. So what we do is, for example, if we want to create, like say, three buckets, then what we do is just um, doing it in an iterative way First, we randomly select a cluster, say cluster I, uh, from the available hash values. And then based on the distance matrix we calculated earlier, we located two other clusters, say J and K. They have the lowest distance from the cluster I. So there's three clusters we, we pick, I have the you know, closest distance. And then we are randomly assigned those three clusters into the three buckets. And then we repeat these steps until we have enough size for each bucket. So um, in that way, uh, we run the simulation and to show to see uh, how it performs to reduce the uh, um, false positive rate or say the A imbalance rate. So uh, we use uh, we use three um, uh, algorithms here. And the, you can see here in the black line, it's a, it's a, it's a baseline of use. If you just use a random assignment of users into the, into the bucket, so what is the performance of the imbalance rate? And also false positive rate. And uh, um, then the, um, the blue line is uh, the algorithm we proposed. And then in the middle, that's a, uh, um, that's a um, um, purple line. This is one actually it's a uh, current practice we're using in our, oh, sorry, the previous um, 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 practice we use in Yahoo, try to bring down the um, imbalance rate. So we call it a ready to use AA, uh, but it's, a, it's an old version of our effort. So you can see uh, with the, um, the same, same so the cluster based um, matching algorithm, it brings down the false positive heavily. So you can see if you do the random uh, assignment, so naturally you will have the imbalance rate is pretty high, 30%. That's uh, when we consider some experiment with like I say, we check like five metrics. But if you use uh, with the proposed um, algorithm, the, this um, imbalance rate is almost dropped to 0%. And this, um, and this imbalance rate keeps low um, when we monitor multiple metrics. For example, in this case, we show this imbalance rate versus number of metrics we monitor. So um, if it's a random assignment, you can see the, the, the imbalance rate is pretty, pretty okay when we only like a look at one or two metrics. But when we do the multiple comparison, multiple metrics, the uh, imbalance rate goes up very fast. That's shown in the black line. But if you look at the uh, blue line uh, at the bottom, even we look at monitor multiple metrics, the error rate is still very low. So there's a um, huge advantage uh, using this methodology. And uh, 
So then after we uh, see this, um, the performance in the simulation, we did the implementation in our platform. So this plot shows uh, the data pipeline we use and how this is implemented. So the, the, the algorithms have like a three steps and they are happening in a different stage. So um, the two major actions for the experiment uh, creation. So one is a create layer and the second is a experiment creation. So layer is a concept of um, in the in the expand platform that's used to expand the uh, testing capability. So one layer is basically is one shuffle of the users. So when you shuffle the users, uh, users can, um, more experiment can be um, opened there. So when you create the layer, then we uh, perform the first and step one, two. So we, when the layer is created, we just as run and assign the hash value to users, and also we calculate the distance matrix of the uh, of the hash of the of the clusters. So and uh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, Jan. So you've got uh, two minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, so, and this distance matrix can be um, uh, updated daily uh, using the past one week of the um, data to make it you know keep it fresh. And then when you open the experiment or say buckets in the in the layer, then uh, we use run the step three to allocate the casting to the buckets. So um, yeah, at the end is just uh, after we implement this in our platform, we uh, check the performance of the algorithm to see what is the uh, imbalance rate or say false positive rate. So you can see the, um, the um, uh, new algorithm CNM has much lower um, um, false positive rate than the other two baselines. But you can see, uh, but in practice, actually the uh, false positive is higher than the uh, simulation. And we found out two reasons. One is the seasonal effect is because uh, in the in practice, we are matching in the AA data and then measure the performance after one or two weeks in the AP period. So because of the certain effect, so the, the difference drifted up. And second is we also found that some kind of data logging issues uh, leading to a larger uh, false positive rate. Because for example, uh, our uh, um, our platform you know, in practice, they have like a, a losing rate, uh, you know, bucket selling losing rate, etc. So that could, that could, could lead to that. Um, I think that's it. That's all the result I want to present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, so, does anybody in the audience wish to post a question? If not, I'd actually like to relay a question from one of the reviewers of this paper. So I'm just going to pop it in chat first and then I shall read it out. So Jan, I wonder if you can motivate your design choice of a thousand clusters. So was there any sort of trade-off that you can think of between lower and higher numbers in this regard? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, so we are, I think it's a 1000 uh, clusters it's um, picked in conventionally, that's not much um, theory uh, to back up. But so going up, definitely if you go, go up, um, I think the probably the randomization probably better, but the computation will be harder. So it takes longer. So because our computation is um, done in the fly, so we want to narrow down to not too much, too, too large. So that's one. And if it's too small, I think, um, maybe it's not accommodate uh, the bucket size you want to do. For example, if you want to, if you say, if you downsize to the 100, so the smallest number of uh, bucket sizes is like a 1%, right? You cannot go lower. So, because if you want to, like I say, open a bucket, I say 0.5%, then 100 clusters, you cannot do that. Because you, if you choose one cluster, the, the smallest is 1%. So this is one of the consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. That was a great presentation. Hey everyone, I'm Kevin, and I'll be going over our paper, Privacy Preserving Methods for Repeated Measures Designs. This is joint work with Wenjing and Sathya from Netflix. So brief outline of this presentation today. I'll start off by going over experimentation challenges we face due to privacy policies. Then I'll discuss the method we developed in this paper. 
Following that, I'll go over implementation and empirical results of this method, and finally I'll conclude with a brief summary. So challenges in experimentation. More recently, there has been increased scrutiny in the way we can collect and store individual level data. At Netflix, this is especially prevalent before and after they become Netflix members. Uh, other examples across the industry are Apple. So a couple years ago, Apple started having tighter restrictions on how we can collect background level data on the iPhone app. Uh, more specifically, this means that we can't tie uh, user level observations to their individual level ID after 24 hours and still store this data. So this leads to a couple challenges in experimentation. So how can we still test user level experiences without storing user level data? Two questions here are how do we assign and deliver the intervention properly and how can we calculate key experimental statistics, which I will give an example in the next slide. So here's an example of a typical experiment. So let's say this experiment runs for a couple weeks and we make several observations for each user. So for example, user one, we have observations M11, 12, and three. And at the end of the experiment, we can calculate the outcome metric as the sum of the user's observations uh, throughout the experiment. So fairly uh, straightforward. Then we can calculate the ATE and the variance of the ATE from this. Now here's the situation we're in if we can't actually link an individual level uh, user ID with their observation at the end of the experiment. So for instance, in the case I mentioned before, we have to erase this record, erase this linkage after 24 hours. Well, here's the case. We can store each observation, but we don't actually know the identity of the user behind each observation. So now our observations are all distinct, and we aren't able to calculate this outcome metric that we had before for each user. So in this situation, actually, uh, we can still calculate the ATE because we can just take the sum of the outcome metrics and divide by the number of unique users. However, the issue here is that we can't calculate an, uh, one key statistic, which is the variance of the ATE, because we can't collect the or calculate the correct user level sums. So in this paper, uh, our main goal is to see how we can correct this problem, um, and we develop a message a methodology based on an idea that we call the hashed bootstrap. So ma the main idea is as follows. Before the experiment begins, we uh, first initialize a set number of clusters of the experimental population. And for each user ID and cluster ID pair, we have a hash function that maps this pair to a binary weight. Oh, well, it's binary for now, but later we're going to discuss extensions of this weight. Randomization happens at the unit level and we do all the analysis at the cluster level so that we never have to uh, focus on individual level outcomes. So what is stored? At the end of the experiment, we're going to store a cluster level sum, which is essentially a weighted, uh, a weighted sum of the product of a user's metric and the hash result over here. So let me give you actually an interactive um, example. Next slide, which will make this more clear. So at the start of the experiment, let's say we have a user that comes in with some observation. We initialize uh, n clusters before the experiment and have each of these clusters has a uh, sum of zero for now and a size of zero. So user ID one comes in and for each cluster, we come up with a hash function that essentially says, well, if it's a binary weight, does this user belong in this cluster or not? So for this case, we see that user ID one belongs in clusters one and two. So now because this user belongs in one and two, essentially we update each cluster level sum uh, by adding this metric M11 into this cluster sum. So we see that at the end of the experiment, or after this user logs this metric, we update each sum and the size of the cluster. So next, the user, let's say the next day, the user makes a new observation. We forget the old observation was tied to this user already. Now we have the same clusters. We, have, we know that the user belongs in clusters one and two, and we update the cluster sums again. Uh, yeah. So now suppose another user is in, the, in this experiment, metric M21, we have an observation for this user. And here we see that this user, uh, for uh, after the hash function, uh, we find that this user belongs in cluster three. So now we update cluster three with the sum of this user's metric and um, the size of the cluster. 
same thing one more example so let's say user 3 comes in with a metric belongs in cluster 1 and I guess cluster n and we update the metrics accordingly so you can see at the end of the experiment we're going to have n clusters for the test and control group and for each cluster we have the sum of the uh, some of the observations for each cluster as well as the size the number of unique users in each cluster then for each of these clusters we can calculate the um, mean of the metric and then fairly straightforward we can use bootstrapping or the delta method to calculate the ATE and the variance of the ATE so wrapping it up or summing it up so essentially what we're doing here is we simulate bootstrapping in order to calculate the variance of the ATE Prior to the experiment, create n subsets. For each subset user pair, we have this hash function that assigns a weight, which here we use a Bernoulli, and I guess like if it's a 50% chance that you belong in each subset, it's a Bernoulli 0 0.5. Uh, when each user logs a metric, we update the subset sum, then we erase this linkage between the user ID and the observation. And finally, at the end of the experiment, for each cluster, we'll calculate the subset sum and number of distinct users. So essentially here, what we're doing is we simulate bootstrapping by creating multiple draws of the sample with replacement. So can we do better? Now, notice here that I'm assigning uh, essentially a Bernoulli weight, and uh, on average, if p equals 0 0.5, we're saying that uh, each user belongs in each cluster with a 50% chance. So this in literature is called a double or nothing bootstrap. Now, there's actually a couple problems here. The first is we aren't actually sampling with replacement, which is bootstrapping. Each sample is actually just consists of half the users or half the subset of users in this experiment. So a couple issues here is if for experiments with smaller sample size, our variance estimation is actually worse. So actually, uh, another issue with this is that notice that each, so if we go back to the previous slide, each user belongs in each sample or each sample uh, stores the hash function, hash result for each of the users in the experiment. So the total storage is actually very large if we are using this approach. Essentially, if we have n users and m uh, subsets, it's n times n, uh, on order of n m. So one idea here is we could actually let the weight be a binomial 1, 1 over m, where m is the number of users in the test. And this essentially solves this issue here where I'm not sampling with replacement. However, one problem here too is that for experiments where we have streaming data, we don't actually know the number of users in advance, right? So in this case, we don't actually know what M is over here. So how do we solve this? So one option actually is we use Poisson 1 weights. Since the limit of this here, but this binomial here converts to Poisson 1, uh, then we can use what essentially is called the Poisson bootstrap, which has also been studied in literature before. So the only update we make here is that for each weight, instead of using a Bernoulli value, we use a Poisson 1. And each subset sum will be, uh, every time a user gets logged into the experiment, we update the subset sum by the product of the weight, which is a Poisson 1 for this user, and the metric observation. So once again, we simulate a bootstrap more um, closely here. So overall, results and some comments on Netflix data. Um, so here, what we oh, so first, figure three on the left is showing how the original um, figure changes now. That instead of having uh, having uh, being unable to tie each user to their observation, we now have a weight that's tied to each each observation. So we can calculate a weighted outcome metric and add it to each cluster level sum. So here we notice that the sufficient stats for analyzing experiments is we don't actually need to store user level data. We just need to store the sums of various, I guess, like various subsamples of the data. And this is sufficient for us to calculate the ATE and the variance of the ATE. Now, there's also a couple of early experiment challenges. So specifically, uh, at the start of an experiment, oftentimes we might not have a lot of observations. So the number of metrics in each cluster might be low and privacy might be compromised. So one, one potential um, idea that we thought of here was to add some noise at the start of the experiments to essentially obscure the cluster level sums. And also it's possible to do other approaches on top of this, such as using regression adjustment, AKA Cupid, um, if we wanted to do, you know, for example, variance reduction on top of this approach. Um, oh, also one thing I wanted to add was that 
one extension, which is available in our full paper, but not the uh, four page uh, industry paper in this conference, is that we could also, there's, there's another situation where the estimator can be updated where each user can belong in only one sample. So for example, the update here would be that instead of using a Poisson 1 uh, weight, we essentially have a weight that assigns each user to be only one sample. So for example, like if we had uh, a million users and we had a thousand samples, uh, we would say that on average about there's about a thousand users in each of the 1,000 samples. So essentially we're partitioning the users into different samples and calculating clusters of users. Now what this solves is actually it helps um, make things like regression adjustment that I mentioned here easier to do. And um, the difference with the original approach is that this typically results in, or we need a larger sample size for this to work. So this, what I just said was what we call an estimator two here, and comparing results across estimators. So the first one was the essentially Bernoulli, or double or nothing. Second estimator was the Poisson estimator, and the third was the one I just mentioned, where we essentially partitioned the user space. And we see that the, var the error in calculating the theoretical variance is fairly low uh, across all cases, and we have good coverage um, for each estimator. So next, the implementation and some more results. So first, I wanted to mention that we oftentimes, we might have a situation where we, ha where we have highly heteroscedastic clusters. So meaning that like the variances might differ quite a bit across cases. And the reason why we have this is in some cases, specifically at Netflix, we actually have legal reasons why we have to uh, make clusters in a certain way. For instance, some clusters can only have users from some you know strata or like some country, some population base, right? In this case, we might have highly heteroscedastic clusters. So the uh, update here is that we can actually store the variance in addition to the mean of each cluster. And the only thing we have to tweak here is that instead of storing just the first moment or the mean uh, of the population, we can store both the first and second moment of the population to calculate the variance and use an approach like inverse variance weighting to decrease the variance in these situations, right? So at Netflix, we tested this and saw a 7%, close to a 7% decrease in variance. So this is, uh, yeah, I kind of men just mentioned this, but this is the way we do it. So each experiment, when a user logs their metric, we store two values. One is, well, uh, just adding to the subset level sum, and the other is increasing the sum by the square of the metric result. And at the end of this experiment, we can calculate for each cluster k the mean and the variance of the cluster, and use approach like uh, inverse variance weighting to help decrease the overall variance. So second heterogeneous cluster sizes reduces power. So oftentimes in an experiment, we might have clusters, like I just mentioned, with different sizes. For instance, like I mentioned for Netflix, we might have to cluster by countries, different markets, or sometimes if we're working with a third party, like let's say like Roku or Amazon, we might have the third party design the clusters, which essentially leads to heterogeneous cluster sizes and actually the aforementioned um, uh, differences in variances. So oftentimes in cases like this, we find that this can affect the power. And here we just show a simulation showing how oftentimes if we have multiple clusters with different sample sizes, um, the, larger the, difference, the, uh, the larger the difference between the cluster sample sizes the uh, greater the difference in the uh, power of the experiment. And finally, uh, heterogeneity in a covariate's impact reduces power. So oftentimes, like I mentioned, if we have to cluster by country level, or for instance, um, uh, different markets, we might have a situation where different markets in this, e in this experiment affect our final outcome differently, right? So. In this case, the performance of the estimator in this case depends on the variability in the coefficient of the covariates. If there's a different, if there's a large difference in the coefficients uh, effect on the outcome, then we find that the power is lower. So in general, um, the main idea here is that if there's a large heterogeneity in the um, uh, the clusters that we're creating, this often leads to um, a re reduction in power of the experiment. So brief summary here is that. Um, Increased privacy restrictions uh, leads to essentially challenges in running experiments and calculating key experimental metrics. So here we uh, introduce two approaches here. So one 
Uh, one is the first estimator that I mentioned before, uh, using the Poisson bootstrap, and the second is just partitioning the sample space. And these two have various trade-offs. For instance, um, how many, or one is the storage size of the experiment, and the other is if we want to do other flexible methods, the regression adjustment on top of it. And finally, I just ended with a discussion how experimental power can decrease based on different experimental designs. So that's it. Thank you. My name is Luis Garcia Puello, and I'm going to present this uh, short paper, which is titled Informative Integrity Friction in Social Networks, um, which is a paper developed with some of my colleagues at Meta Facebook, Samantha Guthrie, Bernardo Santana Swartz, and Bao Shuanshu. Yeah, so social networks, as many of you know, are very successful and they have facilitated the distribution and consumption of many types of content. In the slide, you can see the distribution pattern for a very famous music video some years ago, the Gangman, Gangman Style. Distribution of content in social networks works as follows. First, users create a network of friends and followers. Uh, content is created and consumed and consumed by these users and then is reshared, retweeted or redistributed to other users in their network. Depending on the platform, there's different means to do this, as you can see on the slide. And the distribution reshare might make content viral and increase its distribution very rapidly. All types of content might be distributed through the reshare mechanism, and uh, this unfortunately includes harmful and low quality content such as clickbait, misinformation, graphic violence, hate speech, nudity and porn, and uh, any uh, like all other harmful content that you can think of. As a result, there's a need to implement sol solutions to measure, detect and reduce the distribution of such harmful content to preserve the integrity of the uh, social network platforms. Different platforms, social network platforms, may apply different treatments to different types of harms. For example, in, the, in Facebook, we can consult the openly available community standards website, which specifies content that violates these community standards in the platform and therefore is to be removed from the platform. Content that produces bad experiences uh, is also specified in these community standards uh, pages. And given their low quality and their you know, potential to create bad experiences to users might be demoted in the ranking to reduce its distribution. In addition to all, all these contents that appear on the community standards that might be removed or, or demoted, there exists sensitive content that does not fit the categories above and that might represent a risk if ultimately there's confirmation that it can be harmful. Examples cited, uh, in the slide uh, are, for example, COVID-related content or, for example, out-of-date articles. At Facebook, through both internal and external research, we know that users want social media companies to do more about integrity harms. Users also want to feel more empowered and more in control of their social media experience. And users also want to, the opportunity to assess information for themselves but they also want to have the relevant information to do so. At the same time, users face challenges assessing information and identifying low quality content. And users do not want to share certain integrity harms like misinformation and misleading content. All this research, which you can find like more details and references in the paper, led to propose a simple front-end intervention to empower users and gave them insight into how and what they might consider harmful or a bad experience in the form of an interstitial. As a result of the motivations and research from the previous slides, we propose to introduce this research friction interstitial, uh, which is a mechanism that we have uh, in the Facebook newsfeed. And you can see on the screen, the proposed interstitial, which as I said, we name research friction, is a modification of the regular research Facebook flow. So in Facebook, if you want to reshare content, you typically uh, do what you see on the screen on the left hand on the left hand side. You would click the given a post, which is what you you see on the left hand side. You would click the share button, and then the image on the rightmost side would appear, which is what we call the composer, where uh, the user might like write some text uh, in in addition to the post that is being reshared, and uh, would select the audience where this content would be reshared. 
The proposed friction mechanism that we are introducing is the image in the middle, which modifies the Richard flow by adding the, this interstitial just after pressing the share button. The interstitial consists, consists of a message that can uh, change depending on the target post and the derived uh, risk of the post. For example, in this case, you, you can see in the example that this is an out-of-date article, an article that has been published like a long time ago. And then two buttons, a continue button. So if you press the continue button, then you continue to the next, uh, to the rightmost uh, uh, you know, image where you can continue sharing the content or uh, a go back button, which would cancel the research friction. Also, if the user clicked on any other part of the, of the screen at this point, the, uh, the, the research you know, flow will, will be canceled as well. As mentioned earlier, the message and content shown in the interstitial would depend on the target post being shared. And the table in the slide shows some example content for which the friction mechanism could be triggered. For example, we have COVID content, we have vaccine-related content, outdated news, confirmed information, and there are some others, right? On the right-hand side, you can see an example friction applied to the COVID-related content. In this case, the, inter the interstitial would include additional information and links to facilitate the user acquired context and information about the content being shared. Depending on the type of content, we could like potentially show links to different authoritative content and additional information as uh, indicated by the, by the research that I expressed some slides ago. To evaluate the effectiveness of the racial friction mechanism, we conducted some experiments in the Facebook newsfeed. As mentioned in the previous slides, the hypothesis of the experiment is that Given additional context, users would reconsider sharing links that might be false or misleading. And by doing so, the overall volume of misinformation would be reduced in the newsfeed. To do so, we observe the number of views and on confirmed misinformation and the interstitial cancel rate, which counts the time the share uh, procedure was, was finalized due to the interstitial. So a cancel rate happens when somebody tries to start like the sharing flow, but then ends up canceling the, the share uh, flow. Um, the setting of the experiment, running a viewer level A-B test, where the target post uh, were those mentioning COVID related content and the COVID uh, related content was determined by a regular expression with very high accuracy, which is also referred to in the paper for those interested. The results of the experiments, you can see them like here on the slide. Uh, well, more details on the experiment. Uh, users in the treatment group, of course, saw the interstitial shown in the slide, in the previous slide, and, and, and those in control didn't see anything, you know, so they had like the regular uh, uh, sharing flow. So the results of the experiment show a significant reduction of confirmed information seen on the treatment group, as you see on the slide. And besides uh, seeing the reduction of misinformation, we were also interested in exploring the, what we call user habituation to the interstitial, which uh, shows the progress, uh, the response of users after multiple exposures to the feature, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, which shows the cancel rate after different exposures, and that flattens and stabilizes approximately after the fifth view. User habituation is important to understand the effectiveness of the treatment and uh, guaranteeing that uh, it's going to continue having effectiveness in the long term. Not included in, in this slide, but in the paper, the experiment shows also an overall cancel rate of around 45% and an explicit cancel rate of 4.4%. Uh, the cancel rate is divided between implicit and explicit. Implicit would be uh, clicking outside <clears throat> of any button, so clicking any other part of the screen versus the explicit cancel rate is, is explicitly going and canceling with the button, with the cancel button. As conclusions and next steps, we presented an informative integrity friction that was deployed in the Facebook news suite and that is triggered when users share content types that are related to integrity harms or that are a risk to the users, potentially. The presented mechanism I aims to better inform users about the content that is shared in social networks, as well as to prevent the viral spread of integrity harms in such networks. And experimental results validate that the proposed approach <clears throat> in, indeed contributes to reduce the overall prevalence of harmful content in social, in social networks. 
Experiment results also show that the feature continues being useful after habituation, which further motivates its long-term usage. And as next steps, given the effectiveness of these controls and empowering the users with more information, we plan on exploring other mechanisms to provide with more controls and contextual information to users about integrity harms. Thank you for your attention, and I'm now happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Luis. Are there any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, I again would like to relay a question from one of the reviewers of the paper. So I've just popped that into chat. So it's, uh, Luis, can you give any details about any trade-offs of other business metrics that were affected by the friction, such as churn rate? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I think uh, I cannot give you the, de the details that are not in the paper, uh, but uh, you know, any any friction that mechanism that you add in uh, in in not only related to integrity harms, but any additional uh, you know uh, friction that you add on on any uh, front end intervention in in feed, basically stops the flow and uh, you know reduces volume. Right in this case, for example, you can see on the on the slide that the amount of total amount of reshares on link reshares uh, is got got reduced. But here, I think what we are like valuing is more of like the trade-off between reducing harms and these business metrics, right? Now, how significant the drops are, I think that's something that I cannot comment on, right? But basically, you know, yeah, uh, any any time that you add any friction, there's a, there's a reduction of what you were trying to do initially, right? It's like, for example, if we do a, a, a friction on likes, when you click a like, you show a message or something like that, there's going to be less likes, right? Now, how many less likes, that depends on the friction, right? Yeah, thanks a lot to the organizers and um, thank you very much for giving me the occasion to present my work here today. So this is a joint work with uh, Vito, Giuseppe, Yannick, uh, Matteo and Fabian, um, who are colleagues of mine at Amazon Music Machine Learning. So we are a team based in, in Berlin. Um, and uh, the work that I'm talking about uh, today is uh, how to uh, fairly um, attribute um, effects in parallel online experiments. So a quick glimpse at the agendas. Um, I'm going to uh, define what I what I call parallel online experiments, uh, in particular with respect to the Amazon Music use case. Then I'm going to introduce our toolbox for handling um, the rising problems. So this uh, will use uh, randomization of, uh, of treatment allocations, uh, constructing randomized control trials. And uh, then we are also um, exploiting causal inference techniques to um, measure the, the rising effects. Um, then I'm going to, to speak about how we are um, attributing the effects using uh, cost sharing games. So these, uh, these are concepts from um, game theory. And then I'm going to discuss uh, the experiments that we, uh, that we have conducted. Uh, okay, so um, a quick uh, look at the Amazon Music's landing page. So here you see um, different categories that um, are broadly associated to different genres. And then inside these genres, um, you have different uh, content types like uh, like playlists uh, or, um, or albums or, or songs and so on. Um, and um, so there's a lot of experimentation going on on this website. So um, either because we introduce uh, new, um, um, uh, new, new content types or because we introduce new features and so on. Um, and so what we want to do is um, make sure that the overall customer experience is... Um, uh, is um, is of high standard when, when running these experiments. Um, so as I said, experiments are happening all the time. So this is uh, something that's quite common um, across um, online platforms. So um, we, trend, we tend to run um, A-B tests uh, in parallel. Um, and uh, this is because we want to test new visual features um, or new algorithms and, uh, and so on. Um, and as I just said, we want to make sure that the overall user experience um, does not suffer from running too, too much experiments at the same time. So this means we have to um, measure engagement metrics um, that characterize the quality of the experience. Um, and then we have to make sure that we attribute um, the impact of running experiments to this overall uh, engagement metrics that, um, that, that we use to, um, to protect the, the, the overall customer experience. Um, so how, how does this look like in, in, in more detail? So, um, say here we have um, 
uh, our um, our control metric or, or um, our um, say gold standard Y zero. So this is the metric that we are measuring here without any running experiments. Um, and then we can have um, uh, the metric that we observed. So this is called Y bar here. So you can think of Y bar as um, the average of um, all experiments that are running at the same time. So this is what, what's observed when we look at, um, at dashboards um, that, that we use to monitor how our system is doing. Um, and so, so then the, the natural difference here is, the, um, is this metric impact delta that comes from the experiments that are, that, are running, uh, that are running concurrently. So here we have experiment one, experiment two, and experiment three that are, that are active jointly. And um, so this is why we see this difference here to, to Y bar. So here, for the sake of illustration, um, this is a negative impact. It could, of course, go in the other direction, right? So if you have um, experiments that are improving your target metric a lot, then um, we would see a positive impact here. Um, Okay, and so to, to make this a bit more specific, um, let's think about the framework of, of um, marginal impact and uh, of factorial designs. So um, here for the sake of illustration, I'm using um, two experiments that are, um, that are active or not active. So uh, here we have experiment one and two. Um, we have a, an overall control group where no experiment is running. Then we have our second group where just experiment one is running. The third group where experiment two is active. And then the, the last group where both experiment one and two are running. And you can think about this here as um, user cohorts that were randomly sampled um, where the, the experiments are either active or not. Um, so what you can do here if you want to measure um, all the different combinations is construct the factorial design where you look at all these different, um, uh, these different um, exp experiment combinations. Um, but what um, is often looked at is the marginal effect. So the marginal effect of um, running experiment one versus not running experiment one, or um, the control of experiment run one versus the treatment of experiment one, and, and same for experiment two. The problem with this marginal perspective is that the control of experiment one control um, contains um, uh, an active set of ex of experiment two. So um, this means here you will have some kind of leakage and interaction of experiment two with the control of experiment one. And, and the same for the actual treatment of experiment one, where for um, uh, here in group four, experiment one is active, but at the same time, experiment two is active. So and this can create some interaction effect that um, uh, might not be captured um, 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 uh, accordingly. Um, and so basically this, this leads us to the conclusion that marginal effects ignore the effect from these experiment interactions. Um, and if you run a factorial design, then you don't attribute uh, the contribution of, of the interactions properly. So um, this motivates the, um, uh, our work here. Um, so as, as a quick reminder, how, we, how do we measure the, um, the, the different treatment effects here? So we look at um, treatments here as active set of experiments. So a treatment consists of several experiments being active. Um, and then we can measure the expected outcome using um, various techniques such as uh, the means of, the, of treatment groups. If we, if we are in a, uh, in a randomized control trial and we have proper randomized our, our treatment assignments, or we can use uh, more sophisticated methods like IPS weighting or, or doubly robust techniques. Um, and so if we um, then take the, um, the, the, the measured expected outcomes here and multiply them by the frequency and subtract the, um, the, 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 control, the overall control where no experiment is running, we get this difference here um, of um, uh, the, 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 the overall average that, that we observe and um, the set where no experiment is active. And what we want to do now is split this effect that we observe overall to the different, uh, to different active experiments. So we want, we want to find the decomposition such that our delta here is the sum of uh, the delta omegas where the omegas are, are the individual experiments. Um, so a natural way to do this is uh, to look at the 
um, average impact and attribute uh, and, 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 and um, divide the impact um, equally among the um, active experiments in that specific set. Um, the problem here is that, um, that experiments with no effect get penalized and um, everything is watered down to the overall average. So this means here, um, the, um, you, you are not actively disentangling the effect that comes from, from the different experiments. So the interactions are not properly taken into account. Um, so we still use um, this metric here as a, um, as, uh, as a point of comparison in our experiments, but um, we can do better than, better than that. Um, and so what we suggest here is to, the use of, of Shapley values um, to construct a fair um, attribution schema or a fair cost, cost sharing schema as, as it's called in, um, in the game theory literature. Um, and the use of Shapley values here is um, justified by um, the axiomatic properties that Shapley value um, satisfy. So in particular, um, Shapley values um, take into account um, null players. So that means basically, so in our, in our setting here, experiments that don't have an impact, um, they um, are symmetric. So this means it doesn't matter how you order your experiments, how you number them. Um, and then uh, an important property as well is balanced budget. So this means the um, overall uh, impact um, uh, is the sum of the individual impacts. Um, and so um, we construct the weighted um, average of these Shapley values where um, the particularity here is that the Shapley values take into account the marginal contribution of adding an experiment to an existing set of experiments. Okay, so um, let me illustrate here what happens in a synthetic setting. So um, here we, we simulated uh, three experiments under confounding um, where um, um, if we look at the, the left-hand side, we have the um, um, we have the, the weighted Shapley cost sharing, uh, our method that we suggest. And if we look at the right-hand side, you have the, um, the, this kind of average co cost sharing approach uh, where you see that um, the effects that we attribute to experiments zero, one, and two uh, are watered down towards zero. So um, here it, it gets very hard to, to disentangle the, the, the respective effect. Whereas if you use the, the, the Shapley um, um, cost sharing approach, um, you, you are able to tear these, these contributions apart. Um, the um, uh, confidence intervals here come from, uh, come from bootstrapping the data that we, that we simulated. So um, here you can, you can also um, yeah, quantify the uncertainty that, that comes from this procedure. Um, and then uh, finally, um, let's, let me illustrate our method with um, uh, an experiment uh, so with, with three different experiments that we run on, on Amazon Music. So um, here on, um, in the box plot on the left, left hand side, you see these different combinations of, of experiments zero, one, and two being, being active or not. And uh, so here, um, if experiment zero is the only experiment that's active at a given point in time, um, we see quite a negative impact on the, um, on the metric that we are interested in here. So we have a a negative lift of, of a minus 20%. Um, and so here, if we look at experiment one, um, we, see, we see the contrary. We see, we see a lift that, it's, uh, that is uh, around 20% uh, positive um, increase in, in, um, in, in, the, in the lift. Um, whereas if we look at experiment two, um, there doesn't seem to be much of an effect. And if you combine experiment two with the other experiments, um, everything gets somehow watered down towards zero. Um, and um, this is the same thing when you combine experiment zero and experiment one. Um, so uh, if, if we now just, if we would just look at the average impact here, we would uh, end up with uh, contributions that are all um, slightly negative, um, but not significant from, from, from zero. Um, so if you look, just look at the marginal impact, you. Um, somehow tend to um, capture that experiment zero uh, has a slightly more negative impact. And um, um, whereas uh, only when you, when you um, attribute the impact using our Shapley um, uh, approach, 
you really um, get, get to assign this negative impact to, to, experiment, uh, to experiment zero. Okay, uh, and, and you also see here that experiment one then uh, gets um, this positive share attributed and experiment two is, uh, um, is consistently um, uh, around zero and uh, yeah, as, um, as it should be. Okay, so um, with that, let me, uh, let me con conclude. So um, in terms of fu future um, avenues, uh, we can make use here also of the causal uh, or, or counterfactual perspective, where we can predict um, the, the impact based on uh, user features. So this means uh, if you want to stratify your, um, your impact according to some, um, um, I don't know, say, let's say time of the day or user, or, or user that, that fall into specific groups or so. Um, and also, uh, ultimately, um, our approach can be used to uh, stop bad experiments early. So um, if you realize that there's like one experiment that has an overall very negative impact on your um, on, on the overall metric that you monitor, then um, our approach tells you um, which of these experiments is, 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 is to be switched off. So with that, um, let me thank you and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Alexander. So if there are no questions from the members of our audience, I'll again relay a question from one of the reviewers of the paper, and I'll just pop it into chat and then I'll read that out loud. So Alexander, are you able to share to what extent this approach is being put into practice? Yeah, so um, as you might imagine with like these industrial applications, I can't uh, provide a lot of details to that, but um, so it's, it's an approach that we use for disentangling um, the impact of different experiments in in, a, um, in various settings. So, but I, I can't see more. I can't, can't say more to that, unfortunately. Understood. Thank you. There it goes. This is one of the key factors which help organization in growing and building a large customer base. Most of the organizations try to measure customer satisfaction using a widely adopted metric called NPS, Net Promoter Score which is defined as percentage promoters minus percentage detractors. Here the base is some total of promoters who gave positive ratings in the survey, detractors who gave negative rating, as well as the neutral responses. It is done by sharing a digital survey with users who either have purchased or explored the marketplace. However, the problem with this survey-based approach is that they can be costly, generally gets less responses, and are highly dependent on the questions that have been asked in the questionnaire. In this paper, the question that we try to address is how social media can play a key role in addressing the drawbacks that we just mentioned. We all know that social media adoption is huge, and there are nearly 3.6 billion users worldwide. Twitter, one of the most common social media platform, nowadays is go-to choice for social networking, content sharing and marketing. Mm -hmm. The kind of responses that we get from social media platform are very free-ended and are not limited to the questions that have been asked in the survey. One key major advantage is that the people who have not even ordered from a specific marketplace can express their targeted opinion toward their certain products or services, which could be very costly to collect if done via surveys. This slide gives us a brief overview of our complete pipeline. We extract data from four major social media channels, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Since social media data is very messy, we pass it through our data cleaning pipeline, which is explained below. First is message type filtering. We get a lot of messages, which are customer care responses and are not representative of voice of customer. Viral content removal. More often than not, posts go viral on social media and within a small time frame, they get reposted multiple times. So to reduce the over-indexing on a few messages, we use a heuristic approach to apply a max cap on them. Yeah. Initiative yeah. removal. Different marketplaces run different kind of initiative to promote their product and services. They incentivize customers in playing various kinds of games, puzzles, and using hashtag while retweeting to increase the brand engagement. Tier adjustment. From our data, we observed that the number of responses that we get from so across different tiers are not actual representation of the distribution of Flipkart customers. 
to address this issue we make appropriate tier adjustment as well once we have the clean data we pass it through our machine learning pipeline first module is aspect based sentiment analysis which basically tries to identify all the customer journey nodes with their appropriate sentiment once we have that data we do some kind of feature engineering on top of it and pass it through our feature selection pipeline to finally use it in our exuboost training module these things will be very clear in our later slides to give you more context here are few types of messages that we try to remove in our data cleaning pipeline first is message type filtering as you can see it is from flipkart support viral messages this message was posted by celebrity and has been retweeted 800 times initiatives or promotion flipkart has run an initiative to identify the price of iphone 12 and customers like they, these are posting the price of the iphone with the hashtag the big billion days let's take a deep dive in our machine learning pipeline first module was absa what is absa absa basically aims to identify fine grained consumer opinions about different aspect of product or services in e-commerce domain the different aspect could be delivery installation cancellation return so we frame this problem as a multi label classification task since we have a predefined list of 10 aspects which span pre order and post order node and all of them can basically appear with all three sentiment neutral negative and positive in total we manually tagged 15k samples which are divided into 13k 1k and 1k in train dev and test set we shared these 15k samples with three customer care agents and finally took a majority vote once we have a tagged data we use a transformer based model called t5 which expects input and output both in a string format since most of the task can be framed as nlp in nlp we can use the same decoder head to finally evaluate the performance we use the f1 score now let's take a look at our training data set since t5 can handle multiple tasks at once to differentiate between them we have to add appropriate prefix in the first example you can see that the prefix is absa with respect to flipkart that means we want to get absa tags with respect to flipkart marketplace The text says Flipkart delivered me wrong item even though I paid high delivery charge. The appropriate target text is delivery negative because Flipkart delivered the wrong item and pricing negative because they charged high delivery charge. Second is ABSA with respect to Amazon. That means we want to get ABSA tax with respect to Amazon marketplace. Here it says Amazon delivery is much better than XXX marketplace. So the appropriate target is delivery positive. Similarly the last two examples want the abs tag with respect to flipkart and amazon respectively to train an abs model we run following experiment first one is vanilla fine tuning in this case we take a pre trained t5 model and fine tune it over our own data set we observed that the label distribution was very skewed so in multi label context we apply a heuristic over sampling to over sample less frequent labels here we can see that the results have degraded a bit and finally we test out multi stage training so this will become clear from the next slide so this slide gives you a basic flavor of multi stage training having a prior knowledge of simple summation and multiplication can help you a lot in solving a complex task like calculus so we had a strong intuition that introducing auxiliary tasks like aspect identification and sentiment identification should also help a lot in the final abs objective to more idea about the auxiliary task let's take a look at few of our training samples so first example is basically to identify the aspect with respect to flipkart same example flipkart delivered me the wrong item even though i paid high delivery charge we dropped the sentiment level information and here the target is delivery comma pricing second is aspect with respect to flipkart and flipkart delivery is much better than xxx here the tag is delivery for the auxiliary task sentiment identification we can look take a look at the third example so here we want to extract the overall sentiment with respect to flipkart marketplace so here it says flipkart customer is excellent they resolved my return issue in just few minutes xxx should definitely learn some lessons from them here the overall sentiment is positive that's why the target text is positive similarly for the last example 
training auxiliary task along with the final objective in a multi-staged fashion can be quite tricky. So we run experiments over the following configurations. First configuration is training a model in three stages. First, we train the model to identify the aspect, then sentiment, and finally, to identify the ABS attacks. In the second configuration, we club the aspect and sentiment task together, train a model, and then finally fine tune it on ABS task. In the third configuration, we group all the auxiliary tasks as well as the downstream task together and train a model on top of it. And finally, we tested one more configuration in which we first train on all the tasks together and finally fine tune it on ABSA task again. As we can see that the last configuration gives us the best results, but we had reasons to suspect that fine tuning the model on ABSA task again might lead to overfitting. We use this configuration in our production since this gives us the best results. So once we have these social media mentions, we pass them through the AB te ABSA tagging pipeline whose goal is to identify the customer journey node along with the sentiment of those mentions. Now keeping in mind that we want to predict the NPS at weak level, we generate the aggregated positive, neutral and negative mentions at weak level of each aspect. Then we use these numbers to generate three types of features aspect sentiment, aspect mention ratio and weighted aspect sentiment. Let's say for example we want to compute the delivery sentiment then it would be nothing but positive delivery mentions minus negative delivery mentions divided by total delivery mention. Similarly delivery mention ratio would be the ratio of delivery mentions by overall platforms mentions. And for computing weighted delivery sentiment we just multiply the delivery sentiment and delivery mention ratio. Furthermore, we observe that people reach out to social media much before they fill out the survey and hence there's a lag between social media signals and the final NPS that we get from the surveys. And to cope up with this lag, we introduce the first order lag variables. On top of these, we project our original signals into the log space since we uh, and we observed that these log uh, transformed variables often give us a better performance. After all these transformations we get a final representation of that week and we call that as XW. So once we have this set of features that represents the VOC of a week W, we feed that feature set into our feature selection pipeline and obtain the final set of features which are important in predicting the NPS. Our feature selection pipeline is divided into four phases. The first one is removing the irrelevant features. So this is purely done based on the uh, prior knowledge that we get from the business understanding. For example, let's say a customer has cancelled their order. Then that customer might go to social media and comment about why they cancelled the order but will not be able to fill out the NPS survey and hence their experience is reflected in the social media signals but not in the ground truth NPS and hence we would want to remove those kind of features. Following that we need to select between the original features and the log transform features and that we decide based on the MI with the uh, target variable. So this MI score we compute for uh, the original feature as well as the log transform feature and which have, whichever has the higher uh, MI score we keep that and remove the other one. Following that we drop the highly correlated features. Uh, since our features are generated from the same ABSA tag data there's a high chance that a lot of these features are highly correlated and hence we want to we would want to remove those highly correlated features. So this is uh, based on the features interpretation correlation. The final phase in our feature selection pipeline is machine learning wrapper based techniques. So these iteratively removes the features uh, which has the least uh, permutation importance. Post this uh, feature selection pipeline we get the final set of features that we use for predicting the NPS. So once we have this final set of features, 
We use these features to train the NXU boost model in order to predict the NPS at weak level. In total, we have 130 data points that we divide into three sets. Training set, which has 100 data points, validation set, which has 15 data points, and similarly test set, which also has 15 data points. And in order to arrive at the best hyperparameters for our XGBoost model, we perform random search over three hyperparameters. Maximum depth, number of Epstream estimators, and subsample fraction. Now, once this XGBoost model is trained, we run an inference and obtain the NPS on the test data. On the test data, we obtain a MAP of 1.9% and a 79% Pearson correlation. Now, here's the chart that shows the test predictions as well as the ground truth delivery NPS. Since NPS is stable metric, we believe that MAP doesn't give us a complete picture, so we went ahead with additional performance metric, Pearson correlation. With MAP of 1.9% and correlation of 79%, we are able to establish that the model doesn't just generalize well on the map, but also captures the trend accurately. So we can conclude that this framework is very robust and any organization can use it to understand their customer experience without conducting exploitative surveys. Thank you. So hello everybody. Um, my name is Essan. Um, so I'm a PhD student at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and today I'll be talking about a paper that we wrote about um, a subreddit community that is related with the GameStop short speeds happened that happened last year. So the title is like short, colorful, and irreverent, the comparative analysis of users on Wall Street bets. Um, so before I start, like what we exactly did, like I'll just give you a like brief background, like what exactly happened last year and then also like what is the wall street bets community so wall street bets is a subreddit on sub uh, on reddit it's a community that is focusing on the uh, advice or like speculations about stock market trading um like in general it's also called like it's famous as like 4chan 4chan found the bloomberg terminal um a reason for that is like a lot of communication on this one although it's like about advice and then these related with the very serious stuff but the language that they use is um kind of like emoji based and not way not very so formal so it's like they use like a lot of expressions and stuff um but in general yeah it's like very common or like famous between the investors and then like some other people like very famous like keith gill who converted like fifty thousand us dollars into like a lot of money um, so those kind of people were like speculating different trading um, about different stocks uh, on this on this uh, subreddit. So that was the subreddit. And then a little bit about the short squeeze that happened in January 2021. Um, it started with the GameStop uh, game company in, in, in the US that uh, people like stopped selling the um, started holding the uh, shares for that company. Um, and then because of all those people who were trading uh, on, on, on those stocks, they were also present in, in this subreddit, the community that I just mentioned. So all those people started coming there and then they also, uh, you know, like campaigning against holding and all these kind of things. Um, but then what really like from computer science perspective, what really is interesting is uh, like, it's really rare that you, like somebody like with this rapid size of influx, like is, is not really so common in different communities. So number of users on this community, almost like quadrupled, like all those new users started posting so many things. So this community gave us like a very unique opportunity to study where like a lot of influx happens in the community. And then also another important thing, it was related with the real offline event that had like a significant effect on the on the on on on, on Wall Street, so that's why like this is very uh, interesting and important community to study on. Um, in general, um, why to study the communications in in such communities is very important because from the business perspective of these people who who are like from Reddit or like social media companies, it's important to keep the users on. In, in the community. But whenever sudden influx happens in the community, there might be like new users coming in and hijacking the narratives or like the where the people who are already there, they might feel like they're, lo they're losing the affinity. So 
that might change their uh, behavior and all these kind of things. So in, in those kind of settings, like it's important to study the user characterization and how the community evolved over this period so that we can see what really changed between the existing users and then how the new users actually came. So based on these uh, motivation factors, like we go further and then we design certain uh, research questions. So the very first one was like based on simple communication patterns. So for example, how people write different things or like I mentioned before, like people are using emojis a lot in this uh, subreddit. So what's the difference between the use of emojis and then how the rest of the community give feedback, like for example, like how many comments are given to the post by the newer users or the people who were already there. So that these kind of settings, like in general, number of comments or length of the post, these are used quite often in machine learning uh, modeling for the users. So these are like important features. So that's why we study these features. Um, and then obviously we have to look for some correlation with the stock market volatility. Like uh, it was eventually not just the GameStop. There were like some other companies that were also like people started coming and like campaigning for certain things around those companies. So we we will look at like how this volume of post correlates with the volatility of the stocks. And then eventually, because there's a lot of people, there's a lot of uh, discourse that's happening online. So how people decide what to post on. Um, so we try to look at that uh, and then the role of the like how the comments, number of comments actually affects and then what's the difference between the newer users and the older users. So these are the three main questions that we want to answer in this paper. Um, to start with, like we started collecting data in, in January. Uh, we first collected data for January 2021 using PushShift API. And then we also moved back in the time so that we can actually have some comparative uh, analysis. So we also collected data from start of January 2022, sorry, 2020 until the end of January 2021 in, in total. Um, and then to further differentiate between different kinds of users, what we do is uh, we, create four categories between the users. So one that are new users in 2021. So in, in Reddit, like PushShift API, we don't really get the exact date when the users actually join the, uh, or subscribe to the this Wall Street Bet community. So what we assume is like, if any users who have posted in 2021 and have not posted anything in like 2020, so we'd assume that these people are potentially the new users. Um, and then, so that is like our first group of users. Then we have the users in 2020, but they never posted anything within that January month. So we call them as old users, like or 2020 users. And then there were users who were active in both 2020 and 2021. So those users in general are continuing users or regular users, but within those users as well, what we try to see is like how those users particularly behave in 2020 and then how they did it in 2021. So there should be a 2021 in fourth, it's a typo. So four users, uh, 2021, new users, then the old user in 2020, and then the continuing user based on their time split between the um, year 2020 and year 21. So we had these four group of users and then we go further in our research questions and then we compare them. Um, so the very first one that we had was the communication patterns. So we had the users who were um, uh, like how they write different things in, in, uh, on subreddit. So we had the um, number of comments, number of emojis and number of words. So this is just the CDF for all their posts uh, of the users. And what we, then we compare them like statistically using crystal Wallace test. And then we also perform like a pairwise comparison. So what we found is like the newer user um, so yeah, like the existing user who were like continuing from 21, 2020 to 2021, they were, they, their use of emojis increased as compared to what they were using before, but still the new users who were, uh, who joined like in during this short squeeze, they wrote even shorter messages and also used more emojis. So, and then, but on the other hand, the comments, number of comments that the newer user got were way less than the older user or exist, like the user that were continuing. So in general, like to sum up what we found here is like the, the users who joined during the short squeeze, they were writing very short messages. 
but they were having like very bristy uh, activities. But in general, they were getting very less feedback from the community. The community was, as a whole, was still more responsive to the uh, users that were existing before. Um, so that was um, uh, like the answer for our RQ1. And then secondly, we go further with the uh, correlation with Wall Street. Um, to find the correlation with the Wall Street, we we pick, pick one company that was GameStop. That was obviously like that started the whole thing. And then we also picked BlackBerry, BlackBerry and then AMC. So these three companies were majorly speculated around this uh, month of January. Um, and then what we look for, instead of just looking for the prices, like opening or closing prices, we look for the volatility of the stocks. That's like, because this huge fluctuation was happening. So we prefer to look for the volatility rather than just the prices itself. Um, and then in, in previous research that are trying to predict the effect or like predict the stock prices based on certain things, the volume is one of the very commonly studied parameters. So we look for the name of the companies, like how many posts actually are talking about a particular company. And then we also look for the name of the companies together used with certain emojis. So in, in, in general, what we like, you can see this uh, pattern in, in these graphs, but when we look at the comparison, like correlation between uh, both type of uh, volatilities, with, uh, volatility with the company name and also with the emojis for all of our users. First thing we see that it is highly correlated for the newer users. Um, for example, like here you can see like 2021, AMC or GME or BlackBerry, like they're like, the correlation is quite high. Like, so it says like the activity in general is very much, going along with the volatility in the, in, in the prices or in the stock. Um, another important thing is like, we only show the correlations. So it's not, we are not really giving the causal, like if the volatility is followed by the volumes here or volume is being followed by the uh, volatility, but still like there is an increased uh, correlation. Um, similarly for the newer, uh, the other users, like the, those who were before in the community, they didn't really have, they have significant correlation, but in general, the correlation was less as compared to the newer users. So newer users were driving more a lot of the communication along the line of the volatility of the, uh, of the stock prices. And then lastly, coming towards the um, feedback, uh, like the community, like how the community interacts with the with the users. So what we do is like we look at uh, three features: uh, users' preference towards a topic, and then what is trending in the community as a whole, and then also the community feedback, like the feedback that usually get people get from the community. And then we make a predictive model, like if a user will continue writing on the same thing after uh, for for a next post or not. So we develop this regression model based on these features. Um, so most of the results that we have related with the accuracy and stuff, those are uh, available in the paper. But in general, uh, the results show that the, the users who were active for more like top 25 percentile in the active users, they're more susceptible to the feedback than moderately active. So that means like people will talk more about the topic or anything that previously they get more um, comments on. So that really significantly affects what user will continue talking about. And then similarly, the regular users, the people who were like continuing from 2020, they were less susceptible to the feedback than the newer users. So that's just like people who were already there, they care less about what community responds to them, but they choose their topics by themselves. But the newer users, if they start getting more comments, they will continue talking about the same, same topic. Um, so yeah, so these are the thing. And then overall community um, it, like um, evolution of like, we say like, oh, newer users started using more communities, but then we look at a little bit more uh, deeper analysis. And then we see like, um, so in general, like in, in, in on Wall Street bets, like people are using either emojis or some expressions. So for example, uh, if you might have heard like to the moon or with the rocket emoji, like people were like, re like, um, uh, racing for like, you know, to increase the price of the, of the stocks or people were using like paper hands to like stop people, uh, ask people to not sell. So these were like impressions or expressions or emojis. So in, in figure A and figure C, we show the, from 2020 to end of 20, January, 2021, like the top five 
emojis and expressions uh, used in the whole community. And then figures B and D, they are showing like per day normalized uh, amount of um, frequency. So we can see like the trend of the community in 2020 was like more like uh, for like, because the stock market due to COVID was probably not so good. So people were more about like selling it. But then since the 2020s one started, like people were more about like holding the stock so that this uh, short squeeze um, continued. And then like all these users who joined in 2021, they quickly adopted to all this linguistic uh, language and like expressions that are already used in the uh, in the community. And then they, they started using it and then they like really increased the trends for all those kind of things. Um, I think I'm also running short of the time, but yeah. So then like this goes with the, uh, the trend. And then in general, like in, to conclude what, I, what we have found is like the newer users, they differ significantly with from the users that were already there on the community. But the important thing is like in general, whenever this sudden influx happens in the community, usually it's considered like as anti-social behavior, like these people are coming and then they're like just disrupting everything. But in this case, because these people also, they were posting a lot of things, but they are not getting a lot of comments from the community. So that means like they were not really generating a lot of discussions. So they, it, it, in, from literature point of view, it's not really anti-social behavior. Um, the users who were already there, they changed their behavior too, but they were still different than the newer users, but they were tilted towards the newer users. So that change happened with the users who were already there. Um, and then lastly, uh, so the significant correlationship uh, like exists between the prices and the user's activity in here. So this can be further explored, like how to make the predictive models and like which kind of users should be used for better predictions. Um, and then yeah, like the people who are more active, they prefer to talk about the things that in general, the community is more responsive to. Um, so yeah, so these were like the main findings. I'll be happy to take any questions. I think the time is short, but like you can just write in the chat and then I will be happy to answer. Thanks. Thank you, Ehsan. Are there any questions? If there are none, I'll relay uh, one from uh, one of the reviews of the paper. So I'll just pop that into chat, so I'll just uh, read it out. Given that it seems to be the case that the data for the continuing user group inclo includes posts from both 2020 and 2021, can you expand on how your approach compares users, i.e. new versus continuing, rather than simply just comparing the time periods? Um, yeah, so basically, um, well, obviously like you can make as many groups uh, to compare, um, but what we did was like, uh, we thought like, because for the continuing user, we can just split them uh, into two periods. So the continuing users in 2020 and 2021, they were like treated separately. So continuing user is not treated as a whole. So we made like split them. And then the continuing user in 2021, when they're compared with the new user, so that is like probably the comparison that uh, probably you're asking. Um, so, um, in in so we actually did once. We what we did before was like we had all of them together, but then the reviewer asked us to split it, so we just split it. But in general, the pattern still uh, holds. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for interesting my talk. Uh, I'm Ye Wong from ETH Zurich. So today I'm very excited to share our work on an interesting arbitrage strategies in decentralized exchanges, which I believe will provide insight for the blockchain based in financial system. The traditional finance is all about centralized system, such as banks and stock exchanges. The financial security highly depends on people's trust in these financial institutions. So in centralized finance, if users want to conduct market operations, they have to first send their assets to a centralized operator. So for instance, if I want to exchange Ether with USDT, I have to send my money to the bank first, then perform the money exchange under the regulation of the bank. During the entire exchange process, everything is happened in the bank system. So I actually lose the control of my asset and the bank is, bank is able to censor, move, or even destroy my money. 
So there are already many problems have been exposed in such centralized finance, such as bank, uh, bankruptcy. So this leads more and more people to look for an alternative operation, uh, option. And the option that we discussed today is called DeFi, decentralized finance. So the innovation of decentralized finance decentralized finance is to move our trust in centralized authorities to blockchain technology. So DeFi supports almost all centralized finance products, for instance, decentralized exchanges, which are one of the important financial infrastructure in DeFi. So this allows users to exchange their assets with others. So decentralized exchanges are smart contracts deployed on the blockchain. So users can interact with the smart contract and immediately to get the money back without involvement of a third party. So that sounds amazing, right? So let me show you how this magic mechanism works in detail. So the key of realizing such immediate exchanging is to have some reserves in advance. So for example, for the exchange market between Ether and USDT, the decentralized exchange will, decentralized exchange will create a liquidity pool for these two currencies. So any blockchain users can put their money into this liquidity pool. And after there are some reserves in the liquidity pool, users can trade, trade with the liquidity pool. For instance, the user can now directly send Ether to the pool and get the USDT back immediately without waiting for another order for selling USDT. So I guess some of you may have a question. So what if one currency runs out? So then we cannot perform the immediate exchange anymore, right? To address this challenge, the market uses a new pricing mechanism. So users cannot determine the exchange rate by themselves. They have to follow a predetermined pricing rule. So let me explain the pricing mechanism in more detail. So in this transaction, the user sells 20 Ether to the liquidity pool. And the pricing mechanism will first compute the product of the quantities of two currencies in the pool. So in this example, is 30 million. So after receiving 20 Ether from the user, the quantity of the uh, Ether in the liquidity pool becomes 120. And the pricing mechanism will make sure that the product of the quantity in the liquidity pool stays the same before and after the exchange. So 50,000 USTT are given back to the user. So now after the exchange, the product of the quantities of the two currencies in the pool is still three, uh, 30 million. So the pricing mechanism ensures that before and after the exchange, the product stays as a constant. So that's why we call this mechanism constant product pricing mechanism. Because the product will never be zero. So none of these two currencies can run out. So in decentralized market, there are many liquidity pools for different uh, currency pairs. And the exchange rate of each pair is independent. It is only determined by the currency reserved in the pool. So therefore, the exchange rate of different pairs are not always in sync perfectly. So by observing this market property, we find that this opens opportunity for users to conduct cyclic trades to benefit themselves. So here I show an example of a cyclic upcharge that we find in real market. So the user first sell USDC for USDT in the market. He, uh, he sells 285 USDC. Then the market will give him 283 USDT back. After that, he sells the USDT in the market with seal. Then he will get 2.13 sale from the liquidity pool. And again, he trades sale with KP3R and gets 1.55 KP3R back. And finally, he receives 303 USDC by selling 1.55 KB3R. So in this transaction, the user earns 18 USDC by cyclically trading through these four liquidity pools. That's why we call this arbitrage behavior cyclic upcharge. So in this paper, we construct a theoretical model to examine whether a cycle is profitable for cyclic upcharge and the optimum revenue for such a trade. So with this theoretical model, we look into the real market data and compute the arbitrage opportunities in the market. So we launch a Go Ethereum client 
to collect market data in the most popular decentralized exchanges, Uniswap V2. So by analyzing the log event recorded in the blockchain recept, we are able to recover all market operations and market states over time. So if the market state changes, then there will be a sync event recorded in the blockchain with the latest reserves in the corresponding liquidity pools. Then with this information of the market state, we can compute the potential arbitrage opportunities over time. So this figure shows the number of arbitrage opportunities we find over one year. The arbitrage opportunities increase from May 2020 to April 2021. So with the development of decentralized exchange market, more and more exploitable opportunities exist in the market. So even more than 1,000 cycles with revenue higher than 0.001 Ether, which is almost like three, uh, 30 US dollar. So after noting the uh, so many exploitable uh, arbitrage opportunities in Uniswap V2, we further investigate how many cyclic arbitrages have been execu uh, executed in the market and how much revenue traders have exploited. So similarly, we use the log information recorded on Ethereum blockchain. So for each successful transaction, a swap event with, uh, will be recorded in the receipt, including the input amount of tokens and output amount of the tokens. Then we can use the heuristic to determine the cyclic app transactions such that the uh, cyclic transactions should be a group of transactions from the same user. The output of the first transaction is equal to the input of the second transaction and so on. So until the output token of the last transaction equals to the input of the first transaction. So with this measurement, we find that until April 2020, uh, 2021, there are almost uh, 300,000 cyclic transactions happened in the Uniswap V2. So the market has been growing from May 2020 to September 2020, reaching more than 3,000 cyclic arbitrages per day. And the market become more consistent and stable after January 2021 with like three, uh, 600 transactions per day. Because more than 98% of cyclic transactions start with the cryptocurrency Ether. So here we only show the revenue of those transactions starting with Ether. And the total revenue is 34,000 Ether. So since October 2020, the market has become relatively stable with 100 Ether revenue per day. And the average revenue of each cyclic transaction is around 0.1 Ether, which is almost like 300 US dollar. So after starting exploit cyclic arbitrage opportunities, we continue to analyze how users implement their cyclic arbitrage strategies in the market. So in, par in particular, we investigate two possible arbitrage implementations and compare their performance, sequential implementation and the atomic implementation. The first one is a sequential implementation. This is very intuitive to understand. The user just submits three transactions one by one he sells the currency after buying it. So however, this implementation is not ideal because the market state is changing over time. For example, if another user buys USDT with Ether before this user, then this user cannot get as much USDT as he wants and may not benefit themselves in the end. So actually we only find 88 cyclic arbitrage using the sequential implementations over one year and more than half of them do not have a positive revenue. So the second one is the atomic implementation. Now the user uses the smart contract technology to deploy a proxy contract and to realize three exchanges simultaneously in the market. So that's why we call it atomic. So because all these three trades happen at the same time, it will be less possible that other users influence the market price. So another advantage of atomic implementation is that if users find that he cannot get as much revenue as he wants, he can cancel the execution of the smart contract. So in real market, we find almost 300,000 cyclic arbitrage using this atomic implementation and only 0.3% of them has negative revenue. So also traders, can cancel a cyclic transaction if the expected revenue is not pos a positive. They still need to pay a gas fee to miners for these failed transactions. 
So this can be a sig significant part of the cost of the users. So therefore, we investigate the success rate of atomic implementations. We find that most arbitrages, actually almost 500 of, out of 800, have a su success rate higher than 90%. And the overall su success rate is 52%. So taking the cost of the field transactions into account, the net profit of arbitrages is 21,000 Ether, and at least 66% of arbitrages have a positive balance. So this indicates that cyclic arbitrage strategies are profitable, especially for experienced users. So due to the time limit, I cannot present all the results of our work in this talk today, but it is always welcome for questions and discussions in the future. So thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thanks. So are there any questions? If there are none, um, I have one. So are there, is there, are there more, more than two implementations? So you had sequential and atomic. Is there a, another one? Uh, for uh, uh, We haven't uh, observed any uh, another uh, implementation, actually, yeah. So I was wondering whether or not there were also, there was something interesting in observing whether there were um, sequences of such implementations yeah. from you so that you could observe over time what, what people do. Yeah, so I think the key point here is that in the blockchain, the transactions are executed one by one. So the, uh, the traders have determined the order of the transactions will be executed on the market. So for example, if you want to do an upcharge, it will be very seldom for, uh, for them to insert some other transactions in between. So, th then why we, uh, so that's why we observe only the sequential one and atomic one. I see. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Saurav um, and I'm going to talk about uh, an exploratory study of stock price movements from earnings calls. Uh, this work was collaborated with uh, Dr. Rasul Nizad and Professor Young and Professor Uzi from Northwestern and from Santa Cruz. Um, so let's see what, what is an earnings call. So basically earnings calls is uh, discussion sessions where management from the company gives updates about the company. So they talk about what the company health currently is uh, in the previous quarter, and then what the health will be in the next quarter. And it usually happens every quarter, especially from the public companies. And these sessions generally include uh, members from the companies, as well as investor, analyst, and journalist. So our question here is, um, how to quantify uh, this earnings calls effect, especially on consumers? And one of the way uh, we thought of is uh, maybe a proxy will be to measure how it changes stock price movements. And then we can uh, see what are the effects of these earnings calls on consumer. So let's see an example. So this is an example of earnings calls. So we have some meta information uh, of earnings calls. This earnings calls is from company um, and then the CEO, CEO name. So some meta information about the companies. We can also see participants uh, who are in the earnings calls. And you can see some people are from the company, some are from outside the company, and then the earnings calls start. So I'm not showing you the uh, full conversation of the earnings calls. This is a part of it. The question is, uh, are these calls important? And do these calls have any effect on the stock prices? Um, so here we are seeing um, a plot of Tesla stock price in 2019, uh, I know from 2020, it will be a different story, but let's stick to the uh, year of 2019. And uh, prices are showing uh, in the y-axis, x-axis shows the dates. And you can see all those green and red boxes. So red boxes imply negative reaction, green boxes imply positive reaction. So whenever earnings call happened, there was a reaction from the people in terms of stock prices. So the question we are looking for is uh, how do people perceive information, especially when the information is delivered in, in terms of a uh, soft version, so like earnings calls, um, and how does the soft version of this data uh, do um, in terms of predicting these movements uh, with respect to the hard data. So hard data means you can uh, have some financial data, especially in terms of how much sales have been from the company and some other data. So um, one other thing is these earnings calls are important, especially with respect to, uh, with perspective of company. 
um, and companies make an effort to prepare these earnings calls. And you can see we are just uh, analyzing how positive the people from the companies are in the earnings calls and how negative they are. Um, so in the left-hand side, uh, the plot showing how positive they are over the years, you can see that whenever stock went up or went down, the positivity from the companies are actually increasing over the years. That means companies are putting effort in framing these um, earnings calls. Also, you can see in the right-hand plot, uh, the negativity from the companies uh, in the earnings calls. So it doesn't really matter whether the company's stock prices went up or down, the companies were trying to be less negative about their companies. So it, it's worthy to study this and we will see soon how this actually affect uh, stock prices. So the question again is how should we quantify this effect for these earnings calls? So whatever we have seen so far, we have seen what are the earnings calls are, we have seen an example and we have seen that companies put some effort, some importance in these earnings calls. So now we're going to define how we are going to define uh, stock price movements based on these earnings calls. So people can define uh, these movements in several ways. So one easy way is you can capture daily change. So you can see uh, when the earnings calls came, what are the stock price on the day before and the, what the st stock price day after. And you can quantify your stock, whether it's went up or down uh, based on a simple classification. But you can also think of a uh, shock based level. So when it's similar to daily changes, but it's, it should capture significant changes, let's say 5% or 10% in the values. But one can also argue that we are not normalizing based on the index. So you can have a, a value of these stock changes based on the index, um, based on normalization of the index and how fast it changes with respect to the index values. And you can also capture this on a weekly basis. So we have three different levels. Uh, that means we have three different classification problems. And I'm going to show you which kind of data we have used. So this, these are our data. So we have collected the data from 2010 to 2019. And then this date, this come calls are from uh, 8,000 different companies. And we have almost 100,000 earnings calls. We have also collected some other data, which are board related like how many um, board members are in the company, if the board members are same in two different companies, um, what is the gender of the board members, what are the experience of CEOs? And you can see in the data, um, I am showing you only based on one level. So year-wise or quarter-wise or sector-wise, the data is balanced um, in these two classes, zero and one. We have also done a sector-wise analysis um, based on different se sector, industrial, materials, financial, we are also going to see some results based on them. So first thing is we tried to analyze the sentiments of these earnings calls. So here I'm showing you four different sentiments, positive, negative, sad, and anxiety. And uh, these sentiments, um, as I have been talking about this before, that people are trying to be more positive over the years, but you can also see um, the sentiments are kind of expected as we can think of uh, whether the stock in terms of stock went up or down. So when the stock went up, the mostly the positives are higher well, when the stock went up. When the stock went down, the positives are lower uh, and is exactly opposite in the negative scenario, sad scenario and anxiety scenario. So these sentiments are actually prominent in the earnings calls. And these results motivate us to actually dig further build uh, more sophisticated methods based on semantics, we're going to see soon. So first we did a simple regression analysis based on different emotions uh, of the sentiments as well as different cognitive um, sentiments. And here you can see uh, even with controls as sectors, as years, with the presence of other hard data like sales, estimated sales, or earning per share, which I am showing you as EPS, with the presence of all these variables, still the sentiments are coming up as significant. So this again motivates us to uh, dig further and see whether the semantics of this earnings call are useful towards predicting stock price movements. So this is our method. Uh, we, we have as you the graph um, from the document, so how you prepare the graph is the following. 
the every word is a node and then the word appears in the neighborhood that word could be a neighbor of the node so that does you can create a graph from the document and we had already labels for the document so you this basically becomes a graph classification problem so for a supervised part we have used a gated graph neural nets and then we documented we we uh, represented each document by some vector also we have used unsupervised methods such as doc to vec to uh, generate those unsupervised embeddings um, the the reason was that for the domain specific changes we need to still capture the unsupervised uh, part and the combination of these actually gave us good results i'm not going too much details into uh, this architecture but i will be happy to talk about it later so these are the results we had three different levels based on daily based on weekly which is index here and shock based and we have assumed the trained data for from 2010 to 2016 and last three years was test so in terms of accuracy for daily based level uh, we are seeing that our method stock genin is performing pretty well uh, usually stock price moments problems are really hard to um, classify are really hard to quantify so still we are doing better than uh, uh, random, almost up to 24%. It's also beating uh, some other baselines, but you can see those baselines are also based on um, some semantic uh, semantics from earnings calls, but they are also highly predictive. So that signifies that the semantics of these earnings calls are actually important to, uh, to quantify stock price movements. So in literature, um, usually the baseline for stock price movements are some hard data. For example, uh, people can take how earning per share was if the estimated actually beat uh, the, sorry, if the actual one beat the estimated one or not. So in this figure, I'm showing you earnings per share and sales, both in terms of beat and miss, uh, whether the actual one and the estimated one. So what you should expect is if the beat by miss fraction is higher, then you should expect the upward green and then downward red so that the stock price went up and down, but which is not the case in the figure. So that means the hard data cannot be always a good predictor to predict stock price movements. And can we do better with, with um, semantics from earnings calls in terms of this hard data or not? So here I'm showing you uh, results, again, based on um, average recall, average position on five major sectors. So blue one is signifies uh, the transcripts, the semantics, and the orange one signifies the sales and earnings per share. And we can see most of the cases, the transcripts are highly predictive, more predictive than sales and earnings. So if you also combine the semantic features and sentiments, we see only a marginal gain. So most of the times the semantics are more useful than sentiments, which are also expected. And um, semantics are a kind of capturing whatever the sentiment will capture in these cases. So as a future work, uh, we are trying to understand the review systems in many different domains. So I just talked about earnings calls and its effect on people, how people review these earnings calls. This can be also replicated in patent because parent application system and parent review systems are kind of similar. You uh, file for a patent application and then it goes under review and then it either gets accepted and rejected, same as a grant proposal. So we are trying to understand this, all these different review systems uh, in general. The challenges are that you need domain knowledge for different domains. Sometimes it lacks good data. Uh, so you have to collect good data. Also, it's important to understand the mechanisms because when the domain changes, the mechanism and the perceive, uh, how you perceive the information also changes. So we are making some effort uh, towards this. We, we had collected data set on parent applications, how the review happens in those applications. Also, uh, as I was talking about earnings calls, we are collecting data on companies. Also, Northwestern was very generous to give us data set on grant proposal. So we are looking into these problems. So main three, three takeaways uh, from this talk is, one is the problem itself and the data. So we are trying to capture the effect of earnings calls on stock price movements with a large data set. Second is we have used a graph neural nest best method uh, to quantify the stock price movement based on the semantics of earnings calls. Third is the most important that the semantics of the earnings calls are predictive and it can be useful in decision making. Thank you.
Thank you, Surav. So it looks like, is that a question? Mm -hmm. um, it was Maybe a comment. Wu Liang, uh, sorry, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, I don't know if you want to expand on that a bit. Yeah. Hi, hi, uh, good morning here. Um, interesting talk. I just uh, was fascinated by your findings. I have a question. Um, yeah, sure. So now that you have found that um, companies tend to basically pump up their sentiments to be on the positive side with these earning costs, um, would that um, diminish your predictive power moving forward if everybody, all companies start doing that. So they are like now very different in their sentiments uh, yeah. with the measures you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent question actually. And, and uh, this question also came up in the reviews as well. So the question was more of what if companies try to manipulate um, whatever uh, the state of their um, um, company's health is. Uh, so one answer is that uh, company we have to be careful, right? Uh, because companies run on reputation. So uh, the one thing, like on average, the sentiments are increasing even without knowing, let's say, um, without knowing how the market will actually perceive. So I don't think it's it's uh, in terms of it's like it's a manipulation. So it's more of um, in your. Um, uh, let's say subconscious mind that you are talking more positively about the company's health because mostly because the company is running reputation. So even if you say positive things and the companies do bad, so the stocks are going to go down in the next quarter, right? So, um, uh, but but this this argument is good that um, th that if you if you actually change your language um, in a manipulative way, uh, even if whenever you are telling the truth, um, how the model is going to perceive them or not. So we are uh, we are actually working on some interpretation of these models, like what the models learn and how they actually predict. So mm -hmm. this will be kind of a future work um, that whether these models are um, predicting this one and some zeros based on the strong adjectives or other words they use or not. So this is this are very good question and very good suggestions as well. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps because uh, you mentioned that hard data is not as predictive, but like I I. I don't know if um, you, you may have mentioned this and I wasn't paying attention. You, uh, what if when you combine the hard data and the, the sentiments data, like for example, if they say, oh, we're so happy that our uh, earning is A and B and that's like a lower number. Like we know people are not supposed to be happy about it, but they just said it that way. Like you have, but you have the actual number in there too. Um, yes. So yeah, we, we had combined the numerical data with uh, the semantics and the results don't differ much. Uh, okay. One reason might be that uh, basically whatever you were saying, uh, so especially when you beat the earnings, so whatever you were saying, your earnings calls is actually capturing when you uh, when you um, do well uh, in the in the uh, like sales or in the earnings per share, but uh, it's hard to capture actually or it's hard to mimic when you don't do well in terms of hard data, but you are still trying to be positive mm -hmm. in your earnings calls. That's when they do more mistake. That's what our finding is. But uh, but it will need let's say more uh, more work to know whether this these documents are actually capturing whatever the hard data is um, saying. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Mo Ying Zhu from Zhejiang University. I'm so honored to be with you to communicate our work. The title of the work is Weight Based Interpreted Stock Embedding for risk averse portfolio management. My presentation will include these four parts. First, the motivation of this work. Second, the main work we have done. Third, some empirical analysis. And the last, the conclusion and future work. Our main research is about devising a risk averse portfolio structure in a financial market. Generally speaking, Mark Wiss's theory is a general coastal of the risk averse portfolio selection problem the core of which is to minimize the risk match for, of a portfolio. Intuitively, a portfolio builds a high risk if a large proportion of the investment falls in to highly positive correlated stocks rather than to uncorrelated or negative correlated stocks. However, a well-known problem is that the correlation between stocks cannot be directly absorbed which makes the risk averse portfolio selection strategies almost impossible to construct a portfolio with an accuracy 
risk metric. A naive way to estimate the risk metric is to use wavelet approach, which can decompose complex time series data into multiple time series under different frequency for interpretation. By utilizing the wavelet result to encode stopping body, it is possible to provide the interpretation of stops correction from different time and frequency domain. Uh, there is an example in this slide. Figure one presents three Chinese stock. China Life Insurance Company, Hyacinth Royal Flush Information Network, and Hansen Technologies, which we denote as stock one, two, three, and the wave later decomposition results in their cumulative returns in various time and frequency domains. We now focus on the phenomena during the observation period. On the one hand, in the time domain, both the stock one and stock two show similar downward trend during the observation period because they belong to the same industry, the financial service industry, which have similar long-term financial performance. By contrast, stock three belongs to a different industry, the software development industry, which causes its trend to be different among the three stocks. On the other hand, the frequency domain, a long-term trend is expressed by a low frequency level, and a short-term trend is more relevant to the pattern with high frequencies. At the low frequency level, the overall trend of the three stocks is reflected in a more obvious and smooth form. It can be clearly seen in figure D1 that while the trend of stock 1 and stock 2 are similar, and the trend of stock 3 is different from them, at the high frequency level, in figure D2, stock two and stock three have relative similar performance, which means they have a high correlation. This is because they both have the business with the scope of FinTech and are affected by the same event. The end group has become under supervision of the Chinese government since October 2020, which have had a negative impact on the stocks with FinTech business. The result in frequency domain not only reflect, reflect the high correlation between stock one and stock two, which is consistent with the analysis in the time domain, but also reflects the similarity between stock two and stock three, which is, however, neg neglected in the time domain. Therefore, analyze the similarity in the time domain only without using wavelet analysis cannot sufficiently reflect the stock's correlations at multiple level frequency. Nevertheless, wavelet-based method faces the following two challenges. First, it is difficult to find suitable period parameters of wavelet decomposition. Wavelet decomposition involves many parameters, such as different wavelet basis functions and their co corresponding filter coefficients. Most existing studies lack different wavelet basis functions based on empirical expert knowledge. For example, the biognal wavelet is often selected in health tasks. However, this choice relies too much on expert knowledge, which is not available in financial tasks. In addition, the fixed filter coefficient gener generated by the wavelet basis function is not necessarily suitable for the entire time series which need to be turned. Secondly, it is hard to reflect the future trend of the risk metric. The wavelet decomposition focuses on the decomposition of history to stock time series only, and does not include future, future information, which leads to low effectiveness. Based on the above analysis, we need to devise a structure to address the risk averse portfolio selection problem and answer the following question. How to select the wavelet basis function? How to construct stock embeddings based on wavelet decomposition? How to estimate the risk metric? How to construct the risk averse portfolio in each trading ground based on such a risk metric? Before we go deeper into our proposed model, let's introduce some problem settings. First, the general portfolio selection problem. In each number Our selection problem aims to meet 
minimize the risk and the transaction cost with the transaction cost coefficient as shown in equation one. In this equation, the risk is computed following the mean bias optimization principle, where the mean return is. Next, let's look at our master overview. WISE consists of four key modules, the WBS, WDSE, MRME, and RPO modules. Specifically, the WBS and WDSE modules are used to build the stock embeddings on the different frequency domains. To boost the learning of stock embeddings, we further introduce three optional tasks that is stock variance prediction, stock price movement classification, and stock price movement forecasting. The third module, MRME, utilizes stock embedding from different frequency phases to estimate the facet specific similarity based correlation matrix, and then aggregates the correlation matrix to calculate the risk match. Finally, the RPO module minimizes the risk portfolio's risk based on the risk metric under two investment conditions, the trade-off between transaction costs and the portfolio return exceeds the expected return, finally contracts the risk averse portfolio. The WDSE and the WBS modules aim to generate stock embedding based on wavelength decomposition. First, the WDSE network decomposes the stock time series into multiple sub-signals based on multiple level discrete wavelength decomposition. In each level K, WDSE divides an uh, input series into a low sub-series and a high sub-series based on the low pass filter and the high pass filter respectively. Second, because the selection of the wavelength based function is challenging, we have designed the WPS module based on an expert checking algorithm in which the meta model will mix the result of multiple expert mm -hmm. models and the checks the most suitable wavelength basis function as shown in algorithm one. Specifically, each of the expert model represents an entire portfolio structure and their differences is that their WDSE models are initialized by different wavelet basis functions. Theoretically, the regret of WBS is sublinear to the number of total wrong T, which indicates that the checked wavelet basis function will eventually co 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 converge to the optimal one. Next, as shown in the right of the slide, we build three actual tasks to enhance the critical transition ability of stock embeddings. We do this because the risk metric is unobserv unobservable, make it hard to direct construct a supervised learning task to predict the risk metric. The first is stock virus prediction task. We leverage the stock embeddings to predict stock returns and then evaluate the quality of stock embeddings by the proportion of the virus in the predicted returns. The second is stock price movement classification task, which predicts the unknown category label of the time series. The third is stock price movement forecasting task, which is a regression task with RNN based model. The last part in the low left corner of the module diagram is the portfolio control module. We have two sub modules in this part. The first one is MRME, which calculates the similarity among stocks by facet specific similarity. As shown in the upright of the slide, the similarity calculator we can naturally connect a multi-space representation from multiple frequency domains. The second one is RPO optimization, which addresses the online portfolio selection problem by minimizing the long-term risk of the entire t runs. The optimization is based on the ADMM algorithm. As shown in algorithm 2, it summarizes the ADMM iterations for calculate portfolio weight in wrong t. On account of the time, I will make a brief description of the experiment. 
in the experiment, we chose three data sets and compared nine total comparison strategies and three variant models of Ys for comparison. We backtest the cumulative wells, APY, and evaluate the risk using four risk metrics on these three data sets. The results demonstrate the effectiveness of Ys in accumulating wells and the control risk compared with SOTA strategies. Then I will give a deeper empirical analysis. We compare variant models of Ys and the market index on the different expected gains, which cover typical cases in real-world portfolio construction. The figure shows the experiment result of the average annual gain over the years. It can be seen that all Ys-based methods opt for the index and Ys without wave rate, which indicates Ys super, superior ability, ability to utilize information from both the frequency and time domains. To answer the question, how does Ys interpret the estimate risk metric? We conduct a qualitative analysis to show Ys interpretable risk metric from different frequency angles in a real world market. In order to make straightforward visualization of how WISE responds to the typical year 2020 that we have described in our motivation example. We randomly picked some dates in 2020 and plot six heat maps that describe the risk metric of the three stocks mentioned in our motivation example. From the figure, we have various interesting observations. Firstly, the diagonal of each risk metric generated by Ys represents the variance of the stock within the slide window, which is consistent with the, that of the covariance metric. Secondly, stock one and stock two have a stronger correlation in the time domain and the low frequency domain on any date compared with stock three. This is caused by the fact that stock one and stock two are in the same industry, whereas stock three is in an industry different from them. Thirdly, on October 29 and December 31, stock two and stock three have a strong correlation in the high frequency domain because they are affected by the same event as we have described in our motivation example. To sum up, why can decompose the risk match into multiple sub-risk metrics in the different frequency domains? to explain the correlation between the stock in a portfolio on the vast frequency domain perspective. In summary, in this paper, we propose a risk-averse portfolio selection method named WISE, which can not only fully explore stock time series from the perspective of the time domain and the frequency domain, but also have the advantage of providing interpretability of on the portfolio decision from different frequency angles. Empirical study demonstrates the effectiveness of WISE. In the future, an interesting extension is to follow incorporation more risk, um, risk measures, such as value at risk, to meet the different risk averse needs of the investors. Thank you for listening. If you are interested in our work, welcome to contact to us. Hello, my name is Jacek Gołębiowski, and today I'll talk about search filter ranking with language aware label embeddings. And this is work done by me and my collaborators from Amazon Search. And well, they're also part of other universities or institutions. So to start us off, a standard search in any e-commerce platform can return thousands of products, making it very difficult for the customer to find a set of items that they might like. So for example, Amazon carries around 3,000 pairs of jeans for men. This is really a lot. And the situation is going to be even more dire if you look for t-shirts, which Amazon has about 70,000. So I think it's sa it is safe to assume that no customer is able to sift through all of the results. So discovering products can be made simpler through search filters that re restrict the set of items to those with a specific attribute value, such as genes of a specified size or of a specified brand, as seen here. That, that being said, any reasonably large store contains multiple of such filters, and the goal is now to present users with only a small relevant subset, and not all of them. And this, 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 this can be achieved very easily at the level of individual keywords, 
We can look at the filters that were clicked in the past and rank them by popularity. But this will, re in order to really get it running in a production store, we would need to do that for every query separately. So, and to achieve coverage beyond the most popular keywords, we need to train a machine learning model that learns from customer past interactions with filters to predict the set of most relevant ones for any query, even the ones that we haven't seen before. So in practice, the task is to predict the most relevant filter to a customer query. One way to do that is based on their historical interactions with the e-commerce store. So for example, when a customer looks for jeans for men, which is the query, and chooses to filter by price, we can record that interaction in our dataset. And same can be done for a different customer who decides to sort by size. And now we have two data points. So for experiments presented in this work, we have done that exercise about one and a half million times, collecting individual data points for 600,000 unique queries and clicks on 1,600 unique labels. And uh, the data set has been split between train validation and set and test set, may, making sure that there is no query overlap between each of the data sets. So the search filters data set you, you used in this work has approximately 1600 unique labels, as, as before stated. And as most ranking and classification data sets with large number of labels, it exhibits a power law distribution over label frequencies. So what it means is that there's a very long tail of labels which occur in very few examples, making them significantly harder to predict. So just, just, just to give you an understanding, the red bar shown here is the 200 most common labels, which uh, take about 80% of label occurrences in all of our data sets. So uh, to maybe uh, use, use an example, we, we, we might get a lot of signal about the very popular file filters, such as customer reviews or the, the prime filter, but also uh, TV size or monitor size, which are reasonably, reasonably common. However, there are very few data points about game formats for outdated consoles or even the current ones, may, may, making such filters very difficult to predict. So to tackle this problem, we can first take a look at the data available for each filter and observe that, well, understandably, each filter is defined by its unique ID. It also has a clear, clear text name. And we can filter those names uh, to learn, well, sorry, we can use those names to learn about the filters that have not, not seen before, but are described similarly to observed ones. So for, for example, given the similarity of men's shoe size and women's shoe size, we, we can deduce that if a woman's size was clicked for a query about shoes, then maybe men's size is also relevant to similar searches. Uh, but it is important to note that this setup is not unique to modeling search filters uh, at Amazon or at any other e-commerce store, as there are multiple public data sets from the extreme classification community, which also provide the textual de description of labels. And examples include the Wiki family, the Amazon family, and the Eurolex data set. So this is applicable way beyond just our current scope. So knowing a lot about our, about our data set, our objective is now to solve it and train the model that can predict filters given a query. So we follow a standard ML protocol and train a model that takes customer keyword as input and predicts affinity scores for each filter. So it predicts the relevance of each filter to the given keywords. And then the, the, this is combined with the observed clicks using a uh, binary cross entropy loss applied on all labels. And then we know how to uh, tune the, the parameters of, of the prediction model forward. Uh, so considering an example of a customer who searched for shoes and selected men's shoe size, our model first predicts the relevance of each filter we support for, for, for the query. And then those predictions alongside observed labels are used to compute the binary loss and then use that to tune the parameters of the model to minimize the loss. So in the, in the following slides, I'll focus on the different models we tested for finding the relevance of filters to search queries 
and outline the differences between them. So, first of all, let, let us consider three types of signal our model gets to predict how different filters are relevant to queries. This is the query text, which I might refer to as input, the label names or filter names, if you will, and the filter individual IDs or the label IDs. So let, let, let us use the last example that we have seen where the model was predicting the relevance of men's shoe size to the query shoes. So first, the query shoes is embedded using the text embedding module, which is a pretty standard NLP pipeline. So we apply byte pair encoding to generate appropriate subword tokens, which are then embedded and fed through a BLSTM network, followed by a dense layer to get the final query embedding. So filter names are embedded in the same manner. So for example, the men's shoe size is embedded with a standard NLP stack. And then label IDs are embedding uh, are embedded based on a lear learnable embedding matrix, where each row represents a single refinement. So, equipped with, with, with the embeddings, the first filter ranking model, the ID only baseline, uh, co combines the label ID and the query embedding using the dot product. So, co considering our previous example, the query shoes is embedded using the uh, using the textual embedding module, and the ID is embedded by taking the appropriate row from the embedding matrix, and the final relevance value is found using a dot product, well, by a dot product between the two vectors. So, to get a vector of scores for all filters, essentially solve a single example, we apply the same operations for all labels in, in our, that we support in our dataset. So the same model can, can be developed if we use the textual label embeddings only instead of the ID only. So we, we would use only the filter names. And that variation of the model <clears throat> is, is known as text only and it will be presented as such. So things can get slightly more complicated when two sources of signal are considered. So using our previous example, we can embed the query shoes using the same methodology but for a filter, we would embed the filter ID using the uh, simple lookup table. So we take the vector out of the embedding matrix and we take the filter name, shoes for men, and we embed it using the textual embedding module. Then the, 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 the two embeddings are concatenated and fed through a, sing, a single dense layer to get the final filter embedding. And then as before, the score, the relevance score of this filter and the query is found by taking the dot product between the two values. So to get a vector of scores for all the filters in our dataset, we apply the same operation for you know, the same embedding operation to all of the filters in, in our dataset. Each of the embeddings is then combined with the query using a dot product. And finally, we get a vector of, sim of uh, relevance between filters and query, and we can apply our, our training laws. So finally, for our main model, uh, we combine the filter IDs and the filter name embeddings slightly differently. So as before, the, 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 filter, IB, the filter ID is, is embedded by taking a row out of the embedding matrix. The filter name is embedded using the NLP module. And finally, the embedding for uh, the ID and the name are combined with an element-wise multiplication to get the embeddings of the filter. We we also, as before, we get the score by uh, by taking a dot product <clears throat> between query and the filter. So we hypothesize that in forming a joint embedding of label ID and text using an element-wise multiplication forces the model to learn the base of the embedding for each filter using text and only a small, small perturbation from the IDs. And this, this ensures that the text is always used. And also we believe that the resulting embedding is easier to process by the classification head. And this is indicated by improved accuracy, but I'll get to that in a second. So again, uh, as in all the three examples, to get the vector of scores for all filters, we merely apply the same operations to all labels in, in, in our data set and then uh, we get the score. We, we, we get the vector of scores. So uh, we have used the data set di discussed at, at the beginning 
to benchmark our models against those from the literature. So first we present the uh, results of the state of the art models used on our query to filter dataset to provide a reference in regards to the difficulty of this task. So I, as you can see, uh, the, the best models obtain about 0.5 and NDCG at one uh, on our data. And of course, some are not, not, not as performant, but this would be the baseline to beat, if you will. And finally, we also provide the number of tunable parameters used by each model where the number was easily available as an ad additional point of reference. So you can see that there are some models that are a bit smaller, but also there is a family of models that rely on massive transformer networks to embed the queries and they have significantly more parameters. So uh, for following that, we include our models. As you can see, the models may making use of label IDs as well as their name, so the combined baseline N. So this is the one that, that the two embeddings were concatenated and then fed through a dense layer. And the latter is the final model with the element wise multiplication. And they both beat the baselines, uh, showing that using both sources of signal is indeed crucial to solve, to solve this problem. Even though the models that, 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 that you have developed have only 14 million parameters, which is significantly less than, than, than the competition. And finally, what, what's important is that the, uh, the, the architecture that we present based on element wise embeddings outperforms all the other uh, baselines, even the one with that, that takes advantage of both IDs and the text signal. So going beyond standard accuracy metrics, we present three additional measures. Coverage, which is the fraction of labels that were ever given a positive label by the model, which points to a high diversity of results. The F1 score of the head labels. So these are the top 200 labels that account for exactly 87% of all label occurrences. And the F1 score on the tail labels, which is the remainder 1400, which account for 30% uh, of label occurrences. So the, re the results indicate that the inclusion of textual descriptions of search filters allows the model to better generalize over underrepresented tail labels and recommend them more often. So you can see with the higher coverage and more accurately. So you can see with the higher tail F1 scores. The finding is especially prominent when looking at the text only baseline. Uh, so this is that one where memorizing the most popular label IDs was much more difficult. And intrinsically, the performance of the combined baseline, so the one with the concatenation fed through a, a dense layer to embed the filters, uh, is very similar. So the performance of that model is very similar to the ID only baseline. And we hypothesize that the binary loss function puts, puts a higher emphasis on learning about common labels as they appear in more examples and label identi identifiers provide a better signal about a query to head label mappings and they just overwhelm the, the, the learning process and the textual signal is just not used at all. However, in the LALE model, omitting a signal from text labels and prioritizing IDs is more difficult due to the way the two sources are combined. And this means there is more emphasis put on textual labels, on sort of textual inputs, so the filter names, which improves tail performance. As you can see, it's comparable to the text only baseline is significantly higher than the ID and the combined baselines. So for, uh, and finally, our results demonstrate that the proposed approach, LALE, improves model performance for infrequent queries sorry, infrequent labels without sacrificing the top K accuracy. Because as you can see, the head labels F1 is still the highest out of all, all the models. So uh, to, to summarize, we've tested a class of extreme multi-label classification models that make use of label names as well as their IDs on the filter prediction task. The presented ID and text models rely on much fewer parameters, often 20 times fewer parameters than the state of the other classifiers but out outperform them in accuracy on our data set. And finally, as, as future our, our outlook, we'll aim to mitigate the main shortcoming of this approach. So now each training step requires embedding of the full suite of labels, which can be very expensive and can be mitigated by subsampling negatives for each batch. Okay, thank you, for, thank you for your attention and feel free to ask any questions you have.